It's nine o'clock. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's 10th of June, time for our conference to be opened. Uh, we hope to have lots of you behind the screen. My name is Tymon Zieliński, and this is Jan Marcin Wenswaski, director of the Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Sciences with us. Uh, today, we have the 14th conference in the history of the Support Science Association. And this summer, we will celebrate the 15th anniversary of our association and Jan Martin was the, the original, the very first uh, chair, chairman of the society. So Jan Martin, please, could you give a few words about the society, about the conference? And Thank you, Timon. Um, well, the, I believe that it's extremely important that um, we shall have um, something which is called concerned educated citizens. And for this, all the activities like um, uh, scientific societies, scientific festivals, Etc. are very important to build the um, science credibility, to build the knowledge, and uh, the young people are <clears throat> especially important. Number of sociological studies show that it's very difficult to change the mind of the elders, of the seniors, while the the hope for change, for the positive change, is in the younger generation. And my main message is that. Uh, don't believe that our planet is going to hell. Uh, it is not a complete disaster. We still have a lot to do and we still can um, save the planet, so to say. And another important thing, especially from the point of view of a marine researchers, as Timon and I am, uh, I'd like to stress that the ocean is still unknown planet. There is a, so much interesting things to discover, so things that we don't know. So um, it's really a great era in front of us, the era of discoveries, the era of challenges, both in terms of um, new information we will gather about the world, but also the era of uh, new opportunities to protect the planet and to change it in the, the way we want it. So that is not that all is lost. Let's have a hope and everything. Uh, uh, well, with your conference and interesting um, presentations. Welcome. Thank you very much, Jan Martin. Well, yes, exactly. Where the world is heading, we hope to, to learn from your presentations uh, some of the aspects of, of the progress and, and what the future is expected and it's expecting from us. And we hope that you will share your, your information about your work. Please remember that we we really uh, expect presentations that are not very, very uh, expert-like uh, in a sense that uh, where the world is heading is an issue for everybody. So we have uh, representatives of different disciplines. So please try to communicate your, your science in, in a really understandable way. And perhaps one, one good hint that you will be getting is the presentation uh, the keynote presentation from Joachim Denk, Dr. Joachim Denk from Geomar in Kiel. Uh, I dare to say my, my good friend. Uh, Joachim is a physical oceanographer, but he also likes the, uh, to play with the simulations of the ocean. Uh, but what is most important from my perspective and my cooperation with Joachim, he's also a director of the school program at, at Geomar, and he is uh, responsible for, for a number of activities that are dedicated to communication of science to, to young citizens. Uh, we have very nice cooperation, uh, especially uh, our flagship cooperation is the, the Ocean at Home Summer School, and I'm sure there will be some aspects about that uh, in the presentation. So, Joachim, the floor is yours, and, and uh, after the presentation, I'll give you uh, some uh, some formal information about the conference, and then we will start with the presentations of the uh, young uh, researchers. So, thank you very much. The conference is open, and Joachim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Timon, for the introduction and also for the kind invitation. Um, I felt quite honored to giving uh, the keynote here. Although I did notice that after my talk, you planned for a quarter of an hour break, assuming that the students would be so exhausted that they really need that. I think we'll have to have a serious word about that later on. Okay, um, let's get into the topic. Um, maybe just to add a few words to Timon's introduction about myself. 
Um, as he said, I'm a physical oceanographer, uh, oceanographer. I've been working on ocean simulations, ocean modeling for a long time. And uh, almost 20 years ago, I slipped into um, uh, cooperation with schools. And for the last 15 years or so, I've mainly been doing that, but I'm still enjoying science a lot. So I'm looking forward very much to the presentations today, um, at least those I actually can attend. Now I'll be talking about science communication. And to do that, I have to share my screen with you, which should be here. Whoops, and I started right in the wrong place. Let's try again. Um, here we go. Okay. Um, as I said, there's a lot of science presentations in the program today, a lot of interesting ones, but I'm not quite sure if all of you realize that you will actually be engaging in science communication today. Because um, different from what you may be used to, today you'll not be talking to your usual expert audience of colleagues, but you're talking to scientists from different disciplines. And you may find that that's not as easy as talking to a scientist from your um, um, team. In the sense that um, I myself found ages ago that uh, one has a tendency um, to hide behind technical terms. So sometimes you use, in oceanography, uh, in oceanography, for example, you use words like vorticity and assume everybody knows what it is. And um, if you talk to somebody else, like a teacher or so, and uh, they ask you, can you please explain? All of a sudden you realize you have a vague idea, but you didn't understand the concept well enough to actually be able to explain it in simple words. And this is something you may find today because you'll be talking to people from different disciplines. Now, what I would like to do is to encourage you to go even one step further and communicate your science to other audiences. And usually when I do that at our place at Geomar in Kiel, um, people respond with uh, uh, what me, uh, why, uh, I don't know how to, and so on. So on. But let's have a brief look at what the obstacles to science communication usually are. So, of course, there's never enough time to talk to other audiences than your own, but you also may have no idea to go uh, how to go about it. Uh, how do you start talking to non-experts? How do you engage uh, another audience? How do you even meet another audience? Then you might think that your particular branch of science is something for specialists, but nobody else is going to care, which is mostly wrong, usually. You may think you need a, need a lot of money to do that. Mostly you don't. Um, but if you do need money, where would you get it? Um, then there might not be any opportunities, and I hope to be able to convince you that there are plenty of opportunities. And there's the question of your personal gain. What do you yourself get out of it if you communicate your science to the public? And then there's also the question of no ga, which I have no idea what it is, but the guy doesn't obviously doesn't know how to cross that hurdle, so it's probably all of the above. And I do realize that he's a Polish athlete, so. I just couldn't resist the pun. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, communicating science. Why would you even want to do that? What's it good for? Of course, the big answer is you can be on television, like Bill Nye, the science guy, who's been doing that for ages. But um, that's just kidding, because um, this is something, uh, an opportunity that comes so rarely that we're not seriously going to talk about it very much. Um, and more realistic reason, for example, would be to secure your funding and agencies like, for example, NASA or the European Space Agency are very good at that and they are very much aware that it is important for them to create public visibility for their organizations and projects, because this is where their funding comes from. Um, the public has to be convinced that doing space science is a good thing to convince the politicians. And so they even do things like putting out comic books um, for young people uh, to convince them that space science is the thing to do. So if they can do that for their huge projects, why not give it a try for your science project? Um, it might help to secure your funding. 
Another reason might be that you have a feeling that you may have to fulfill your duty to funding agencies. So for example, if you have an EU project, a science project, there might be an obligation to do science outreach or something along those lines. And you think you have to do that, but are not quite sure how to do that. And also you may feel that you have an obligation to the taxpayer because very often science is funded by public money and people may um, want to uh, get something in return for paying their taxes. Another very good reason is to communicate your particular science, which people may not even be aware of that it exists. So for example, here at Geomar, we now have projects on carbon dioxide removal which is basically the idea of um, getting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with different methods and depositing it somewhere um, before the climate breaks down completely. And some of these methods are um, ambiguous uh, and also sometimes not very nice. So nobody wants to have CO2 stored under their village, for example. So it might be a good idea if you run a project along those lines to actually talk to the people and convince them that what you're trying to do makes sense and that's a good thing to do. You may even get citizen assistance for your science. There are lots of citizen science projects about nowadays. For example, iNaturalist, which is a very easy one where people go out and observe things and report them back. And they have 100 million observations to date. And there's lots of other citizen science projects. Some of them make more sense, some of them not. But um, if you have a project that's suitable the, to that, you might want to consider um, putting it out in public, explaining to people what it's all about, and maybe asking them to give you data or assist you in some way. The most basic reason might be simply to share your enthusiasm. You like your science, you're excited about it, and you want to let other people know about it, the public or schools, students, kids, whoever. And the reasons might be different. You may want to inspire them. You may want to teach them. You may even want to recruit them, which is all perfectly legitimate. Today, another main reason for um, communicating science is, in my view, to oppose science skepticism. There's lots of skepticism about on climate, on COVID. And there's all sorts of idiots all over the place who are skeptical about science and don't believe in it. So what you could do is talk to the public. You won't be able to convince the real skeptics, like this German right-wing politi politician who believes that it's all the sun's fault that the climate is changing. But what you can do is you can support the open-minded and confirm them in their view that science is a good thing and a rational thing, and they should be listening to you. You can also overcome stereotypes. If you ask children what a scientist is like, very often you get these two um, ideas. It's either the mad scientist that he, they've seen in the movies or in the cartoons, or it's the lonely genius um, who's out there doing fantastic science. And many of them don't realize that the real scientists very often are simply talented persons who are very enthusiastic about their science. So, who really wants to know about your science? Well, let's start with the stakeholders and politicians. If you nowadays apply for a, an EU project, very often you'll have to talk to stakeholders. And by that, they mean people affected by your science. So for example, in ocean sciences, where I come from, if you do a project on fisheries in the Baltic, it may be a good idea to talk to fishermen and convince them that you're not trying to destroy their jobs, but maybe actually want to secure them for the next 30 years by investigating uh, what fisheries are going to be like then. Or you may want to talk to politicians who are affecting your science in positive and negative ways. And there's things like parliamentary evenings where um, scientists actually get the chance to talk to those who are willing to listen. Then there's the broader public and the voters. For example, uh, Fridays for Future, a lot of the kids um, engaging in Friday, Fridays for Future are doing that for, let me say, emotional reasons without thinking about the scientific arguments behind it. 
but there's also quite a few who really want to know um, how can I how can I explain um, what this is all about and who are interested in the facts behind their opinions and uh, there's the scientists for future movement which helps uh, Fridays for future and supports them by giving them the scientific background. We here at Geomar are engaging a lot with schools. And when I say schools, I explicitly, explicitly mean students and teachers. Students, of course, are interested in science because they want to know what their future holds in store for them. And they may want to find out about possible careers and how they can contribute in the future to getting new knowledge. Teachers very often have been out of university for 10 or 20 years, and they're interested in what's been happening since then in science, and they want to brush up on their knowledge in order to be able to pass that on in class. So it's always very worthwhile to talk to teachers as well. Well, but how do you do that? What are the chances of doing that? If you're in an institution, you can... Uh, excuse me, Joachim, yes, we, froze, we froze for a moment. Could you okay. please go back to... I'm very sorry, but, but no we problem. had some, some sort of a problem. Could you go back to the Friday science uh, Friday... Oh, here. And could you, could you go from this point once again? Yeah, no problem. So Super, what I was, thank you. What I was explaining here is that, uh, for example, um, the Fridays for Future, um, a lot of the kids are joining for mainly emotional reasons without understanding the science behind climate change. But there's also many of them who are interested in the facts behind their opinions. And this is where, for example, movements like the Scientists for Future can come in, where scientists actually join up with Fridays for Future and explain to them what it's all about um, when they talk about cli uh, climate change. And I explained that schools is for us here at Geomar, for example, one of the target groups. Uh, and I explicitly mean students and teachers because the students want to know about what's in store for them in the future, how they can contribute to creating new knowledge or what careers they might be uh, going into. And the teachers have been out of university for a long time and they want to, uh, may want to brush up their knowledge uh, in order to have their teaching more up to date. So how do you go about it? If you're in an institution or university, there may be mechanisms in place which you can join in. So for example, um, our institution and many others um, do press releases when new interesting science happens at the institution um, or if a new paper appears. Then here at Geomar, we have open days for the public every now and again, where people uh, come in and are able to look at what we're doing and get explanations from scientists about their science. And if you talk to your outreach staff at your institution, usually they're always looking for help with these activities. And they're quite glad if you have something interesting to contribute. They might even ask you to join in more specialized things like a public podium because um, every now and again, they are asked to contribute experts to discussions on podiums. Um, and you can interact with other experts from different fields, but also with the public at these occasions. Then there might be exhibitions. For example, here we were asked uh, to contribute to the open day of the German Ministry of Research uh, a while ago. Um, and easily you can contribute your science and explain it to the public in places like this. And you might even have the chance of uh, hitting on a couple of politicians uh, during these occasions. There's also science fairs organized by different organizations. And again, they are always looking for contributions um, from somebody who has something interesting to say. Now, this may not look like much, but what the guy is doing, he's explaining phytoplankton and the food chain with this uh, um, cartoon things uh, to the children. If you're more a guy or a girl for the big stage, uh, you may want to join in a science show or go to a science slam. And particularly science slams are easy to join because you can uh, subscribe to one of them and uh, then compete with other science slammers on stage by presenting your science to the audience in a maybe unusual and interesting way. What we're doing is cooperating with schools. Uh, this can take different forms. For example, we go to individually to different schools and work with them 
maybe during a class or during the project. So, uh, for example, I spent the last three mornings at a school near us uh, where we've been working on a small project. Or you can invite school kids or classes to your lab and explain to them how your science works and give them a chance to try it in formal courses. You can also organize summer schools or join in summer schools and contribute to them, which can take place indoors and outdoors. And in our case, as ocean researchers, that might even involve going on a ship like this for a day um, and doing science at sea. And then there's this component I was talking about, teacher training, which again can have different aspects. So you don't have to organize huge things if you don't want to. You can offer to come to a school and the teachers may spend an afternoon with you um, looking at things that you explain to them. Or you can invite them again to your lab and show them what you're working on. Nowadays, of course, um, you don't even have to be there physically. There's online opportunities. So one of them is video channels. They're science channels by individuals on string theory, on fractals, on proteins, science explained, whatever that is. And here in Germany, for example, uh, this young woman um, She's a chemist who is now holds a PhD and has one and a half million subscribers on her science channel, which she's been doing for a couple of years. And as a side remark, she actually managed to make it into television because her channel was so popular that the TV stations gave her her own um, thing on TV, which she's now doing on a regular basis. There's also blogs. You might be blogging personally on something you find interesting, like for example, a particle physics block uh, somewhere in block space, or again, your institution might have that organized. So at Geomar, for example, we are asking our researchers when they go on expeditions to block from their expedition at sea so that people can follow them what's going on. You can even do workshops in virtual space. And this is what Timon was referring to earlier on. So last year, we due to the pandemic, we weren't able to do a summer school in presence, um, but we organized a virtual summer school for two weeks. And we had something like 20 kids from four countries who joined us and worked with us for two weeks um, in front of their screens. And we were a bit skeptical at first if it would work, but it was really nice. From that, we learned that you can do other things. So yesterday afternoon, uh, we did a teacher training sessions on climate change, um, which is very convenient for the teachers because they don't have to drive to come to our place, but they can sit at home in front of their screen and talk to us and learn about things they would have had to go to efforts to, to learn about in other ways. So what do you personally get out of science communication? And the first one is the one I mentioned right at the beginning. You may be able to train your communication skills. Remember, you use complicated words. And here you are forced to explain them in simple terms, um, which helps you, for example, in personal discussions or in front of an audience, to um, train how you talk to people without using these technical terms. And it may even help your understanding in uh, uh, understanding what the terms actually mean. And this may be useful when you're doing things like your PhD defense, because don't forget, uh, your jury there will not consist of uh, only experts, but there will be people on board who've never heard about your topic before. So it's very useful usually if you do your defense uh, to use simple terms. You may be able to widen your network by meeting people with different skills. And by that, I don't mean scientific colleagues, but if you talk to the public, you might, for example, meet a caterer or an IT expert or whoever. And the next time you're trying to organize a science conference, this might come, come in handy to have this expertise who might be able to help you. Another thing to consider is, uh, particularly when you're young and not settled yet, that you may not always stay in science. Although you usually start with the idea that science is what you want to do for all your life, things may not turn out that way. There may not be any job opportunities or you realize, well, maybe it's not my thing after all. 
But if you do science commu communication, you might slip into roles like being a science journalist for a while or a communications designer or a teacher. And you may realize that actually that's something you're good at. And uh, if you don't have a career in science later on, you might uh, realize that this is something to, to go into. And last not least, there's a lot of personal satisfaction in it. If you pull it off and have a great science communication event uh, alone or with a team, um, it's always a good thing which you enjoy. Okay, now, do you need money? And right up front, I say lots of the things I mentioned don't need any money. If you go to your local school, all you need is a bus ticket. And beyond that, uh, you don't need much. But there may be occasions where you do need funding. And um, one of the sources where you can get money for this is usually national agencies. So for example, this is all in German because it's a call from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research who are now um, uh, looking for um, science communication projects in the science year, our universe, which is the next year. And they're um, putting out a call for financing projects on that. Similarly, EU sometimes has calls with funding opportunities, for example, in education area, um, where they explicitly ask for science communication in one way or the other. Or you may have a science project with EU where you may be asked, for example, to talk to stakeholders or the public. Then there's the scientific societies. In our case, it's the European Geosciences Union who just has a call for public engagement in this year where you can apply for money. Or there are foundations um, in Germany. It's for example, the Robert Bosch Foundation or the German Telecom Foundation who are looking for research practice partnership, for example, for technology enhanced learning or data science in school. And you can use these opportunities to join in and communicate your science. A little bit smaller, but also satisfying is, for example, projects by the German Polish Youth Office, who want to encourage uh, cooperation between young people in Germany and Poland on topics like environmental issues or science. And uh, so, for example, our summer school last year, our virtual summer school was actually funded by the German Polish Youth Office. And uh, it's not huge amounts of money, but it's enough to get you going and to keep you sustained for that. So let me get to my summary. Um, if so far you have been in doubt whether you should really engage in science communication in some way or another, my recommendation would be just give it a try. You might fail, but you might also realize that you enjoy it a great deal. And with that, I'm open to questions and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joachim. Thank you very much. The floor is open for the discussion. So please ask questions, make comments, disagree or applause. I don't see any questions. So Joachim, maybe I'll, I'll ask you a question. Uh, would you, would you, would you give us some hints about the, the, the greatest challenges in, in, in your communication work? What would that be? And I wonder if these are the same as, as we have here in, in Poland. Well, at the moment, I think one of the challenges, of course, was the pandemic for the last two years, um, that it was at the same time an opportunity because we were forced to reconsider how we approach people and what kind of offers we make. And this is when a lot of ideas came up how we could make virtual office. And for example, when I was talking about um, teacher training, so far we have been working in a way where the teachers either came to us and that was usually within a radius of about one hour's drive or so, or we went to the schools and talked to the teachers. But with uh, teacher trainings that you, uh, that you offer on the web, you are able to reach far wider. So we had teachers joining from the south of Germany or even from, from Austria. Um, and if you do them in English, they might even have a larger audience. So that's a whole new field to explore and an opportunity to use, I would think. Um, 
One of the challenges, of course, is always that scientists never have enough time to engage uh, in communication. And so we, as a school project, try to provide a structure for them where they don't have to organize everything, but we ask them to join in and maybe give a presentation or maybe supervise one of the students in a small project or something, but they don't have to take care of all the rest. But that's already a, an advanced stage. If you want to start small, you can do smaller things. Um, there might be the initial hurdle of actually contacting someone at the school and getting in touch with them. In our case, it was easy because um, this uh, Robert Bosch Foundation, they had a call for funding and they invited schools and science institutions and uh, told them, please talk to each other and you can apply for money. And this got us started and got us the initial contacts to schools. But I think most people will realize in their career at one point or the other that all of a sudden um, their kids or their teachers or other parents realize, hey, your dad or your mom is a scientist. Can't they come to our school, our uh, daycare, um, our whatever, and um, talk about what they are doing? And all of a sudden, um, you may be engaged in science commun communication uh, without even <laughs> initially wanting to. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Any anyone else would like to make a comment or ask questions to Joachim? So I guess I will. I will. I will continue with my questions. Um, uh, would you say that going international uh, English is an issue with the students? Because remember, we, we had the, that issue last year with uh, Ocean at Home, but do you have any wider, wider experience with that? Well, when we did Ocean at Home, our students were in the age bracket 14 to 17 years. And we I think we noticed that um, the 14 year olds did have some problems because they didn't have the vocabulary yet. Whereas the 16 to 17 year olds for them, it wasn't much of a problem. And here in Germany, we were initially very hesitant to ask our students to do something in English because we didn't know how they would respond to it. Meanwhile, we're not hesitant at all anymore because uh, you know, when scientists talk to each other, they're not in an international audience. They're usually not perfect in English, but um, they communicate with hands and feet uh, if necessary, and the students can do the same. So um, we've had students giving presentations to teachers in English, um, and it worked very well. They need a bit of coaching first maybe, but um, Usually, um, by the age of 16, I think they know sufficiently uh, enough English to be able to communicate what they want to, um, even if it's not perfect. Um, in fact, um, we have to encourage them not to want to be perfect, because this is what English teachers do. Um, you either talk perfectly or you don't talk at all, mm -hmm. whereas we just want them to get the message across somehow. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a very good point, I would say, because we, we also quite regularly hear from young researchers like, I'm sorry for my English, and uh, I, I hope you understand. This is one of the big mistakes that, that people make. I mean, we, we cannot assume that my English is horrible and that nobody will understand because that kills the beginning of the communication, I would say. So my appeal to all the young uh, researchers that, that are with us today is like, please do not, do not uh, diminish your English language skills. Just, just go for it. Yeah. Just like, like uh, Joachim said, use your hands and feet if necessary, but, but you, you do not have to feel like, you know, everybody else speaks perfect English. Right. Yeah. Some comments, questions? Aha, Mihail. Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, on the same page, I mean, speaking in English with the students could be challenging, but not that much. But when we go to speak with more adult people, it could be extremely difficult. I mean, you made the examples about fishermen. So I'm, I'm Italian and I'm working in Poland. So I have really a lot of problems with uh, yeah, communicating with people outside of the workplace so 
Any hints on that? Well, it usually, it is a problem to assume that people from the last generations um, learned a lot of English and uh, it's a greater hurdle. But um, I, I guess you're in a very special situation because as an Italian in Poland, um, you probably don't know enough Polish to talk to them in their mother language and you, you want to uh, go back to English, but then you probably have Polish colleagues who could come along and help you with that. Um, so, in fact, I wouldn't really expect uh, people to use English because you want to address them on their, their own terms, on their own ground. So if you have somebody who is able to talk to them in Polish, uh, or at least translate in Polish, so that would be much better than expecting them to talk English. Yeah, that, that's for sure. I'm just wondering about the uh, yeah, some scientific terms that are really difficult to be translated. Or I mean, we are using to use English terms. So sometimes I, I really feel problems in having an other languages that means the same thing. But English, English is such a universal language and science <laughs> that we all have this this problem. I would say. Oh yeah, even like if they, I talked to the teachers yesterday, I was trying to explain to them what carbon dioxide removal means. Um, and it's a meanwhile a common term in climate sciences um, and everybody in Germany uses it in English because there's no good German word for it. Mm -hmm. But if you talk to German teachers, you somehow have to approach it in German. Um, but again, uh, use your own words and try to get the idea across. Uh, don't try to substitute the technical term by another technical term in, uh, in another, uh, another language. Mm -hmm. Would somebody else like to discuss something with, with Joachim? I don't see anything, anybody? One, well, if that's so, thank you very much, Joachim. It was really Welcome. nice. And let's communicate some, some other issues about the conference now. Uh, we are starting at 10 o'clock, uh, the first session. Uh, please remember that uh, we are competing for the uh, in natural sciences for the award of the director of the Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Sciences. And the posters are uh, the award is sponsored by GeoPlanet Consortium of Polish Academy of Sciences Institutes, and we also have a, a possibility for an award uh, for social and human humanities um, session uh, that would be sponsored for uh, Sopot Science Association. So three awards to go for, but. What I would say mostly, let's have fun and let's exchange uh, a lot of good ideas and, and uh, learn from each other. So uh, right now we have a break. Uh, it's 9.30 or 38 on my computer. So let's get back at 10 o'clock. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alexandra Kroza and I will be guiding the first session of the conference. And our first presentation is by Aleksandra Zalew Zalewska from University of Gdańsk, uh, who will be giving a presentation uh, of a title, Morphological, Genomic and Phylogenetic Characterization of two Pseudomonas aeruginosa bacteriophages uh, belonging to Litonarivus uh, genus. Sorry for mispronunciation. And the floor is yours if you're with us, Alexandra. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Okay. Hello. Good morning. So uh, can you share your presentation and begin to uh, give? Yes. Okay. Yes. Nice. Okay. Is the presentation visible now? Yes, it is. Everything is perfect. Okay. Thank you. So let me just start. Yes. Yes, so I would like to present to all of you my master's degrees project that I developed during my studies uh, at Faculty of Biology at University of Gdańsk, together with my supervisors, and they are Agata Jurczak-Kurek and Marcin Górniak. Um, the major goals 
of my project was to establish uh, phylogenetic positions of two bacteriophages uh, infectious to uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa bacteria, uh, which is very abundant in the environment. And those two bacteri bacteriophages belong to Lytinovirus genus. This task wasn't so easy due to heavily recombinational uh, character of those genomes. Therefore, I uh, had to identify most important recombination in phages genomes among those genus, uh, Lytinovirus genus, uh, and it helped me. It helped me with understanding the nature of those genomes and how to uh, how to let's just say taste the the method of doing a phy phylogenetic analysis among viruses. Uh, I also uh, held a comparison analysis of genomes between those two phages. Therefore, I try to identify whether they are two species uh, as they were, um, as they were uh, collected in the NCBI database. So I held a bioinformatic bio, bio analysis alongside with molecular, molecular analysis. And also I examined lytic features of those phages, such as plate morphology on host bacteria, host range, lysis profile, and I examined capsid stability uh, of those phages being held in cooling conditions over the time of six months. My analytic material were two bacteriophages, uh, PEA, uh, 575P3 and PEA 1369P5. They were isolated in 2012 uh, by my supervisor, Dr. Jutra Kurek, uh, from raw sewage from wastewater plant in Gdańsk. Uh, the wastewater uh, plant in Gdańsk uh, end up in uh, Gdańsk Bay. Therefore, they end up in the sea, which surrounds this area, this uh, area of Tree City. And uh, the host bacteria is very abundant in this, in this ecosystem. And therefore, uh, its bacteriophages are, are also abundant. So uh, those bacteriophages are resistant to most of potentially antiviral condition, conditions, such as high and low pH, high low temperature, de detergents and organic dissolvents. And they are lytic to their host bacteria and have podoviral morphology. Therefore they have icosahedral heads, uh, which are, uh, which you can see on those pictures from a uh, microscope. Uh, and also they have short tail, which is very important structure that takes part in infectious uh, and in infection of those bacteria. Here we have the dimensions also. Uh, it is in Polish, but let me just say that we have uh, uh, dimensions of the head, which are 60 nanometers, and length of the tail, 30 nanometers. When it comes to the survivi survivability in those conditions, they often reach 100%, which you can see just over, the, just over there. Okay, when it comes to comparison of those two, two genomes uh, using an inform, uh, bioinformatical uh, tools, I uh, identified two duplications that uh, differ those two, those, those two genomes. And we have two, du two duplications, uh, one in each genome. And also we have a highly var variable region in the gene of uh, hypothetical lysis inhi inhibition function. Therefore, uh, when it comes to nucleotide level, those two phages differ. However, uh, when I did a molecular analysis of those regions, I, uh, I, um, I found starters that would give me two products of PCR uh, re reactions. However, after doing an electrophoresis analysis, those two products weren't visible. Therefore, I can say, that reanalyzing those variable regions, those duplications, and this uh, mutational region, we don't see those differences. So we can uh, assume that those phages are uh, identical on nucleotide level. 
When it comes to recombinations, I use a recombination uh, detection program, which enables me to find those recombination. And I saw two big recombinations in tail fiber and tail uh, proteins, which are, which are again very important structures when it comes to infection of bacteria. And those two recombinations were, uh, they were by them, uh, they were very close to each other. And interestingly, those two recombinations had two different donors. One, which was phage PA26, and it belonged to the same genus, Litanovirus. However, the second recombination uh, had a donor of phage AMP2, which interestingly represents its a uh, different genus, loose septima virus. So it suggests a recombination that takes place between genuses, not only among one genus between very uh, closely related phages, but also it ranges between genuses of phages. When it comes to phylogenetic analysis, I did a phyl four phylogenetic trees. One, which was uh, constructed using whole genomes, Second, I used genomes uh, from which I cut those recombinational, uh, recombinational regions. Uh, so I basically, I just cut the tail fibers genes. So the analysis of whole genomes showed me closely related phages, PA26 and YH30. Uh, and these trees are all, uh, they all have high bootstrap uh, values. Therefore, they are very, uh, let's just say they are very, I'm very sure that they show me the right information. When I removed those recombinated regions from those analyses, the position of the two phages, which are here in green, uh, very much changes. The close relationship between those two phages, PA26 and YH30, it just breaks and those two phages come uh, comes in the middle of uh, their own genus. So the two more analyses that I've made was uh, of those recombinated regions themselves. So the first recombination showed that the two bacteriophages that I uh, examined uh, ha are very closely related yet again to those two phages, but they all are much closer, uh, very much closer related to the outgroup of a uh, different genus, Luft septima virus, then to their own genus. The same thing happens when it comes to the second recombination. Here we have very closely related with high bootstrap values. Uh, the relationship is very, very strong and it also shows that they are more related in this, in this region to different genus and it all happens the recombinations in region of tail fibers genes they are very important genes they take place in infection uh, and it happens to be that they are under very uh, strong recombinational uh, uh, force when it comes to plagues and whole strange um, in fact when i infected uh, loans of their uh, original, uh, the original host, and also I did a cross examination when I infected um, uh, the phage five to five on the bacteria of strain thirteen to sixty nine. I've noticed a very different uh, plague morphology when it comes to phage thirteen sixty nine. Sorry, thirteen sixty nine on its original host you can see very regular plague with halo. When it comes to the second, uh, second bacteriophage, 575, five, five, uh, on the very same strain, the difference is very striking. These are very un uh, irregular morphologies, very irregular halo, and something that we call satellite plagues. And also the two phages, uh, they've shown the very same identical host range. Uh, I've held also an analysis of Lysis profile and it enabled me to establish a time that takes for the phage to conduct a full 
analytic cycle and it is 45 minutes and we can see on those diagrams a moment when the sorry when the optic optic density drops uh, also as well as uh, bacteria titer and at the very same moment we can see um, growth in uh, lytic uh, and lytic bacteria phage titer so it shows us uh, the infectious dy infections dynamics, how uh, the bacteria is being killed by a growing population of phages. Um, when it comes to capsid stability, being held for six months uh, in killing conditions, uh, capsid show, cap th those capsids shows around 1% of survivability uh, over the time of six months. So. Uh, we can say that they are not very stable uh, also in the environment uh, of its natural environment such as raw sewage wastewater and the waters of Gdańsk Bay uh, those phages also can be propagated and they, they reach high titers what are the conclusions of my analysis uh, genomes of bacteriophages are heavily recombinated and therefore, we have to think whether uh, examining whole genomes, so the total evidence analysis, if they are very uh, inf inf informatorial, informatorial if, uh, if, we can, uh, if we can get as much of valuable information of, the, of those whole genomes, maybe we have to think about using a net something uh, that doesn't really shows those simple relations because those relations are not that simple uh, to examine those recombination recombinational history of uh, litanovirus phages i think that we should expand the analysis to family level uh, and just to get more information about uh, those recombination that happens uh, in the environment of phages Recombinations in tail fiber proteins, genes are very common, and that this is their uh, mecha mechanism of specialization when it comes to infecting a special bacteria or even a single strain of bacteria. And it happens between phages that belongs to different genesis. Tail fiber changes play very important role in host range expansion uh, because it uh, interacts with receptors on the bacteria, on the surface of bacteria cell. And also it gives us, uh, not us, but to those bacteriophages an acquisition of an adaptive feature. So are bacteriophages a threat? Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, can we have some time also for questions? Because we have one minute left and maybe there are okay. some questions in audience. So I think this might be more valuable for now. Uh, what okay. do you think? Yes, okay. Yeah. Any questions? My... Hello, audience. This is the time for the questions for Alexandra. Also, here we have those uh, final results. So I will leave it for you yeah, to yeah. read and let me hear some questions. You can also write via chat if you don't want to raise your voice. Okay, so I think that's it. Thank you very much for your presentation. If you have any questions later on, just put them in the chat and uh, conversation is open for everyone all the time. So, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you okay. so much again. Thank you. Okay, and the next speaker is uh, Kamila Stirch Olesiak from University of Gdańsk with the topic of seasonal changes in structure and functionality of benthic communities in the coastal zone of the Putsk Bay. Camila, can you hear us and are you with us? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, nice. Uh, can you share your presentation? Yeah, I show your presentation, wait. And can you hear my... Uh, yes, can yes, you I see can my... see and I can hear you. Everything is fine. Uh, okay. Yeah. The floor start. is yours. Yes, you can start. Okay. My name is uh, Kamila Stech Olesiak. 
and uh, I am a student of oceanography uh, in Institute of Oceanography at uh, University of Gdańsk. And uh, I, uh, today I am going to talk about the seasonal changes in structure and functionality of benthic communities in the coastal zone of the Puzgbai. And firstly, I will uh, tell about, uh, talk about function of benthic communities. Benthic communities consist of phytobenthos and zoobenthos. Uh, phytobenthos, uh, the, main, uh, the main role of phytobenthos is uh, the primary production and oxygen production. And uh, uh, zoobenthos plays a lot of roles. Uh, for example, they create uh, habitats for other organisms. Uh, they are filter uh, which limit transport uh, nutrient into uh, an open sea uh, and other process, uh, pro uh, processes which uh, do is uh, bioturbation and you can see sorry to interrupt Camila is... but are you changing okay. slides because we cannot see if you are changing slides they are not changing for us so uh, okay um, I don't know uh, okay so okay. maybe you should put your presentation in uh, presentation mode by clicking on the bill, um, bottom bar yes perfect and right now, now we are on a slight functions of benthic macrofauna yes That's right okay and I tell about this okay I uh, yeah. now I tell uh, 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 one more time so yes. this is <laughs> Uh, firstly, I uh, uh, want to tell uh, about functions of benthic uh, uh, communities. Benthic uh, communities consist of phytobenthos and uh, zoobenthos. And uh, the main uh, function of phytobenthos is primary production and oxygen production. Zoobenthos play uh, a lot of roles. For example, they create uh, habitats. Uh, they are also fil uh, filter which limits transport uh, nutrients into an open sea. Also, they are uh, the other process is uh, bioturbation. And wait. Oh. And what is it, bioturbation? Uh, the term bioturbation is used to describe how living organisms affect the substratum in uh, which they live. And influence of bioturbation is oxygenation of sediment, biogeochemical processes in sediment, pH, sediment granulometry, carbon and nutrient cycling, and uh, diversity of benthic uh, communities. And this activity is crucial for entire ecosystem. And various factor can uh, weaken bioturbation activity, for example, eutrophication, temperature rise, and habitat destruction. Therefore, the bioturbation index can be used to assess the quality of the environment. And uh, here on, the, on this picture, we can see uh, two different animals uh, which uh, bioturbating. Figure to show uh, polyhead head is diversity color in the uh, burrow, and figure uh, three show crab uh, who, which uh, create new burrow. And uh, the aim of this study is determination of uh, determination of uh, benthic macrofauna in uh, seasonal uh, as well as. Uh, seasonal changes in a compositional structure, bioturbation potential in uh, uh, index communities in various in Puzgbai. And uh, material uh, sam uh, sample were collected in March, June, and uh, September 2015. There were three uh, si uh, uh, site, sites. Uh, the shallow station uh, in the uh, two meters with or without key species seagrass. Uh, next station uh, is six meter depth with or without uh, key species blue mussels, Metrius rosurus. And the deepest um, station is in uh, 23 meters. 
they were uh, collected for Van Wingraps at uh, each station. And the next step uh, was laboratory analysis. Animals uh, were uh, identified to the lowest uh, possible uh, taxon level. And there uh, were a lot of uh, analyzes, for example, number of taxa, abundance, biomass, perturbation potential community index. And this perturbation uh, uh, potential community index consists biomass, abundance, and two factors, uh, mobility and uh, sediment uh, reworking for each taxon. And these two uh, factors uh, was encoded for uh, every uh, taxon, uh, thanks to literature and expert knowledge. And on uh, this two picture, we can see uh, two, um, two taxon, two species in uh, uh, which they move. And figure uh, six show a gastropod hydrobide, who, uh, which move only on sediment. But uh, figure seven show had uh, had diversity color uh, polyheads, which uh, uh, dig the burrow, and it can be on even fifteen centimeters. And uh, this is location and button coverage of the following sample sites in Putzkbay, and uh, the highest number of taxa was uh, in habitats with key species uh, with. Uh, with Zostera marina and uh, Metilus trosurus, there was above uh, 25 taxa, uh, but the lowest number of taxa was uh, in the deepest station, uh, J23, uh, and was about uh, uh, 13 taxa. And uh, here is MDS with sim uh, similarity of macrozoobent of groups. And uh, there, um, there were uh, four groups was distinguished, uh, and the closer uh, the points are, the station are more similar for each other. And uh, based on this, uh, we can see that the region and uh, living uh, habitat is uh, the uh, very important for structure of. Uh, Macrozoobentos, and uh, it is it is uh, uh, more important is uh, habitat, not a season, because uh, because we can see that uh, samples in a different season is closer, are closer, and uh, here is uh, Macrozoobentos density at a selected station in a free season. And uh, in September, uh, were, uh, uh, were collected other samples because on the shallowest station, J2, uh, in uh, March, June, and September, was uh, uh, samples was with Zostera. But uh, in September, uh, was collected also sample uh, without Zostera, and we can see also difference how uh, big is difference uh, without uh, uh, key species. And also in uh, uh, station J6 uh, was, uh, were collected uh, without metilus, but in September uh, were collected samples uh, with the key species. And also we can see how uh, big is difference. And uh, the highest abundance uh, was in September in the shallowest station. And uh, we can see at the deeper station, the highest abundance is in June. Uh, and uh, here is the perturbation potential community index. Uh, and we can see that the highest uh, BPC uh, are, uh, is in the shallowest station. Uh, in warm season, June and uh, September. Uh, and uh, we can see also like in Abu Dhabi uh, at the deeper station, the, the, uh, the highest BPC is in June, in, uh, uh, 
in uh, uh, June is warm season and uh, be uh, benthic macrofauna uh, is most uh, the active in summer and autumn in the coastal zones and the, uh, it influenced to develop uh, entire ecosystem. And uh, the, uh, this our conclusion of the study. Uh, the habitat of life is one, uh, one of the most important factors, uh, factors that determine difference in the macrozeobenthal structure of studied station. The biggest seasonal changes uh, in abundance and perturbation potential index of macrozeobenthos are observed at the shallowest station. Uh, and uh, the perturbation process is the most intensive in shallowest zone uh, in a warm season. And in the coastal zone, uh, there is the greatest uh, diversity and uh, abundance of macrozeobenthos. The perturbation potential is the greatest wear which affects the functioning of the entire ecosystem. And those my uh, reference and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. And right now we have time for questions. Are there any questions? Okay. May I ask one? Yes, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, you mentioned in the definition of your bioturbation index uh, a term called sediment reworking, which you got from literature, right? Yeah, I take its uh, literature and uh, experts' knowledge, but a lot of organism, it isn't in the uh, literature, but we uh, have uh, exper uh, experiments. How do you measure sediment reworking? Uh, how a uh, burrow is with uh, one hole or two hole and uh, how deep this organism uh, dig. Okay, that's these kinds of parameters are studied for that. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, we have still time. So if there are, oh, Marta, you have some question, I think. Marta Stepanek. Your hand is raised, so maybe if you have question. Yes. Oh, we cannot hear you. Maybe you can write on the chat. Okay. I'm not sure <laughs> now. Okay, let's. Uh, uh, she's you can read her chat. question. Yes. yes. Yeah. If she is okay. just, just wait. Yes. Okay. I cannot see if she's writing, but maybe if she is writing her question on the chat, then you can answer it. But um, I have one more question. Uh, maybe wait for a minute. I will just uh, move the, my microphone to Marta and she will ask the question. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, hello, how are you? can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, Camila, very nice presentation. Uh, I have a question because um, there was something interesting on your graph uh, when you showed the BPC index. Can you show it? Yeah, oh. I, I, uh, I can show now. <laughs> it's maybe, then maybe other people will also see this. Yeah. Mm, I still don't see it, but there was something interesting that even if the, um, I'm not sure if it was uh, the abundance or the biomass, the biomass was- yeah, There the was abundance. Uh, abundance and biomass. Yes, yes, but on the previous slide, uh, there was the difference between the, um, uh, at the Zostera station, you had some, yeah. you had lower um, abundance or the biomass, I don't remember now. It was slower, but still the index on these two stations. So with the Zostera and without the Zostera was very similar. And I'm interested to, um, why this happened. <laughs> uh, I think it can be uh, happened uh, because uh, there are uh, the same, uh, the same uh, taxons 
but it was uh, Abu Dhan's was different. But the same taxon is encoded the same. And mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, for example, uh, gastropod has uh, one, but uh, polyheads can be uh, very uh, high. Uh, very high and it can be also uh, this uh, BPC is uh, very uh, high. Okay, it, uh, can, I think it can be. Now I understand. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, the time is running, so we need to finish uh, this uh, presentation, but uh, it was really nice and continue your conversation via chat. And right now we uh, go ahead our schedule. Okay. And the next presentation is by Michał Gintoft from Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Sciences. And the title is The Coastal Zone of the Gulf of Gdańsk 30 Years Later. Hello everyone, my name is Michał Gintoft. I am PhD student at Geoplanet Doctoral School in Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Sciences. I would like to tell you about my research entitled The Coastal Zone of the Gulf of Gdańsk 30 years later. The Gulf of Gdańsk is a very diverse ecosystem. In the main part, there is a slope to the Gdańsk Deep, but there is also large area of shallow water called Putsk Lagoon, which is the innermost part of the Putsk Bay. It is also separated from other parts of Gulf of Gdańsk by Rifmef. The shallow depth provides very good conditions for algae and plant growth. Recently, there has been an increase of Zostera marina meadows, which provide a habitat for many macrozoobentos species. The coastland of Gulf of Gdańsk is mostly natural, except areas near Free City agglomeration and few other sites where local investments were made. In the Tri City area, there are also two large international ports. Also, several rivers enter into the Gulf of Gdańsk, and the larger, largest of which is the Vistula. To clarify what I will be talking about, macrozoobentos is the ecological formation of animals that are strictly associated with sediments and they are, they are larger than 1 mm. Macrozoobentos is a great ecological formation as an indicator of environmental health because of its, uh, because of its special features. For example, usually they live in one place for entire life. Some species are very sensitive to anthropogenic and chemical disturbances. Others are very resistant even to oxygen deficiency. They are relatively easy to analyze and have a key position in the ecosystem trophic network. So the main objective of this study was to assess the benthic communities in the shallow water zone of the Gulf of Gdańsk in terms of anthropogenic pressure and natural influence. To achieve our goal, we collected macrozoobentos samples from 11 stations using a 40 cm diameter core sample. The samples were then sieved in half millimeter mesh sieve and preserved in 4% formal formalin solution. The highest abundance of benthic organisms was recorded at the Hell Station. Next stations in this respect were Osłonino, Putnice and Władysławowo. As can be seen on the map, in terms of abundance, the Putsk Bay was most dominated by Oligoheta. The most dominant in Gulf of Gdańsk is Peringia ulva, and also, without going into details, there is a visible difference between stations at Hell Peninsula and in the west coast of Inner Putsk Bay. The highest biomass was not recorded at the Hell Station, but at the Osłonino Station, followed by Putnica and Władysławowo. As can be seen on the map, in terms of biomass, the most dominant in Hell Peninsula is Hediste diversicolor. The most dominant in Gulf of Gdańsk is Peringia ulva. 
there is no dominant species in stations at west coast of Inner Putsk Bay. BigY is an indicator of environmental quality based on the sensitivity of a given species in the study area. BigY was de developed by Rosenberg in 2004 and advanced by Leonardson in 2009. This indicator is also widely used in Europe. As shown by the BQI calculated for the coastal area of the Gulf of Gdańsk, the stations located within the Putsk Bay Inlet can be characterized as being in good and very good condition. Stations within the outer Putsk Bay are in poor condition, and stations located within the Vistula estuary are in bad condition. So, based on hierarchical, hierarchical cluster analysis of abundance and biomass, five macrozoobenthos grouping, groupings can be distinguished. Open water of the Gulf of Gdańsk, which is Świbno and Mikoszewo, Hell Peninsula, so Kuźnica, Jurata and Chałupy, and the groups in the inner Płock Bay, Władysławowo with Rzucewo, and Putnica with Osłonino. And the last one, the most unusual, which is the Hell Station. Comparing the abundance obtained in this study with data from previous studies conducted in the same areas, we can see significant increase in the proportion of oligoheta in abundance at stations along the peninsula, along the Hell Peninsula, Jurata, Kuźnica and Chałupy. At the stations at Osłonino and Rzucewo, the, the proportion of oligoheta also increased, while the proportion of uh, other taxonomic groups decreased. At Orłowo station, gastropoda became the dominant group, whereas previously crustacea. At Świpno, the taxonomic composition of macrozoobenthos was dominated by gastropoda, previously dominated by oligoheta, uh, by oligoheta. In Mikoševo, on the other hand, we moved from a relatively diversified composition with a high share of poly, uh, polyketa to a composition dominated by oligoheta. In terms of biomass, there, there have been big changes also. Uh, at stations along the Hell Peninsula, Jurata, Kuźnica and Chałupy, the share of Poliketa increased while the share of Bivalvia decreased. At Władysławowo, a decrease in share of Poliketa and increase in share of Bivalvia was recorded. At Rzucewo station, propor the proportion of Bivalvia decreased and the proportion of other taxonomic groups slightly increased. At Osłonino, the dominance of Poliketa changed uh, into dominance of Bivalvia. Gastropoda started to dominate both at Orłowo and Świbno, whereas in Mikoszewo the biomass structure was completely dominated by Polyheta. So, to sum up my research, at the Hell Station, dominance of oligo Oligoheta, influence of sewage treatment plants and or freshwater grants and freshwater groundwater di discharge has been um, has been found. Orłowo, Świbno and Mikoszewo, located in the open water area of the Gulf of Gdańsk, presents a distinct structure uh, of the benthic community. Putnica and Osłonino represents sheltered sheltered sites with a clear influence of the rivers. The stations along the Hell Peninsula are under great tourist pressure. Different anthropogenic impacts are evident in the cross-section of the entire Gulf of Gdańsk. However, the presence of natural processes shaping the structure of bandy communities is also evident. There have also been significant changes in the structure of the macrozoobenthus community in the coastal zone of the Gdańsk Bay, both in terms of abundance and biomass. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you for your presentation. And now uh, there's time for questions for Michal.
So if you have any, put in the chat or ask questions. So if there are no questions, I have one. Um, so you mentioned that uh, there was a great change in biomass and uh, abundance of species in Gulf of Gdańsk across those 30 years. And if there is one dominant factor that was um, like was the reason for those changes, uh, what would that be? If you would need to like pick one, the most important factor that caused all of those changes. Is it possible to describe one? You can, uh, yeah? Actually, it's a very hard question because in ecology, we can say that uh, this is the only one reason because there is uh, a lot of reasons uh, why it happened. Um, Okay, but the main one, I think, it's a very, uh, it's very wide. It's an anthropogenic pressure and increase in uh, tourist uh, uh, impact uh, on the uh, on these beaches on this coastal zone. Okay, thank you. And I see that Ursula Janas has her hand raised, so um, you can ask your question now. Thank you very much for interesting presentation. And I have a question about methods. Uh, did you use, um, for comparison, you need um, to use similar method, uh, similar peri period of time. Uh, did you use similar equipment, um, similar places and um, um, tools? Was it a grab or, I know that you use uh, color, but as I remember, Lehu Kotwicki used another equipment. And another question, if I have time, uh, about the environmental parameters. What kind of um, environmental background you will use in your, um, in your studies? Thank you. Okay, thank you for those questions. Uh, uh, Lech Kotwicki used uh, Morduhai, uh, I don't remember uh, full name, but uh, Morduhai and some other uh, guy, uh, core sample, sampler. Uh, and uh, mm, the diameter of these sample, samplers are the same. So, yeah, I think uh, it's uh, comparable. And uh, the other question: uh, What about what was... season? Season is also season. Uh, it is uh, from spring. It is a very uh, fresh uh, research. Uh, we were uh, taking samples in uh, uh, at the start of April. Uh, so we just uh, finished uh, the. Uh, we just finished the uh, macrozoobentos samples, and uh, now we'll go with uh, other samples. It is chlorophyll A uh, and uh, granulometric analysis. Also, we measured a temperature, uh, pH, um, nitrate, uh, nitrates with a special probe, but uh, this. Uh, uh, and this uh, parameters needs to be uh, um, they require further analysis and uh, we i just didn't have time to do it so i didn't present it okay uh, thank you i hope that answers your questions if not uh, please continue your conversation via chat and right now we need to proceed to the next presentation of the session, uh, which is by Aleksandra Łukasiak from University of Gdańsk. And the topic is the role of small RNA molecules in the regulation of repression anti-repression system of 24B phage in E. coli bacteria. So Alexandra, the floor is yours. Yes, hello. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Please share your screen, if possible, and your presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, is the presentation visible yes now? it is visible. You can put it in a presentation mode. Yes, 
Okay. Yes. Yes, it is visible. It's perfect. And the floor is yours once again. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Ola Łukasiak and I am a biology student at the University of Gdańsk and my topic is the role of small non-coding RNS in the regulation of the life cycle switch of phages carrying dangerous to human health toxins. And um, Escherichia coli is a bacterium that is commonly found in the gut of humans and warm-blooded animals. And most strains of E. coli are harmless. However, such as Shiga toxin producing E. coli can cause severe foodborne disease because bacteria produce Shiga toxins, which is a phage encoded exotoxin, uh, inhibiting protein synthesis in host cells. And Shiga toxin E. coli is carried by animals, especially cattle and sheep. And people are infected when they come into contact with the feces of an infected animal or person. And the infection is spread through people eating contaminated food or water and direct contact with infected animals. Uh, and it, it can also spread from person to person. Uh, symptoms of the disease caused by Shigatoxin E. coli include abdominal cramps and diarrhea that may in some cases progress to bloody diarrhea and fever and vomiting may also occur. Um, most patients recover within 10 days, but in a small proportion of patients, um, especially uh, young children and the elderly, the infection may lead to a life-threatening uh, disease, uh, such as hemolytic remic syndrome, uh, which is characterized by acute renal fa failure and can lead to hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. And a foodborne outbreak in Germany in May and June 2011 sick more than 4,000 people and caused more than 15 deaths. And approximately 23% approximately of the patients developed hemolytic remic syndrome. And the outbreak spread quickly over northern Germany and other countries and is one of the largest outbreak of E. coli infection reported to date. Uh, as I said before, the genes encoding Shiga toxins are found in the genome of STX bacteriophages. Uh, and phages exhibit two distinct uh, life cycle in bacteria, a lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. And during the lytic cycle, phages replicate and progeny particles are released through lice. Uh, by contrast, during lysogeny, phages integrate their genomes into the bacterial chromosome and enter a dormant state. Uh, and at a later stage, uh, such temperate dormant phages can re-enter a uh, lytic cycle and release protein. Uh, so bacteriophages carrying Shiga toxin genes undergo both these cycles, and uh, those can disseminate toxin genes among, among E. coli bacteria, uh, converting them into highly virulent strains. Uh, so the expression of the toxin genes is inhibiting, inhibited during lysogeny and tightly linked to phage lytic development in E. coli bacteria. So in this slide, the understanding of the mechanism that regulates the switch between lysogenic and lytic phage cycle seems to be um, extremely important. So in general, uh, this regulation is based on the activation and inactivation of the major phage repressors of lytic de development called C1 in case of lambdoid phages. And these DNA, uh, DNA binding repressors are, are involved in uh, inhibition of the main phage promoters. And the binding of a repressor to an operator site is a mechanism of negative regulation to inhibit transcriptional initiation and thus to suppress the expression of the genes essential for the lytic cycle. So for the phage to enter the lytic pathway, the repressor must be inactivated. And to date, two mechanisms uh, for the inactivation of the phage repressors in temperate phages have been described. And the first mechanism works, let's say, from outside of the phage uh, and involves host SOS system that can be induced by different conditions. Uh, such as uh, physiological changes in the host cells, for example, an antibiotics. Uh, for this reason, the use of antibiotics in the treatment is inadvisable because by inducing prophage, we lead to the formation of a greater amount of toxin. So in most cases, the inducers of SOS response provoke DNA damage, which result in inactivation uh, of RecA protein and degradation phage encoded repressor. The second mechanism, to control repressor activity 
uses degradation phage encoded repressor and the canonical method, uh, method of inactivated, inactivating a repressor is through the competitive binding of the antirepressor to the operator binding site uh, of the repressor. So if antirepressor wins the binding to the target operator site, it disrupts the high affinity interaction between repressor and promoter region. So as a consequence, phage genes, including this encoding shiga toxin, remaining under control of this promoter are expressed, resulting in the production of the protein is essential for the lytic cycle. So shiga toxin converting phage, Phe24b, and other phages possess in their genomes at least three additional sequences called ANT, ROY, and DANT, uh, and they are predicted to encode antirepressors. Also, our group discovered one small non-coding RNA molecule uh, named 24B1, and this 20 nucleotide long molecule was isolated from uh, E. coli culture after the induction of STX phage V24B, and we assume that 24B1 is a product of the specific cleavage of the longer 18 nucleotide long transcript. And we tested various aspects of development um, of bacteriophage V24B, bearing the deletion of the region encoding the microRNA size molecule. So tested bacteriophages were added to MOI of 1, 5, or 10. And we found, we found that uh, lysogenization of the host cells by the mutant phage is less efficient than, than by white type phage, and lower number of bacterial cells survived the uh, infection in each MOI. And what is more, induction of the mutant prophage was quicker and lytic development more efficient than in white type phage. So it seems that um, the uh, 24B1 molecule uh, is a negative regulator of the antigen expression resulting in favor of the lysogenic cycle. So in the light of our interest, sorry, uh, in the light of our interest in small non-codic RNAs and low number of uh, reports describing the role of such RNA molecule during uh, phage switch from lysogenic lytic uh, development, we have decided to take a closer look at this topic. And using the RNA seq technique, we identified several small RNA molecules encoded in the highly conserved regions of antirepressor genes of STX phages. And two of them nam named APANT1 and APANT2 are encoded upstream of the coding sequence of ANT gene. Another two called APROI1 and APROI2 are located upstream of the coding sequence of ROI gene. And the last two molecules named uh, the ant one and the ant 2 are placed upstream of the coding sequence of the ant gene. So the two, um, two molecules we found, up ant one and the ant one are short to resemble typical eukaryotic microRNAs and have about 22 nucleotides. And the other are slightly longer, uh, and they have been found during lighting development of uh, STX um, phage V24B in E. coli bacteria. Uh, so at the beginning of our research, we decided to check if the overexpression of the newly identified microRNA size molecules of phage origin has the influence on the development of, uh, of this phage in E. coli cells. So in our experiments, we have employed uh, derivatives of the multi-copy uh, PUC19 uh, plasmid during the sequence uh, of tested molecules. And all experiments were conducted in the conditions that promoted the lytic cycle of the uh, STX, STX phage. Uh, so in the first step, we analyzed the kinetic of the E. coli bacteria growth after V24B infection at two different uh, MOI, two and five. And we observed that the overexpression of both tested molecules, up the ant one and two, caused less efficient decrease uh, of the bacterial culture density relative to the control samples. And it is also worth to underline that uh, the effect of the overexpression of tested molecules on the growth of bacterial host was less spectacular at an MOI of five. However, the tendency was uh, maintained. Moreover, 
we also noticed that the survival rates of infected bacterial cells bearing the additional copies of ABD and one and two molecules were higher than those in experiments with control variants. Uh, and formation of lysogenes uh, was more effective during the overexpression of tested molecules relative to the um, bacterial cells with control plasmid. And taking into account these observations, we can suggest that these molecules may stimulate the lysogenic development of this phage. And in the same experimental system, uh, we analyzed the influence of the overexpression of APRI1 and 2 molecules on the bacterial culture density after uh, V24B infection uh, at an MOI uh, of 2 and 5. And we observed that during the infection process of E. coli bacteria with this phage, the overexpression of these molecules uh, significantly uh, decreased the survival rates of host cells in comparison with control. Uh, at which these molecules are produced uh, at not modified level. And this phenomenon was even more pronounced in the case of an MOE of five. And in accordance with the host survival experiment, we have also noticed that efficiency of lysogenization of E. coli bacteria bearing a plasmid with, a, with the sequences of APRI1 and two molecules was less effective relative to those containing only the plasmid vector. So we can conclude that APRI1 and two uh, I'm just finished. Mm -hmm. uh, APRI1 and 2 are an example of the small microRNA molecules with a different mechanism of action than the molecules ABDANT and ABDANT2 and also 24B1. It probably may promote the lytic development of the, um, this phage. And the, there are conclusions. Uh, in comparison to the very large number of reports related to um, encoded microRNAs, current knowledge about the microRNAs molecules prokaryotic system is still far from completenesses. And newly identified microRNA cells molecules of phage origin may play the crucial role in the switch, switching from lysogenic to lytic life cycle. And thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, are there any questions? Hello? I see some on the chat. Yes, OK. So uh, you may answer those. Uh, what is uh, exact? Moi exactly and how it affects phage development. Um, okay, so um, MOI, yes. yes. MOI is a um, multiplicity of infection and um, it is the average number of phage per bacterium. So um, maybe some, something, for example, uh, for example, MOI5 tell us that five phages can attack one bacterial cell. So when the MOI is high, then bacteriophages enter the lysogenic cycle because the competition is very high. And there is a risk that the daughter, daughter phages will not have a host. So, and by contrast, lower MOI um, causes the phage to enter the lytic cycle uh, because there are many host cells in relation to the phage. Uh, and what about second question? So if antibiotics doesn't work, so how treatment looks? Uh, treatment is mainly taking um, uh, electrolyte, electrolyte intake, drinking a lot of water, taking antiparetic uh, drugs. Uh, and uh, in severe cases, it is a kidney transplantation or blood transfusion. And that's it. Thank you for your questions. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, if anyone has more questions, then just write them in the chat and we proceed with our uh, session. Okay, so the uh, next presentation is by Zuzanna Czenczek uh, from University of Gdańsk uh, with topic influence of non-native species of macrozobentic community structure. I uh, think, uh, hello, and you can share your screen. Yes. and proceed with your presentation. Okay, I'm now gonna try to do it because I'm quite uh, new to uh, okay, sure. I'm used to MS Teams. Um, yes. If you prefer, I can share it for you. Uh, I think first... it's okay. okay. Uh, it's okay. Um... Okay. Oh. It's already visible for us, so... Yes, and I will just quickly yes. check if the slides are changing. Yeah. You can see? Yes, yes so we can. Okay. Uh, yes, so I will uh, start. 
So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Zuzanna Czenczak. Um, I'm a, a student at Institute of Oceanography in um, Gdańsk uh, University. And um, today I will uh, share with you my presentation about um, influence of non-native species on macrozobentos uh, community structure. Um, case of uh, Range Kunata in the uh, Wiswashmian River. And my uh, research was conducted under the supervision of um, Halina Kędzierska and Ursula Janas. Uh, first, I would like to explain what are alien species. So alien or non-indigenous species are uh, species introduced um, outside of their uh, past or present natural habitat. Um, those species are the uh, basically the greatest uh, threat to the stability of um, ecosystems um, on a, a global scale. And um, there are a few examples of introduction vectors, uh, such as shipping when organisms or the larvae are transported in the uh, ballast waters or um, the falling organisms uh, can be transported between ports and uh, marinas on the ships. Um, there are approximately uh, 130 to known alien species already known in the Baltic Sea and almost half of them um, are the macrozoventa species. And only in uh, Putsk Bay since uh, the year 2000, at least 25 of 92 macrozoventa species were known native to this area, um, such as uh, polyket uh, marancellaria, polyket worm, um, American crab, uh, Ritopanopeus harisi, and uh, clam Rangia kunata. And um, Rangia is native to Atlantic coast of uh, North uh, America. It's a food source for aquatic predators, um, shrimps, crabs, and also uh, for birds. Um, also Native Americans relied on uh, Rangia as an, an important food source. And Rangia was uh, harvested in a, a Lake Pontchartrain, and the shells were used to build uh, roads leaves, parking lots, and uh, to make uh, cement. And Ranga is still harvested in uh, Mexico, for example. Um, the first record in Europe is from uh, Belgium from 2005. And since then, um, Ranga spread it further uh, in the Baltic Sea. Uh, and in 2011, uh, Ranga Kunata was found in the Vistula Lagoon in uh, Poland also uh, in Germany and uh, near uh, Lubeck, in Parno Bay in Estonia and uh, other places. Um, Herangia uh, has a thick brownish or yellowish uh, shell. Uh, the shell is uh, ve very hard uh, from my experience. It's uh, much harder um, comparing to uh, other shells we can uh, find on the beach. Um, the maximum shell length is uh, up to five centimeters in Poland, and also the maximum lifespan uh, is 10 years. Uh, Ranga is very resistant to fluctuations of uh, temperature and salinity. It's usually uh, found in estuaries when water can range from uh, fresh to brackish, basically, um, in its natural habitat. Um, water temperature can range from 10 to 35 degrees Celsius, and salinity can range from 0 to 18. The aim of this study was to uh, determine macrozolventus um, biodiversity in the uh, Wisła Leśmiała River by analysis of the uh, abundance and biomass of organisms, uh, with particular emphasis of Ranga Kunata in Baltic communities. Uh, samples were collected in April 2015 from five stations um, at the mouth of uh, Wiswashmiara River uh, to collect the samples uh, Van Vingrad uh, were used, uh, which uh, you can see in the picture. Um, also, the samples were analyzed sorry, uh, using standard uh, laboratory methods. 
and based on uh, fauna composition and biomass stations were divided into um, four groups. Uh, in each uh, group, abundance of biomass species were separately analyzed. So uh, a total of 23 taxa were found. Uh, eight of those taxa are regarded as non-indigenous species to this region. In uh, 2015, Rangia uh, Kunata occurred only at uh, two out of five stations. And uh, these were station uh, 2.2 and 3.1. I don't know if you can uh, see what I'm pointing at, um, but you can see the uh, five stations um, on the map on the left. Uh, Rangia Kunata uh, was uh, a dominant uh, taxon in biomass. Um, at station 2.2. Um, two stations where uh, Rangia was present uh, show similarity to each other and stood out from the rest of the stations. The stations where Rangia uh, was present uh, are in group one and group two, and other stations are in group three and uh, group four. Uh, also in all groups, the dominant uh, species among bivalves, uh, according to uh, abundance, um, were Mea arenaria or Macoma baltica. And some main conclusions. Uh, so in 2015, uh, Rangia Kunata occurred only at uh, stations in Viswashmina River. Uh, there was no specimens found in uh, stations further in Agnansk Bay, like stations uh, you may see uh, on a, a map, station 81 or 82, there was no Rangia there. And uh, the occurrence of Rangia Kunata did not affect negatively the biodiversity on analyzed stations. Uh, for example, on station 2.2 where Rangia was present, there was the uh, highest uh, amount of taxa uh, compared to other stations. And uh, at station 2.2, Rangia Kunata has taken the uh, domination in the biomass from Macoma Baltica, according to research, for example, from uh, 2010. And these are my uh, references. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now is the time for questions. And I see Natalia Miernik has some questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Susanna, for the great presentation. But this I have was very one... quick, I think. <laughs> I didn't okay. check the time. Uh, but I have one following question for your presentation. Um, you mentioned that Rangia has a wide range of tolerance of salinity, but it's mainly found in estuaries. And do you think that Rangia can and will disperse through the Baltic Sea region or not? Um, I think yes, because as I sorry, as I mentioned before, uh, Rangia was found in uh, Germany, in Amsterdam canals, in Parno Bay in Estonia and other places. But um, Rangia uh, needs to have um, enough food. And uh, in estuaries, there's usually like a plenty of food. The Rangia is a food trader. So it's uh, feeding basically from the um, food dispersed uh, dispersed in the water. And um, I think uh, there is a chance um, very high uh, for Rangia to spread uh, along the Polish uh, coast. And I think in the uh, other, but on the Polish coast uh, coastline, yes, but uh, only in the shallower areas, not uh, like the greatest depths. Uh, for example, in Vistula Lagoon, there's like a very, uh, it's a very shallow water and uh, Rangia spread there everywhere basically um, but uh, I think um, in uh, the Baltic Sea Rangia will occur only like in the shallow waters near um, uh, rivers in estuaries not in the greatest uh, depths and also Rangia preferred uh, muddy or like sandy muddy bottom not rocky not the you know the um, great big uh, chunks of 
sand and and just basically the uh, very soft bottom. So that's my answer. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, I cannot see in the chat. I cannot see raised hands. So um, maybe I have one. So if you mentioned that Rangia has spread and that it will probably spread even more, uh, I will ask um, if you have any awareness of what factors, environmental ones or any other, are the um, main reason for this uh, spread of this species. And uh, if you plan to uh, take it into account in your statistics in the future, or, yeah. Um, yes, um, you asked me because I almost forgot the questions. Um, Sorry about the <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> the spread of um, yes the spread um, it's very hard to specifically said that oh uh, this species was transferred in a ballast waters or oh the species was transferred in other ways um, I mentioned the ballast waters and the falling organisms uh, because um, scientists assumed that there's like uh, two main uh, factors and. Um, for example, um, there's very probably Rangia uh, was transferred also in the um, ballast waters, at least um, to the um, uh, Antwerp uh, port. And then um, may Rangia might be transferred <laughs> um, in um, ballast waters or other uh, vessels throughout the uh, Baltic Sea because the first record uh, was in the Antwerp port. And I think from the Antwerp port, um, Ranga spread it uh, further on the smaller uh, vessels, but uh, I'm not sure. And I think uh, in my opinion, it's not possible to say like, yes, it was 100% uh, ballast waters or 100% other things, because it's uh, very hard to detect um, like uh, the specific factor. Yeah, this. sure. So uh, this was actually also a part of my question. If there are yeah. any like multiple factors that you take into consideration when studying uh, this topic, like environmental factors, like I don't know, water quality, temperature, oh. yes. mm, things like this. Uh, yes, uh, because Rangia is resistant to high fluctuations. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Baltic Sea, we have like, um, um, ideal um, water temperature and uh, also the salinity for Rangia. And we don't have um, like big predators. Uh, I mentioned birds and uh, yes, birds uh, eat Rangia, but uh, we don't uh, have like um, big crabs who can crush uh, the Rangia. So uh, the species yeah. is very safe here. and. It's eaten, in my opinion, it's uh, usually eaten um, by the smaller organisms uh, like shrimps uh, after uh, the adult uh, rangia or uh, young juvenile dies and the shell opens because the uh, shell is very, very hard. And I think um, rangia is quite safe here. Uh, these are like good environmental factors. Uh, salinity for rangia is great. Temperature for rangia is great. In the Vistula Lagoon um, and Vistula Delta, it's plenty of food, and I think she likes here. Yeah, and <laughs> so you she will stay. So, do you expect those uh, conditions to be better and better in the future due to the, for, for example, climate change, or uh, you would not risk this? Uh... Uh, I think um, because Rangi is a filtrator. And uh, due to water water uh, filtration, Arangia can increase the water quality. So I think it's uh, good. Uh, but um, Arangia don't have, um, in my opinion, also it's a food source for other organisms. But um, as I mentioned that uh, Rangia um, pushed <laughs> the uh, Macuma Baltica uh, from the uh, first place uh, in um, the biomass in uh, in this, uh, those stations. But um, uh, Macoma Baltica is still there. 
uh, it's not like uh, eliminated. So they're just being there um, at peace. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think that answered my questions. And uh, continue asking your questions via chat. And right now we have a break till 11.20. And then we will meet at second session of our conference. Thank you very much to all of the speakers and participants. And we'll see you soon. <laughs> I, I think we can easily start now. Hi, hello, everyone. Welcome at the second session of International Support Youth Conference. I hope you had some time to grab some tea or coffee. Uh, my name is Grażyna Niedoszytko, and I'll be your guide during this session. Um, Dear presenters, uh, as you have to keep tight with the time, I'll be interrupting you after 14 minutes of your presentation. Uh, so we have time to answer the questions uh, from the public. Um, please welcome Rupam Dani from the School of Management Studies, Techno India. Rupam, are you with us? Yes. Yes, uh, good morning, ma'am. Hi, I can see you. Uh, I can also hear you. Please share the screen with us. Show us the presentation. Uh, yes, ma'am, I'm sharing the screen. So uh, can I start uh, the presentation? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so good morning, first of all. The, thank you to all the dignitaries present here and uh, mostly support science association to give this golden opportunity to present my research in this conference. Uh, myself, Rupam Dhani, Faculty of Management Studies, Technoment Salt Lake, West Bengal, India. I am going to present on my research topic an empirical study on critical success factors of Indian social entrepreneurship, considering mainly three sectors, community development, healthcare, and sustainable energy sectors. In respect of our country, India, due to demographic dividend, India is the second largest country in terms of population among the world. But most of this population lies below the poverty line, those require social security. As during the sudden imposition of lockdown due to the COVID pandemic, all the micro, small and medium sector enterprises have to start their business due to low demand from the market, for which about the 100 million of migrant and local workers, they lost their jobs. And also, they also, the migrant workers, they started to return back from their home, uh, from their workplace to their village, to their cities and to their, uh, to their locality. But after this uh, pandemic situation also, the post-pandemic situation, it can be seen that there are a lot of chaotic situation happen uh, surrounding our uh, community. Because uh, that uh, before the pandemic situation, the main uh, requirement for the company, the skills requirement for the uh, company is different than the different in this post-pandemic situation. So that's why the unemployment rate is still rises. And apart from that, uh, in this uh, pandemic situation, in this cha chaotic situation, there is a huge gap between the community in terms of economic and in terms of social, social condition. Because a uh, lot of people, a lot of community, they don't have jobs. And some of the uh, higher income level community, they have the jobs, they have the business, they have basically the income in their hands. So this creates a huge community gap in terms of economical and social condition. Thus, uh, the government in the country like this India for this large population, the government cannot do alone anything, everything. So that's why the entrepreneurship is needed. The social entrepreneurship is one of the sectors, one of the major portion of entrepreneurship. And the social entrepreneurship is basically more aligned to the social change, social cause, social mission. And they basically, uh, through their innovative ideas, through their innovative, um, innovative things, innovative ideas, innovative uh, products, they basically are flipped for the livelihood of the community. And also, they are also engaged in development of the community by providing the sustainable solution of different social causes. 
like for example the sanitary causes for example the health care for example the skill development if and others and also apart from that the social entrepreneurs they also provide their solution for the healthcare services sustainable energy at the root level of the entire country so these are basically a few things that social entrepreneurs they basically do for the community but still the social entrepreneurs are uh, there are different other uh, different other success uh, stories and also there are different other failure stories for social in terms of social entrepreneurship and this uh, social entrepreneurship the main failure is basically to provide the service due to the lack of capital and also lack of motivation because in uh, in one uh, in one sector the motivation is very very important for social mission and also in the other side the capital or the funding is also important to serve for the community and sometimes it can be seen that uh, any individual they start their business they start their operation as a social entrepreneur but after few years of operation they convert to the commercial entrepreneur basically that means they uh, their main motive is to switch from the social mission to the profit making so that's why again that is a failure of social entrepreneurs and also the most importantly the main gap or the main uh, failure is to mismatch between the personality behavior and uh, behavior with the providing services that means the so most of the cases the social entrepreneurs they uh, they have the lack to identify that what is the personality actually required to serve for the society so this is basically few gaps i have identified by uh, researching from different other previously published journals so this uh, my article my this research is basically on the basis of secondary data collection method and uh, so that's why my objective or you can say the outcome of this uh, research or uh, research work is to identify the critical success factor of these social entrepreneurs that why the social entrepreneurs uh, could be success what are the uh, different success factor behind their work behind their operation and also i will um, i will introduce few sectors mainly three sectors the community development healthcare services and sustainable energy sectors through which the social entrepreneurs can serve for the community and also at, uh, at the end i will uh, propose a linkage model between the critical success factor and the contribution sectors that uh, how this critical success factor is links with the success of the overall social enterprise so these are basically some outcome uh, from this uh, research uh, that you can expect so first uh, introduced to the critical success factor that critical success factor is basically the factors those are basically um, uh, the success behind any work so as a social entrepreneur or as a social entrepreneurship business that could be three types the individual or the interpersonal that means the main uh, key factor of the person who basically who is called as a uh, social entrepreneur who basically serve for the community so that is the individual or interpersonal factor and there are the organizational factor and institutional factor that are basically as a whole as a whole business as a whole community as a whole company so as a individual or the interpersonal factor i have uh, taken a few critical success factor from my point of view definitely by researching from the other uh, research journals that is first is the risk taking and opportunity identified because at every business there is a risk taking and in case of social entrepreneurship there is the the risk uh, parameter is most high because of what because in case of it can be seen that i am serving for the community for a long years for a five years or for 10 years but still the community don't give any appreciation don't give any recognition uh, to me so that means that is a uh, that is a uh, big demotivational factor and yes there could be a risk taking maybe i don't uh, i uh, i am need the funding right now by i don't have i don't have the funding in my hand so that is a risk taking maybe there is a uh, there is any failure like for example in case of healthcare services if any small uh, incident will happen complete uh, business will be shut down that is so that's why the risk taking is very very important and opportunity identified is also important because uh, before few uh, few time few months there is a lockdown and uh, for lockdown uh, that need the community kitchen for feed for feeding the nutritious food for the community for the lower income level community so that is the opportunity identified and also the social problem solving passion that i as a social entrepreneur i definitely have the passion for doing something for the social and also the self motivation as i already told there are different other demotivational factor uh, uh, surrounding myself 
that could be the that could be my uh, reference group so that means the my family person my friends my friend circle my uh, colleagues all could be demotivate me for doing this type of things but i have to self motivate it and also attractiveness and clarity of innovation that means uh, I definitely, as a social entrepreneur, I definitely give some innovative idea for social causes, for social problems. And I have to clarity in this uh, innovation. I, have, I must have the clarity. I should have the clarity. Uh, and also the uh, factors, also the innovative ideas should be attractive to us for all. And also personality for frontline services. If you think about the disaster, for disaster, the disaster management uh, group or the defined social entrepreneurs, they need to work as a frontline services and as a frontline worker and also the networking. So these are few critical success factors I have found basically, and I have sorted for the individual uh, factors, individual skills, and also for in case of organization, if I consider the organizational factor, there are different organizational factors like the funding. This is the most foremost and the most important uh, factors that without funding, I cannot do alone anything. Yes, maybe I have money, but uh, how many years, how many days I can spend those money because that is limited. So that's why they need some funding. And that need the organization need that need the uh, local uh, local capacity building. The local capacity building, that means uh, where I basically do my business from which locality I have basically I want to serve for the people. So that's why the local capacity building is also important and the beneficiary engagement. The beneficiary means the uh, customer or the local people who basically take the service from me. So that is the organization. And uh, then the, some institutional support is also important like from the central and state government or the local government. And also most importantly, the public or private institutional support in terms of CSR, the corporate social responsibility. In India also, uh, that Indian government managed the CSR or the corporate social responsibility contribution for all the public and private institutions. So these are some critical success factors I basically found. And uh, next, I basically, I basically described the three sectors as I already uh, described at the beginning, the community development. That community development, that community uh, could be developed by different other terms. In terms of there are a lot of opportunity for uh, educational programs like the vocational training, skill development, placement programs, all of these are due to the unemployment. This, uh, this need, uh, the rise of these needs is very, very much. Next is the homelessness. Homelessness is another factor for the country like different other uh, underdeveloping or the uh, developing countries. So the homelessness uh, is another sector, but uh, different other countries they have the they have some regulations that government will be um, government will help for building the brick and mortar buildings. But some of the society, some of the community, they don't get that access. That's so main job of the social entrepreneurs is to be helping them to get access for the public funding or the governmental benefits, and also the domestic violence are there and cultural development are there. Because uh, for, through the social entrepreneurs, they can uh, give the psychological and economical support for the um, victims. And also, they can, the social entrepreneurs, they basically expose, they basically explore the um, uh, cultural development, the local cultural development in front of world. So these are a few things of the community development that the social entrepreneurs can contribute. Next thing is the healthcare services. For healthcare services, there are different other sectors like the sexual and reproductive health, maternal and infant child health, different others. And there are different the counseling sectors, ensuring healthcare and nutrition as food intervention. All of these things fall under the healthcare services. Oh, and I have mentioned. I have mentioned here uh, that uh, few social entrepreneurship business like rural healthcare uh, foundation, such foundation. These are few social entrepreneurship business. They basically work in these services. And uh, same thing in case of sustainable energy, like the social entrepreneurs, they basically uh, implement the sustainable energy uh, in terms of uh, implementing the clean energy and access network. So here uh, is the basic things that is the, that I already told the linkage model that the organizational uh, factor, the different critical success factor is basically um, influenced through the social entrepreneurship. That after that, that need to match the critical success factor with the social requirement that what I want to do and what is the uh, critical success factor required for that. If I want to do the uh, contribute in the case of healthcare, what I require. If I contribute uh, in sustainable energy, what I require that need to match. And then that is automatically motivated uh, to the social entrepreneurs. And finally, that is the deliverable. 
and if this delivery will happen definitely the upliftment of society uh, will be happen minimizing the societal and economical gap will be happen and uh, definitely access of all the facilities uh, for the um, from the governmental sector and the other funding is to happen and that is the ultimate motto of every social entrepreneurship business and that means the successful as a social entrepreneur and uh, different so the implication of this research project or the research topic is to success for the social entrepreneurship by minimizing the failure of social entrepreneurs and the uh, sustainable that is the uh, if uh, as a social entrepreneur they can easily assess the critical success factor they can sustainable for long run and that will definitely motivate the new generation to come up with the new ideas for the society and to uh, to invest themselves in uh, for the social cause and that is ultimately implement the societal development but still uh, this research project of my research project is some limitation as this research topic is completely based on the secondary data collection due to the lack of funding so if i get uh, some funding in future the definitely i will uh, do the interview method uh, for the beneficiary as well as for the social entrepreneurs that what is the basically critical success factor actually uh, they drive uh, for the social cause so this is basically due to the lack of funding this is the limitation for this research topic and also as a conclusion i the i i, I can tell that social entrepreneurs is in growing number that can contribute to the socio and economic development of the whole region and also through this uh, research uh, proposal through this um, uh, your the linkage model that structures the thought of social entrepreneurship decision that what they want to do in future and they can align they can pictory they can pick uh, structure is the whole data so with this i am conclude uh, my uh, presentation that the social entrepreneurship is very very important nowadays and uh, that social entrepreneurship need to assess their critical success factor to contribute for the society thank you Thank you very much for this very interesting and intense presentation. As we run out of time, uh, please, uh, if anyone has any questions, contact Rupam in the comment section. And now I can see already with us Alejandra Conseo. Hello. From, uh, University of Zaragoza. Um, Alejandra, can you see us? Can you hear us? Yes. Share your presentation with us. Yes. Uh... Mm -hmm. Do you see it full screen? Uh, yes, we yes? do. Yes. All good. All good. Okay. Okay. We because I have here the zoom in the middle and I cannot see my own presentation. <laughs> so the virtual floor is yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So uh, yes, I am uh, Alejandra Consejo. I am from Spain. I am um, a professor and researcher in physics. So this is not usually my panel, uh, but I'm, I'm here today to, to explain to you our experience on how we have implemented or we are implementing uh, sustainable development goals in the School of Engineering and Architecture of our uh, public university. So first things first, uh, so what are the sustainable development goals? Probably you are pretty much familiar with this picture. These are these uh, 17 goals uh, that they were described and they form a part of the agenda 2030. That probably that's also a term that it's familiar to you. So this is, let's say, a kind of a big deal among majority of the states in the world that aims to reduce or to end extreme poverty uh, and uh, pursue actions towards a sustainable future for everyone by the end of the year 2030. So this is what it is. Probably, yeah, once again, you are very familiar with these colors, at least. So what is the aim of this, of this work? It has two main objectives. The first objective is to describe the actions that we are taking in our institution, in our school, to implement these, these goals, to try to uh, impact our students and the society in general. So during the, my presentation is not gonna be very long. So I hope we will have some time to discuss and maybe you can give me some ideas or yeah, ask further questions. And the second part, um, I would like to present to describe the opinion of a small group of students about, about all of this. 
Okay, so the first part of the presentation is yeah, first explaining uh, what actions we are taking in our school. But first, let's describe a little bit where we are. And the context is, okay, I, as I said, I'm from Spain. That's the city where we are. This is uh, Zaragoza. I call it the 300 kilometer city because it's 300 kilometers away from everything, 300 kilometers away from Madrid, from Barcelona, from France, from the Basque country, from the beach. <laughs> so 300 kilometers away. Uh, this is the city. So it's pretty nice destination. If you've not been there, I take the opportunity to make some publicity. It's a medium-sized city like Wrocław, more or less. And uh, it's a place of the Universidad de Zaragoza, University of Zaragoza. It's a rather old university. Uh, it's a public university with 30,000 students. And within this big university, there is one campus, one school, that is a school of engineering and architecture. That is where I'm currently working and this work is mostly done so it's in this center so with engineering uh, students okay one thing that i want to tell you from now is that the the keyword uh, sustainable development goals in spanish is uh, objetivos de desarrollo sostenible i am saying this because in the upcoming pictures you might see recurrently the ods so you know that ODS is exactly the same as SDG, it's just a matter of the language. In fact, in, at some point I might also say ODS in, in my mind. So I might say that, but I'm referring all the time to the same. I just wanted to, to clarify. It. Okay, so I will talk about, let's say four pillars. One, I will present the environment, environmental committee that was formed in the, within the school to tackle all the activities that came after that. I will describe uh, some of the activities of publicity that were done on campus. Uh, I will comment also on syllabus uh, modifications. And I will describe some activities of both the students and personal engagement with societies, because it was very important to us that the, these actions don't stay only within the school, but it goes beyond. And the people from the city can also somehow benefit from, from these actions. OK, so the environmental committee, it's a group of professors, researchers, and admin staff. Uh, right now, it's larger than the people that appear in that picture, but that's the picture that I have, sorry for that. Plus, not only, it's not only uh, uh, adults, let's say, or it's not only professors and yeah, professionals, but it's also this environmental committee, it's also formed by a student group that it's called Motivados. If any of you knows Spanish, you will realize that it's a word play, uh, word, word play because Motivados means somehow engaged. Okay, so this is why it's trying to this this ODS. Okay, so that's it. So this environmental committee, it's formed by a group of volunteers. No one needs getting any kind of extra salary or anything because of that. It's just volunteering activity of yeah, any, any kind of person that works in the school can, can join this initiative. Okay, and this environmental committee has four uh, pillars of action. First, education, because yeah, we are a university, research, because exactly of the same reason, and also env environmental management. You will see some examples of, of this, how we try to deal with that. And mm, to the four pillar of action, as I was mentioning before, is trying to reach the, the society. Okay, so here are the examples of the publicity on, on campus. This is, let's say, very basic. This is just uh, decorations. Uh, this kind of decorations, we realize that we need to move them after a while because otherwise people stop seeing them. So in the beginning, they are interested on what is projected on the video and so on. But if these cubes stay in the same place for long, then people stop <laughs> looking at them. So they are moving within different uh, buildings of the school. And uh, okay, here uh, we have an example of a remainder of people uh, to ask people to close the windows when they leave and to switch off the light to save energy. These kind of posters were there um, forever, so this is nothing new. 
But what is new is this kind of reminder or let's say or calling to which specific goals you are helping if you do these actions. So somehow the poster was modified and you can find this kind of posters in every classroom, uh, in the public places, in toilets, for example, you also can find these kind of posters. And also in, the, in common areas, in corridors and so on, there are many posters where they are when we are calling students for different kind of seminars and we try that the design of these posters is attractive. So yeah, people pay attention to them and there is a higher chance that they will join. This is also shared online, but we put them uh, on, the, on the walls because, okay, I didn't say, I don't know how it will be in your countries, but here, in this university, at least this year, uh, this course, this academic year was 100% uh, uh, present um, on site. So uh, as before COVID. Okay, and here we also have another initiative that this was a competition uh, for, okay, we, in this school, we also have people that are studying uh, design. So it's not difficult to find people that have artistic skills. So the idea was to yeah, engage students to draw something that could be used as a nice um, poster. This was the winner. Uh, Eina is the name of the school and it's written a uh, sustainable school. So there was a competition, as you can see, the prices are rather small, <laughs> but still uh, some students participated and later the winner besides getting the money has their design printed and can see it all over the, all over the place in big, in big sizes in different places. So it's also a way to yeah, make publicity and try to engage students. And it definitely doesn't cost almost anything to the, to the university. Uh, we are also trying to keep up uh, on social media. Uh, this is the general uh, Instagram website of a uh, page of the school. And I would like to call your attention that this is a random print screen. And there are two, no, three out of six posts have something to do with these sustainable development goals. So it's, we are really trying to push it and to make it popular. Uh, okay, here there is an example of a post. There was a collaboration with a school, so we, we put that there. And this is the library who, uh, which has a different uh, Instagram account. And they uh, every week they do, not every week, sorry, every month, they have this uh, blackboard outside the library and they dedicate a thought uh, for one of the sustainable development goals. So this is also a nice idea and it's not very difficult to implement. Okay, also we have a daily newsletter, but this is general. This is not only from our school. This is for the whole university. Uh, what I would like to call your attention to is that every single thing that appears, no matter what it is, it has this small picture that represents how this action is somehow related to these uh, sustainable development goals. If the, some action for whatever reason has nothing to do with any of the, of the, of the goals, so it's, there's no picture and, and that's it. Okay, so that's on publicity. Let's uh, a selection of some yeah, actions that we are doing to try to make this thing more popular. Uh, also, um, I'm coming back to the to the school, and I thought this was worth uh, mentioning that to really somehow force uh, all professors to get engaged with this. Uh, sustainable development goals, uh, all of us, we were asked to modify our syllabus, no matter what is the subject that you are teaching. Uh, okay, the syllabus is this official information that you give to the students where it's written what materials are going to be covered in the, in the, in the, in the, in the course, uh, what do they need to do to pass the course, the books that they need to follow, this kind of basic information. So now there is an extra question, extra um, section where the professor needs to describe how this uh, subject uh, uh, correlates or relates with the sustainable development goals. In some subjects it's easier than in others. But the goal is to try to push for, let's say, examples that are of a yeah, sustainable nature when doing exercises and that kind of stuff. So physics are not going to change, but the context, we, we might play with that. Okay, and here we have two, two simple examples of the 
personnel of people from the university uh, with the society. So the first example is that we did um, a calling for a gathering all together and go to clean uh, the Ebro, which is a big river that passes through our city. So from time to time, cleaning the river banks is necessary. And this was done not only with the students. I mean, it was born here and most of the people that participated were students, but they were told that they could invite as many people as they wanted. So some brought their parents, friends from other places, people that are not. And we also make publicity in social media so anyone could join and without any kind of contact with the university. And this other uh, activity, this was online because this was when, yeah, last, last year. And there was a kind of workshop with children. We are trying to do that uh, on site right now, but in case there is some incompatibility or some difficulty, we do it uh, online. So these were uh, high school children no, yeah, how, uh, like 13, something something like this. Sorry, and some... Uh, so, two minutes left. Um, okay, so the second uh, part uh, of the presentation that is super short, is just a few slides. Uh, I would like to show you the opinions of the students. So a group of students was asked. This happened one year ago. Okay, so when everything was closed and we were giving classes mostly online and so on, so we asked them if they were familiar with the sustainable development goals. And as you can see, majority of them said that not really. And we made the same question with Agenda 2030. And we were a little bit surprised that they knew what Agenda 2030 was, but not the other way around. And we thought that it might be related because in the news, here it's very common that politicians mention Agenda 2030. We even have a ministry with that name. Uh, so that's why we thought that uh, making publicity could really change things. So that's why we started implementing all these, all these activities. Uh, we need to retake this test in a few weeks. And I hope it will be much more greener than, than it was last year. And we also asked them which SDGs are, in their opinion, more important. These are first year students. And they said that the most important one for them is uh, health. The silver goes for education. The third for poverty. And later, peace and gender equality. And when we ask them in which they consider they could collaborate more, maybe with their bachelor thesis or as a students, there was no surprise here. So they said industry, health, and affordable and clean energy. So that was it from my side. That's my presentation. And I will be happy to take any questions. And if you want to reach out, there you have my email. Thank you very much. It was very inspiring. I hope uh, everyone will contact you after this conference. And now we don't have time <laughs> for uh, asking questions, but you can reach Alejandra um, on via email or uh, via the chat uh, box. And now Marta Górska is with us. Are you Marta? Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, hi, Marta. I'm going to share the screen. Um, Great. We can see you, we can hear you. Okay. And we can see your screen. Okay. Uh, so my name is Marta Górska and I'm a student of human biology at uh, Wrocław University. And I would like to talk about uh, how lockdowns imp impact, uh, impacted our uh, lifestyle and diet. And uh, first of all, I would like to say why it's so important to acknowledge those changes. Well, uh, recent studies show that actually over 60% uh, more hospitalizations were um, registered because of uh, different kinds of eating disorders uh, during the lockdowns. So in those 60% more uh, hospitalized uh, people. There were not only adults, but also children aging from um, only 10 years old. And uh, bad eating habits 
may um, have an impact on the de development of those children and later on impact uh, their whole lives. So that's why we have to focus on the problem right now. Um, so I've done a deep dive uh, in research that was published between 2020 and 2022. Um, most of the research was uh, collected by um, online, uh, online surveys uh, from students, but also from older people and uh, adults with children. And uh, similar research was uh, done in Spain, Italy, India, and also in uh, countries of Asia. Um, all of those studies focused mainly on students' diets. And uh, here are some um, uh, results that they have uh, concluded. Uh, well, two styles of um, diet and lifestyle um, habits uh, were uh, emerged from those uh, studies. Uh, on one hand, we can see some pro-healthy habits and on the other hand, unhealthy habits. And each healthy habit actually has its equivalent. So for example, some people started ex exercising more, but on the other hand, some people lacked exercise because they couldn't go outside. Uh, some people got more sleeping hours and some less. Um, some people ate more snacks, some uh, didn't snack so much. It really was dependent on uh, the individual and there's no real patterns here. Um, um, also within the bad habits, uh, you can see uh, smoking and alcohol consumption was increased. Um, and many people starting, started eating uh, foods that were high in calories, but low in uh, nutritional value. And what did, why did those changes uh, happen? Well, first of all, everyone was affected in one way or another, and uh, everyone felt some kind of anxiety caused um, by the pandemic. But some people were affected more because maybe they had COVID themselves, maybe uh, their families were affected. Um, so there are many factors that uh, came into play, but also some uh, minor ones like um, boredom or uh, just cravings uh, for comfort. Um, and those are all uh, psychological factors. So. Uh, they have a relation with uh, our emotions and uh, mainly stress and anxiety uh, caused by the isolation. But there were also some economic factors that also were quite important because people started losing the jobs and because of that they had to buy uh, cheaper food basically so they couldn't afford uh, fresh food, fresh meat and had to um, just base their diets on uh, high calorie um, products. And another thing is, especially during the first months of um, the pandemic, when uh, we had to stay at home, we didn't have um, the uh, opportunity to go to uh, the shops as much. So we had to buy um, products that had a longer life uh, shelf life. So like pastas, um, maybe rice, uh, instant noodles, and all of those products are very high in calorie, but uh, they don't have any nutritional value at all. Um, and eating only this obviously made us gain weight. So um, this is... Uh, um, these are um, some factors that maybe uh, affected how people um, how people's diets changed. Basically, uh, women and um, people, uh, well, the population of the uh, Mediterranean basin uh, didn't was weren't affected as much. Um, their uh, habits did get worse, but not as much as, for example, students and uh, elders. Um, 
the um, important fact to acknowledge here is uh, how South Korea is um, in the favorable um, category. So this means that um, South Korea citizens um, weren't impacted basically at all. And the reason for this is um, their culture. Um, in South Korea, you are expected to be slim and fit all the time. Uh, it's kind of a um, peer pressure. And that's why um, Koreans weren't affected as much by uh, the diet changes during um, lockdowns. Uh, also, high income ho households and basically high income uh, countries weren't affected as much. And obviously, people who pre uh, COVID had uh, better. Um, habits. Um, people with pre-existing uh, obesity um, weren't aff were, were affected uh, much more. Uh, same with students and um, people living in uh, low and middle income countries and also households with children. So um, if um, there was only a woman, uh, she could focus on, her, on herself and her uh, habits got better. But when she had uh, children to take care of, um, all of the family's habits uh, got worse. Um, this is a typical student diet that was um, shown in most of the um, research. As you can see, the diet consists mostly of sugars and uh, the consumption of uh, car carbohydrates was just over the roof uh, during pandemic. Uh, students starting, started drinking way more energy drinks, especially, um, but also pastries and uh, fast food because, uh, well, as, well it, as it was mentioned before, fast food was um, just available, um, not like uh, fresh food that was kind of hard to buy. And it was also cheaper. So perfect for, for students. Um, the uh, intake of energy drinks, um, actually um, there was a switch in, the, um, in why uh, students drank energy drinks. Before the pandemic, it was to have energy to study. And during the pandemic, students um, drank energy drinks um, to um, stay awake at night. Uh, to maybe play games. Uh, this was uh, the result of uh, only one research, but uh, it was uh, it did show the, these results. Uh, and uh, why is this so important? Basically, eating sugar only gives you a, a temporary energy boost, and then you still feel hungry. So that's why uh, healthy meals should include a lot of protein because protein will make you feel full and uh, prevent you from overeating. Um, when students only base their, uh, their diet on sugars, they were constantly hungry and um, this resulted in weight gain. Um, again, why, do, why are those uh, research so important? Um, when you, weight gain, when you gain weight, uh, because of all of those factors mentioned before, uh, you might uh, gain diabetes, you may become obese. Um, there are also uh, risks of cancer uh, due to smoking or cardiovascular diseases. And all of these factors are um, mortality risks for uh, uh, risk factors for COVID-19. So basically, it's kind of like a round circle. You become obese because of COVID, and then you may um, not. You may struggle more when you actually catch COVID, and then when you do catch COVID and your uh, lungs don't function as well, uh, you also cannot exercise. You cannot lose the weight, and you know it's back to the obesity, and then more risks of illnesses. Um, there's also another circle that's um, hard to escape. This is the binging circle of eating uh, disorders. Um, eating disorders are emotional mostly, and uh, emotional binging um, makes us gain weight. Then the gain weight, uh, the weight 
uh, makes people feel ashamed. The shame makes us uh, want to avoid eating food, so we restrict ourselves. The restrictions cause uh, even more stress and struggle, and the, this um, forces us to eat even more, especially, especially um, sugar, because it may, uh, because of uh, um, uh, because well, sh chocolate makes us happy, basically. <laughs> um, so we binge on sugars, we gain more weight, then we, we are back to uh, counting calories, and then back to stress. It's a closed circle, and this is the uh, reason for eating disorders. Uh, and actually, uh, those positive um, habits that uh, were shown uh, previously, like um, exercising and uh, eating more healthy, they could actually be the reason for this circle to appear because um, excessive workouts and calorie counting uh, may seem positive at first, but then they lead to uh, obsessive uh, calorie counting and uh, this develops um, eating disorders. Thus, the increase in hospitalizations by 60%, which is just a massive amount of uh, uh, people hospitalized. Um, so what should we do next to prevent um, those circles of eating disorders? Um, the most important thing is to uh, control protein consumption and basically uh, reduce uh, the consumption of sugar. Um, because number one, uh, protein it makes us feel full, so uh, we won't binge as much. Uh, but another very uh, important matter, especially during the pandemic, is that protein uh, helps with uh, immunoglobin production and also antiviral activity. So um, that means it makes us, uh, it makes our immune immune system. Um, um, better during um, the pandemic, um, we are less likely to um, become ill. Um, and in terms of research, there should be um, longitudinal uh, research done because right now it was only um, it was only data collected from surveys um, sent out during the pandemic. We don't really know how it affected everyone uh, in the long run. And um, we don't know how it will affect uh, those children who already um, gained eating disorders. Uh, it is very important to help them and to make sure they uh, come out of those eating disorders. And uh, thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much, uh, Marta, especially for keeping in time. Uh, if Anyone has any questions to Marta, please contact Marta in the chat box. Um, uh, thank you very much, Marta. Is Victoria Kujawa with us from University of Gdańsk? Hello, yes. Hi, Victoria. I can see Hi. you. I can hear you. Please share your presentation with us. Okay, give me a while. I don't know why I can show my presentation. Okay, so maybe I'll do it this way. I hope it's okay. Is it visible now? Not yet. No, it's Hopefully not yet. Soon. Okay. Yeah, so first of all, try to open your presentation and then click the share button at the down of your screen. I got only sharing in Teams, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, in a Zoom window, you should have the green button on the bottom of your screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got it, but uh, I've got... Uh, 
when you click it, you, screen, you screen can one choose. One, yeah. You can uh, choose what wants you to share. Yeah, and now one. it's going, but yeah, it could be okay. by the whole. Perfect. Window. Yeah, it's <laughs> Thank working. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so maybe it will be better. I'm not sure if uh, you see only my presentation and all, or also um, my face, but I think that it will be great. Maybe. Okay, so the floor is yours, Victoria. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. I'm uh, Victoria Kujawa and I'm a fifth year neurobiopsychology student of University of Gdańsk. Um, and today I'd like to show you my research connected with the subject of procrastination, mainly focused on the meaning of stress coping strategies um, and decision making style uh, in the study of field. And in the beginning, I would like to tell you some words about um, what is procrastination. And uh, as you can see, um, I added two photos of Ferrari people who, in my opinion, they are the, the most known researchers in this field and also the best researchers. And they said that procrastination is typically defined as a voluntary delay of an individual's intended action towards some task, despite uh, for visible negative consequences and the potentially overall worse outcome. And uh, what's important in this, in this definition is that they underline three of the most important factors. I mean that uh, procrastination is a voluntary delay. Uh, what means that it's uh, someone has um, maybe some important explanation or more or less important explanation uh, for why is uh, is procrastinate uh, when we uh, can't um, tell about procrastination. And the second one is uh, intended action. Um, is a simply clearly defined um, as an action uh, which is delayed. And the last one, um, overall uh, was outcome. I mean the awareness of the negative consequences of uh, not starting the action at the most optimal, yeah, most optimal, the best time. Okay, and uh, now some words about um, stress coping strategies and decision making styles. So stress coping strategies are the action taken by individual when a stressful situation occurs uh, or um, during the hard situation. And uh, there may be differences depending on situation and depending on context. Um, let's start from active coping. Uh, active coping is taking action to reduce or, if it possible, to, to totally remove stressful. Uh, the helplessness uh, is given up on um, efforts to, or blaming um, blaming oneself, and also um, it's sometimes connected with drinking alcohol or um, uh, or using um, other psychoactive um, substances. Uh, the use of support is uh, seeking help or um, understanding to other people. Um, avoidance is doing other things, uh, not the things that uh, we, we should do in the moment. Um, acceptance is uh, means understanding the situation is um, irreversible. Uh, the next one, humor, is sense of humor uh, as a way to um, to cope with uh, with hard situations. And the last one, religion, is turning to faith. Um, uh, yeah, as a, a coping strategy. Um, and uh, now I want to tell you about decision making styles. Um, and um, we've got five decision making style in, in this theory. Uh, so rational decision making is uh, characterized by, in, by, for individuals who, um, who tends to be comprehensive in their explanation. And they could also do a um, detailed analysis of uh, all possible alternatives. Um, individuals with an uh, avoidance style usually try to postpone decision, uh, or also, if it's possible, uh, they try to not be obligated to do um, any decision. Um, dependent um, decision making style is uh, characterized for. Um, seek advice and, um, and prompting also from others. 
Um, the next one, intuitive uh, style is characterized for individuals who, um, who rely mainly on their feelings and their emotions. Uh, and the last one, spontaneous, um, is connected with people for whom um, it's important to finalize the decision making um, as soon as it possible. Okay, and the aim of the study um, was to determine if an individual's procrastination tendency is related to the stress coping strategies or decision-making style they exhibit. Um, I formulate uh, the hypothesis. Um, there are differences in procrastination propensity in people of a different gender. Uh, the second one, there are differences in procrastination tendencies among individuals of different ages. There are differences in procrastination tendencies among people with different stress coping strategies, and there are differences in procrastination tendencies among people with different decision making strategies. Okay, as a uh, research tools, I used um, three tools. The first one is a procrastination questionnaire, is a Polish tool which contain a uh, five subscale of procrastination uh, by uh, Jaworska Gruszczyńska. Uh, the second one is a mini cope uh, known as well as brief cope. It's 20 it's, uh, 28 items questionnaire uh, with 14 coping strategies, uh, but, the, but the coping strategies could be uh, divided for seven strategies about which I told you in the beginning. Um, and the last one, uh, general decision-making style, um, a term which uh, of these five uh, decision-making style is, is the most related to individuals. Mm, the respondent group were 109. Uh, in the group were 53% um, uh, of, um, of women and uh, the average age uh, was about uh, 37 years old. And uh, yeah. Uh, I also divided um, the respondents group for two, um, two, two groups with a higher and a lower tendency to procrastination uh, to obtain my results. Um, and uh, results uh, connected with the first and second hypothesis show that, um, that gender is not a variable that differ group with a lower and higher tendency to procrastination, uh, but uh, education and also, um, also age, uh, they are. Um, to uh, next hypothesis, I did a, um, at first human Whitney test to show um, which coping strategies um, are other um, in these two groups. And as you can see, active coping and helplessness um, are these two uh, strategies uh, which are other. Um, and later I did a correlation uh, analysis between um, subscales of procrastination and stress coping strategies. Uh, and uh, as you can see, results are quite same as per previous uh, because uh, we can see also some correlation between um, procrastination factor as um, the general procrastination factor yeah, and organization of time and regularity of work uh, and also a willpower, yeah, these two subscales. And um, um, yeah and with, uh, also with uh, avoidant uh, stress coping strategies and unpunctuality. Um, and I checked my uh, hypothesis number four as the same uh, way um, as hypothesis number three. Um, and uh, as you can see, this group differs um, on three, four, five um, decision-making styles, uh, avoidant, spontaneous, and rational. And uh, what's interesting, um, uh, in spontaneous um, decision-making style, there's no difference uh, between um, any um, subscale of procrastination style, uh, but uh, despite differ differences in, in this group, uh, but uh, evident and rational um, uh, decision-making style are correlated with, uh, with most on uh, subscales. Um, in the end, I did a regression analysis, analysis which shows um, the first step that age is, um, is a predictor of the procrastination 
expository um, 17 and a half percent uh, of the tendency. Uh, so uh, in the next step, I decided to add uh, avoidant decision-making style. And as you can see, this uh, two predictors uh, shows uh, more than 32% uh, of, um, of uh, tendency to procrastination. Um, and the last uh, step, uh, I added also uh, some uh, coping strategies, uh, which uh, correlated to, um, to, to some uh, procrastination scales, but also um, uh, they were shown in literature as probab prob probably connected uh, with procrastination. Um, but as, as you can see, only one uh, active coping, active, active stress coping strategy uh, is a strategy uh, which is important in this model. And the final model consult 41.7% uh, of procrastination pr uh, propensity. So I think that it's, uh, that it's a good result. Um, and conclusion, um, result uh, shows that gender is not a variable which differ, differentifies uh, groups with a lower and higher tendency to procrastination, uh, but education and age they are. Also individuals with higher procrastination propensities compared to those with lower, uh, differed in two uh, coping strategies, active coping and helplessness, and they are also more avoidant, spontaneous and less rational in decision making styles. Um, and yeah, what's next? Um, I think that's really uh, important could be um, do um, some uh, some research connected with uh, with line pain uh, procrastination tendency and uh, also maybe stress coping styles uh, because as we know style could be uh, persistent for life and i think that it uh, could be also uh, interested in this subject uh, here we are the bibliography and at the end thank you for attention and here's my email so if you have any question please send me them Thank you very much, Victoria, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, uh, you can contact Victoria via uh, chat box or via email that you can see uh, at the presentation. Um, so we are running out of time. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, uh, for this session. And Stephen, I can see you, so you want to... Um, yes, say thank, about thank you. Break. Thank you, thank you very much, Grażyna, for sharing the session. Thanks to all the speakers. Uh, it's 12.23. We maybe should have like four minute break so that we do not lose too much time and then start at 12.27, the next session, which I will chair uh, due to the fact that our colleague from Italy, Luca Ferrero, is not well today. And so all the best to Luca and I will see you at 1227 and we'll start the session pretty much of the uh, IMP, Polish Academy of Sciences. So please come, uh, let's rejoin at 1227. Okay, so I suppose we're ready to start the, the next session. Um, do we have uh, Sultan Ahmad with us to present. Uh, uh, yes, okay, super. So Sultan, the floor is yours, 15 minutes. Please stick to the time. I will, if something is going wrong, I will, I will start making some, some noises and, and, and remarks. Uh, no like can you, can you see any? Two minutes to the end. Can yes. you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, I start my presentation. Perfect. My name is Sultan Ahmed. I am from the Institute of Fluid Flow Machinery, Police Academy of Sciences. And my research topic is uh, of presentation is uh, sensing comparison of PZT and FBZ sensor for the structure health monitoring. So first of all, I would like to go to first slide. Yeah, structure health monitoring. First of all, I would like to tell you about the structure health monitoring. What is the structure health monitoring? So, structure health monitoring. Structure, all structures such as aeronautical, mechanical, and civil infrastructures have a finite life 
span and are liable to structural defects such, such as corrosion, fatigue wear, and declamation ETC. As you can see in the slide, crack in the bridge and damages in the wind turbine. Uh, are you able to see my slides? Uh, all is good. Yeah, yeah. So as you can see, there's crack in bridge, damages in wind turbine, and in the next slide, the damage in aircraft. So these are structural defects, and there is a need to monitor the structural defects. So structure health monitoring helps in reducing maintenance cost, avoiding structural failure, and here is a process fellow how structure health monitoring is conducted. So as you can see, there is a tall building. All, all these required sensors are installed in this building. There is a sensor network. After this, it go to data processing and analysis. After that, data is processed, the report are generated, and SHM database is ready. In the further next slides, I will explain how this all things works. So in the next slide, structure health monitoring can be performed by various parameters of structures like the vibration present in the structure, guided wave propagations, electromechanical impedance, strain, ETC. Currently, one of the SHM technique is continuously being improved is based on the guided wave, or we can say guided waves are just an less elastic waves. So it is based on elastic wave propagation. So Here's a figure which show how the elastic wave propagates or what is the propagation notation of elastic waves. In the next slide, there, there is a more clear demonstration of elastic waves in form of velocity, group velocity and phase velocity. So the, among various, various type of elastic waves, there are limb waves. These are basically the guided waves or say elastic waves which pro propagate in the plates or cells. So in order to make an SHM or say structural health monitoring, we need to analyze the mode presented in the uh, guided wave. So as you can see in the figure, there are two types of modes, symmetric modes and anti-symmetric modes. So detecting these modes and after that, uh, making a mode separation, we can detect the damage present in the structures. Like this. This is the dispersion curve for aluminum seed. Similarly, other dispersion curves for other structures are also presented. So in the further sl slide, I will explain how to, how to make mode separations or correlate this knowledge with this graph. For 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 analyzing the waves, before, sorry, before analyzing the wave, we have to collect the data in form of waves. So how to how to collect the data? We need sensors to collect the data from the structures. Like first of all, we would like to explain the piezoelectric sensors. Secondly, it's a fiber break grading sensor. Is it based on optical light? And the third one is accelerometers. It's MEMS accelerometer. So PJT is transducer. As you can see that it's a PJT transducer and it is connected with metallic wire. So these are low cost and uh, low cost and no, low weight, but are prone to the electromagnetic inductance. So they produce noise in the signals. So to overcome this issue, we use uh, optical fiber. In optical fiber, there is a passage of light. So there is no like EMF production and no noise of EMF. For this project, we have made an aluminum, we have made the project using an aluminum plate. And as you can see in the figure, there's an aluminum plate. There are two PZTs and two FBGs uh, placed on this plate. And in the middle of the plate, uh, there is a PZT equator, which equates and generates the waves. After that, waves are just sensed by these four sensors. Come to the next slide. This, this, uh, this is the experimental setup, how the 
uh, sensors was connected and how the data was performed like fbg present in plate pzt photo di di detectors etc it's a symmetric diagram how the experiment was so sorry experimental devices was connected to each other here are the initial results so we have collected the waveforms in in a software and after that we plotted that waveform so it is for first case when there was one fbg at top and one pjt at bottom so as you can see the this is a waveform of both fbgs so in the first first slide you can see that wave peak are in phase so there is high possibility they are symmetric mode similarly in second there are out of phase so it may be anti symmetric it is for uh, one pjt and one fbg similarly it is a process how i made a signal processing so i wrote the program there was a waveform obtained uh, and the peaks were also denoted as you can see by the dotted by red by comparing the actual dispersion curve we can calculate the velocity we, we can compare the velocity and find out the modes uh, as you can see in the next slide in the next slide we can we can confirmly say that it is s0 mode and uh, next further is a0 so calculating the velocity is in computer we can compare with a, that s0 as you can see in the next figure s0 and a0 so we can detect the s0 and a0 and compare uh, uh, compare the mode separation methodologies using both fbgs and both pzts because my project is related to, to the comparison of these sensors so finally i would like to say that experimental setup was developed and validated validated primary result related to experiment related to measurement was performed using fbc and pzt sensors there were some difference be, between the generators generated signals by pjt and fbg so further higher high studies is required for completing the research and using the fpg on top and bottom of the plate it was possible to separate the symmetric and anti symmetric modes and it will help in uh, detecting the damages present and we will also study how what is the <coughs> functionality of pjt and fbg because both has there are different advantage one pzt is cheaper while fbg is uh, very costly but fbg don't have any kind of uh, electromagnetic source as noise so the signal in fbg is much good <clears throat> so finally i would like to thank to thanks to, to the ncn project this uh, research work is under uh, the opus ncn project and the title of project is study of elastic wave mode sensing thank you thank you for the presentation thank you very much do we have any questions or comments on this presentation would somebody like to okay joachim go ahead Here we go. Um, I was wondering in your tests, when you do that on that plate, does the position um, of the sensors on the plate matter? So does it make a difference if it's at the edge of the plate or in the middle of the plate? Because surely the plate will exib exhibit um, oscillations of its own. Okay. You mean to say the position of sensors? Yeah. Make any, many, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it definitely makes sense that if you place the sensor at the required distances, we have, H, we have already calculated the distance between the equators and the sensors, and each and every distance was already calculated. It was a standard aluminum plate. All right, thank you. Yeah, so each and every sensor is on exact, exact position. If there is a small displacement, it will make a huge, huge, uh, huge difference in the numerical calculation of modes. I see. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Anyone else would like to comment or ask a question? As, as a person who flies, I was a little bit uh, disturbed by the picture of the airplane. 
I hope it doesn't happen very often. What? Uh, the airplane yeah. that was that was a little bit destroyed in your picture. I hope it doesn't yeah, happen yeah, yeah. very often. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I don't see any more comments or questions. Thank you very much, Sultan. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Do we have Damian with us, uh, also from uh, IMP Polish Academy of Sciences? That should be. Yes, I am present. Good. Okay. Good afternoon. So please step in, and the floor is yours. Fifteen minutes. Okay, just one moment. I will try to launch the presentation because I had some problems with microphone. Okay, but now so I. So just one you. minute maximum. Uh, <clears throat> We're okay with time, so. Okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, so the previous participant should close uh, the remote screen because uh, I can. Yes, that's correct. Uh, Sultan, could you please stop sharing your screen? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Set. Is it Perfect. visible now? Yes, all set. Okay. So the topic of my today's presentation is analysis of elastic waves propagation in thin walled structures. My name is Damian Mindykowski, and as my previous colleague, I'm attending. Uh, the Polish Academy of Science Institute of Fluid and Flow Machinery. My supervisor is uh, Dr. Tomasz Wandowski and uh, my presentation is a kind of continuation from the previous year uh, presentation of my, of my work. So the outline I will try to depict at the beginning. So aims of the research and motivation, uh, later some brief information about the topic I'm involved in uh, then uh, a reminder from the previous pre presentation I just aforementioned. Uh, next, I will tell you words about considered specimens. I will depict some results of signal processing uh, I did during the research. Uh, I will try to depict and characterize different types of measurements we are performing here in the department and some main conclusions in the end. So, uh, some text now. Uh, primary aim of our investigation is, of course, analysis of elastic waves propagation in solid structures uh, as the one of non-destructive testing methods, because we have different methods and we are focusing in the department on the method referred to the elastic waves propagation. Additional aims of our research is to generate these waves we analyze efficiently, so with the possible highest amplitudes. Uh, besides, um, we would like uh, to uh, perform analysis of elastic waves in such a way to detect different defects efficiently. So to detect them in terms of, say, of shape, size and uh, location in the specimen. Uh, the motivation is uh, the issue uh, that is the thesis that there exist optimal values of the ACT slope angles which ensure efficient generation of desired lamp wave modes. As uh, my research is focused on non-contact elastic waves generation to adjust this uh, transducer which generates the waves uh, properly, uh, the proper uh, adjustment of this transducer results in efficient generation of waves. So some main uh, information I will try to be fast. <clears throat> As I aforementioned, uh, non-destructive testing uh, methods can be different. We are focusing in the department on guided waves-based methods. Um, advantages of the methods we focus on is that uh, it allows for fast inspection of relatively big areas. It has non-destructive nature, of course. It's a relatively cheap method, although it depends on the used equipment, and uh, it ensures inspection of the whole structure. Main areas 
of the applications of the NDT, including uh, the method with guided waves, are depicted on the current slide. So elastic waves we generate in the plate are now schematically visible on the slide. Uh, these types, of, the main types of waves we, gonna, we generate are um, zero order wave modes, uh, so anti-symmetric mode and symmetric mode. Uh, these are uh, basic elastic waves we generate in the specimens. And as I mentioned, the important factor influencing efficient generation of elastic waves is the optimal slope angle of the transducer marked inside the red circle. Now we can see the transducer we use in the research. So this is the transducer which generates elastic waves. Uh, on the left side, this one we use. On the right side, uh, there are professional commercial air coupled transducer, although the price differ maybe 100 times. So uh, it's uh, we are currently focusing on the research related to cheap transducers to use them later in the maybe even in the in the industry uh, so uh, yeah that would be the advantage uh, to lower the cost of the used equipment <clears throat> uh, you can also see different factors influencing efficient generation because of the waves because i mentioned about the slope angle of ict but it, but it, as you can notice there are much more factors influencing this efficient generation of waves. Reminder, short reminder about the previous uh, year presentation. So I depicted there are different NDT methods, different approaches, uh, although I focused on the method we are, uh, my research is related to me, so elastic waves based methods. Uh, I also depicted my everyday scope, which equipment we use, which software, which method, and some example results as I will depict also today. <clears throat> Considered specimens, so we are focusing uh, especially on aluminium material and composite materials. Uh, so uh, one can notice carbon fiber reinforced polymer plate, glass fiber reinforced polymer plate. So the main difference between these two materials is that uh, the base material of the plate is different because uh, on the left it's carbon, on the right it's glass and uh, aluminum we also are focusing on. Usually the structures are thin, maybe one millimeter, two millimeters, sometimes three or four. Um, okay, which softwares uh, one can use in case uh, of the elastic waves analysis? So one can use Comsol, ANSYS, MATLAB, Polytech Laser software. Uh, we also use it in the department, although we are, co we are focusing on uh, the measurements and signal processing of them in MATLAB. Uh, Comsol and ANSYS are the programs uh, re referred to numerical simulations, uh, purely num pure numerical simulations. Uh, so I also depicted on the slide the methodology, how we do that in experimental way and how we do that in numerical way. Mm. Okay, so now a few, uh, few types of measurements we are doing in the lab. Uh, and uh, which I uh, had to do in frame of my work. So pointwise measurements, we are measuring it, uh, we are using the laser vibrometer to measure uh, signal amplitudes in one, in just one point. And later uh, f we can compare the results uh, with uh, assumption uh, of any factor as a variable. So on the left side, we assumed slope angle as the variable on the right side, we assumed the frequency of excitation of elastic waves as the variable. And uh, one can notice uh, some maximum values, some maximum peak points in both graphs. And uh, later it is useful for further analysis of elastic waves. Along line measurements, it's a second type of the measurements. So uh, 
we are using laser vibrometer to detect elastic waves uh, in non-contact manner and uh, this laser uh, just goes through the specimen uh, surface uh, along line so uh, one can one have to uh, one have to define measure the measurement line in the software and then the laser goes uh, along this line and gather data in each measurement point uh, if you set the mesh of points properly and uh, then the results are depicted on the current slide different results so some uh, rms energy so it's a kind of uh, it's a way to calculate the elastic waves energy in each measurement point so one can notice that in the middle of the measurement line because we have over 120 measurement points and near the middle of the measurement line we have maximum value of energy of waves and it is caused due to the by the fact that the transducer we used to generate elastic waves uh, is located somewhere in the middle of the measurement line uh, okay and full wave field measurements the most attractive i can say results and uh, now uh, we can just see we can observe how the elastic waves propagate of course uh, these elastic waves visible on the current slide are after are after signal processing and uh, do, thanks to the propagation of these waves we can find the defects uh, in the specimen so on the left side mass type defects uh, were detected and on the right side uh, the lamination type defects uh, however they were uh, simulated by thin teflon film inserts um, they were detected in glass fiber reinforced polymer plate uh, so of course uh, the clearance and visibility of defects uh, strongly depends on the on the algorithm uh, assumed during signal processing so we have different algorithm and if the algorithm is more advanced it usually results in the better visibility of defects okay and now i have i would like to present some full wave field measurement results so these are animations sloped act so the transistor is sloped uh, mass type defects detection in CFRP plate. So that will be detection on the defects you see on the left side. Uh, yes, and we will try to see how it looks like. So the waves are, are flowing out from the middle area of the structure. We see that we have sloped ACT because it generates waves on the left side in the left direction only. And we can observe some uh, some uh, mass type defects here just uh, just as a uh, holes uh, in the, in these free areas so it's visible okay and the second animation is related to the usage of four ACTs based uh, array because on the left side we used only one ICT this time we use four ICTs in glass fiber reinforced polymer plate and what it what happens you see for acts each one aimed in different direction in direction of corners actually but uh, we cannot find the defects because the lamination type defects were somewhere here 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 and here do you see my uh, cursor of mouse do you see my computer mouse? Yes, we do. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll take this opportunity to tell you that you have just two minutes. Okay, no problem. I'm going to the end. So we cannot detect the defects using this array because these ACTs are aimed in direction of the plate corners. And we had defects in different regions. So uh, the usage of more ACTs than one does not always mean more effective defects detection. Okay, so summary in the end. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, uh, higher amount of ACTs does not may mean 
more accurate defect detection it's important uh, although if you use more acts than one you have usually stronger elastic waves but still it doesn't mean this more accurate detection uh, Okay, the usage of cheap ACTs instead of expensive commercial ACTs can be very useful because it can lower the cost of the equipment needed to perform this NDT process. And that's the main uh, advantage, one of the main advantages of NDT equipment uh, for uh, in an in industry for any director who wants to buy such equipment for his company or for her company. Uh, Yes, accurate and specific adjustment of the ACT has great impact on further defects detection ability. So if you adjust ACT properly, then you can uh, achieve uh, different results. Uh, okay, proper signal processing can ensure, can ensure uh, accurate defects detection uh, in terms of their locations, shapes and, and dimensions. And uh, of course, each manner of measurements may lead to different to get different information about lamp waves propagation. So each measurement has different aims. Some references. And thank you for the attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And if you have any questions, you can mail me uh, to the address placed in the right uh, lower corner of the slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I strongly recommend contacting Damien through this uh, email address. And we'll switch to another presentation uh, also from the Institute of uh, Fluid Flow Machinery uh, by Sara Sarbas. Do we have Sara with us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Oh, so uh, let me share the presentation. Sure. Just a second, please. Sure, no problem. All good. So is it clear? Yep. All good. So Hello everyone, my name is uh, Sara Sarvos. I'm from IMP Fan Institute. Uh, my project is a uh, reference-free damage detection based on instantaneous baseline using FPG sensors. Uh, my supervisor is Dr. Tomak Bendowski and the project coordinator is Dr. So uh, Suma. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my project and uh, why guided wave Sorry, let's go this, this way. Um, guided wave based uh, structural health monitoring is a good choice for damage detection uh, and also um, uh, actuators and sensors which are using SHM. And why uh, FVG sensors are the good choice for uh, FVG, um, for damage detections and uh, um, why do we mean uh, what do we mean by reference free damage detection and why it is important in SHM industry and at the end i'm going to explain an uh, experiment which has been done uh, so far uh, in our laboratory um uh, first of all, uh, my project uh, focuses on reference-free damage detection using guided wave uh, with uh, FVG sensors. Uh, Baseline-free approaches uh, detect the features and the damages due to the existence of, um, uh, with the presence of the damages and uh, with by uh, processing the signals. Uh, it means that we don't need to base uh, uh, to rely on the uh, uh, data from the healthier structure, uh, which uh, uh, helps us to detect damages without having any information from the healthier structure, without having any database from that, uh, which also help us to use the damage detection under different ambient conditions. And also we can use the same uh, approach for different uh, structures. 
Um, among uh, there are different uh, uh, techniques and approaches for SHM, but the, uh, among uh, those uh, SHM techniques, uh, guided web is the most promising, uh, promising one, and uh, they um, all these uh, approaches leads to uh, reduce the cost of the maintenancing and also uh, improves the reliability of the structure. So there is a huge demand for uh, improving SHM techniques. Uh, as I told you, the best, um, um, one of the best uh, techniques for uh, SHM uh, is guided web, but it has its own drawbacks. Uh, the problem with using the guided web is that it has high alternation. Uh, especially when you want to use them in uh, isentropy material and composites. So uh, we cannot use them very well, uh, but there are uh, some possible solutions. Uh, one of them is the, to add uh, extra weight, uh, sorry, to use more uh, number of sensors, which leads to add extra weight to the system, which is not pleasant for us. Uh, the other uh, possible solution could be using um, more number of sensors on the same plate, uh, multiplex of the sensors, but uh, uh, FPG sensors or fiber optic sensors uh, have low sensitivity, which, uh, has a, which is a challenge for researchers to uh, overcome with. Uh, as I mentioned before, FEG sensors are uh, good sensors uh, and good choices for this, especially for this project, because, because it provides us with good advantages, such as uh, it has the ability to uh, multiplex, means that we can use more number of them at the same place, uh, same fabric. Uh, they are uh, not very uh, heavy. They are they are uh, lighter than the other sensors and also uh, due to the small size of them we can embed them uh, embed them into the structure uh, but uh, as i mentioned it has a low sensitivity which is not a uh, problem after uh, uh, application of edge filtering approach uh, by uh, edge filtering approach we can uh, increase the sensitivity of these sensors as it is uh, it, uh, you can see you can see well in this uh, figure uh, when uh, in this uh, mention in the strain uh, area if you have if you shift the lambda very tiny uh, we can see it uh, leads to a, a huge uh, increase in the uh, sensitivity um, overall we can um, classify a reference-free damage detection with two approaches, uh, baseline-free and instantaneous baseline. Uh, actually, uh, one of the most uh, common and baseline-free approach uh, is uh, ultra uh, nonlinear ultrasonic uh, damage detection, uh, which uh, in this approach, and uh, any nonlinearity in the signal is considered as a damage. But uh, a steel uh, localization and mapping the uh, damage is a, a problem. But uh, let's focus on uh, instantaneous baseline approach. Uh, what do we mean by this approach? It means that uh, uh, with the, uh, we actually uh, set some the dam um, sensors, uh, actuators and sensors, and by comparing the signals obtained from each pairs of uh, pitch and cache sensors, we can determine the instantaneous baseline free. If you look at this uh, figure, we have three groups of pitch and cache uh, sensors. Uh, as it is shown, uh, on the path of A5 and A6, uh, there is a damage. Uh, but uh, the other groups, A1 and A2 and A3 and A4, there is no damage. Uh, by obtaining the signals from uh, these uh, sensors, we can see that the both signals uh, obtained from the, the, the first two groups are aligned, but the third one is different. So we can uh, determine uh, the first, uh, this signal as the instant instantaneous baseline, and it will be 
our baseline. And then uh, for other uh, side of the play, when we uh, uh, obtain the signals uh, and we compare it with this baseline, we can see if there is any uh, damage or defect. In this case, we can uh, detect the damage. Uh, as I told you, the, there was an experiment which has been done in our laboratory. Uh, if we used a, a plate and we uh, uh, actually curated two different damage scenarios, uh, D1 and D2. Uh, actually, in this uh, experiment, we use the circular pattern for the actuators and we group the actuators uh, uh, into a six group actually we use 12 actuators uh, so, uh, local, uh, located in the circular uh, circular way and with the center of an FPG sensor uh, by uh, comparing the sorry Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know what happened to what has happened to my uh, presentation. The, uh, we can the last, it, but the last. Uh, sorry, the last slides are not visible. I don't know that they are deleted or something happened to it. No, we can see them, but not in the presentation mode. Um, but so otherwise, we can see them. So you can continue. Just a second. At the moment, you are on slide nine, and instantaneous baseline. Uh, yes, see, I see. Uh, in, um, the other slides are not in my uh, actually here. I don't know what has happened to that. It should have been uh, uh, fifteen slides, but right now it's ten oh, slides. Oh, I that's, see. That's the problem I have. Uh, uh, just I don't know what to do. <laughs> what uh, happened? Well, maybe you can you can give us a. An uh, I, I can. Uh, yeah, I, I I just wanted to show that uh, after uh, actually we uh, obtained the signals from these uh, actuators after uh, comparing them for the damage uh, scenario, the first damage scenario, as we expected, because if you uh, uh, look at the, you can see there is no damage uh, through the path of A1 and A7. So both the uh, signals were uh, completely aligned, but uh, for the other pairs, uh, for <clears throat> uh, A6 uh, and uh, A4, for example, sorry, uh, A6 and A12, there was a, a huge uh, differences between the signals, so it can show us that <clears throat> uh, there is a damage in through this path. Uh, and I wanted to tell you that uh, the next step of, uh, for this project will be to uh, localizing this damage by using a uh, different methodology. Uh, there are different methodology that we can use. Uh, the one that uh, I'm going to uh, use in the future is a uh, cosine distance. By calculating the cosine distance uh, of these elements, we can uh, mapping and uh, we can localize the damage. Uh, sorry that uh, this happened through my presentation and I couldn't show the other slides of my presentation. Uh, I hope uh -huh. you enjoy it. I'm so sorry. And no, I'm here to answer your questions. <laughs> I'm sorry for your technical problems, but you know, that's life. Things happen. So <laughs> don't worry about that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have any comments to this presentation or questions to Sarah? This is the moment. Uh, could you please stop sharing the screen? Yes, because sure. otherwise, I do not really see people and their potential reactions. Thank you very much. Do we have any comments, questions? Very good presentation, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damien. Nice, nice team support. <laughs> <laughs> but I fully agree. Very nice presentation. Yes. Um, OK, if we don't have any questions or comments, uh, then uh, I call the session to be completed. Uh, let's Thank you at 1.25. Thank you very much, Sarah.
Let's uh, rejoin at 1.25 for a short uh, uh, summary of the uh, poster presentations, and then we'll have a, another oral uh, presentation session. So thanks for, for now and see you at 1.25 again. Okay, good afternoon once again. It's me again. Um, I would like to summarize uh, the the, uh, the submissions, the poster submissions that we have for our conference. Uh, a total of eleven posters have been uh, placed on the Padlet. Uh, all of them are uh, either natural sciences or uh, hard sciences, um, uh, presenting disciplines of uh, natural and hard sciences. So. Uh, this is a, a rather uh, uh, homogenic, I would say, uh, set of uh, posters this year. Uh, they're all very interesting. They all have um, uh, discussed different different problems, actually problems, unfortunately problems um, uh, that the environment has um, with, in many cases, uh, anthropogenic uh, influence on the natural environment for example the the, uh, the mercury in the marine environment of the polar regions this is really one of the uh, sad stories that that we the humans are able to to produce uh, enough mercury that it's being transported via different processes all the way to the arctic or to the antarctica so uh, this is really uh, pretty bad, and it's very important to to uh, study. We have uh, small non-coding RNAs, molecules regulating the phage switch from lysogeny to lytic development, and it's viral lens. Uh, I don't know what that means, but I strongly recommend going to Padlet and, and looking at at um, uh, this poster and all of the posters, of course, uh, we have an important poster uh, uh, among all the important posters that uh, is dedicated to the improvement of our health through the proper diet that, that could be appealing to everyone. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, some clinical significance of circulating heat shock protein 90, once again, I have no clue what this is about, but this is, I looked through the, the poster and this is really a very interesting topic because we're talking about patients with atopic dermatitis and I'm afraid that uh, this is not uh, such a small scale of problems that, that uh, people have. Uh, we have the organic matter and its influence on the uh, pro delta of the Vistula River. Uh, we have the shipwreck of SS Stuttgart and the mercury. Once again, the mercury seems to be one of the hot topics in, in the posters this year. Uh, you may some some of you know for sure, but for those who don't know, the Baltic is uh, full of shipwrecks, and many of them are in near the Polish coast. And one of them, the SS Stuttgart, is um, uh, a huge. Uh, transportation uh, and um, uh, uh, transatlantic that that uh, that was sunk uh, at the end of the war and and is causing certain problems for for the environment. Um, I strongly recommend. I I can see that that uh, quite a few people have already gone through the posters and uh, voted and, and gave their opinions. I strongly recommend going to the Padlet. the The link is uh, provided at the conference website. And uh, please do comment on these. Please ask questions. Please give your opinions, vote, uh, this is really important for the for the authors of the projects and and the posters, but also for us when we when we want to evaluate them and and provide them the winners at the end of the day. So that would be all from me at this moment about the posters. Uh, would somebody like to comment on the posters here or ask some questions? Then we still have a few minutes. Please feel free to give your opinions. Okay. 
don't see anyone. Okay, so thank you very much. This is the summary of the poster session and we'll start the next session in five minutes then. And the session chair will be Marta Wojewódka Przybył from the Institute of um, uh, ING Polish Academy of Sciences and the GeoPlanet Consortium and Michel Nonis from NCAA Poland chapter. So in five minutes, we'll start the next session. Thank you very much. So I think we uh, could start and welcome again. And uh, Michael, together with Marta, we will chair this fourth session. And well, the first presentation is uh, it will be made by Regina Heber from the University of Dansk. And she will present uh, an analysis about the variability of concentration of uh, aerosols in the three city agglomeration. So Virginia, if you are with us, feel free to share the screen. Yes, hello. Um, I hope my screen is visible and uh, yes. you can hear me. Yep. Okay, so hello again. My name is Virginia Heppert and I'm an oceanography student at the University of Gdańsk. Um, I'm currently at second year of my first degree studies and today I want to talk about changes in quality of air throughout two decades in Tricity. Um, it's quite simple analysis, but still worth of our notice. And to begin with, um, I will introduce you to PM10 and PM2.5. Uh, its origin and chemical composition, also some properties. And then I'm gonna talk about how has how uh, how it did it change through the last two decades. So atmospheric aerosols are systems of solid or liquid particles in a gas suspended in the atmosphere. Um, they affect human health ecosystems and visibility. Depending on their size, we usually refer to them as particle matter, PM10 and PM2.5, known also as coarse particles and fine particles. Um, PM10 is particulate matter that's 10 micron or below. Same thing with PM2.5, which is 2.5 micron or below. So how small is that? PM10 is roughly five times smaller than the width of our hair. So we can just about see a hair and imagine something five times smaller. Pretty small, but still visible to the eye under some circumstances in form like dust, pollen, or mold. And these are only few. Uh, on this picture, actually, a big cloud of dust over the Bay of Bengal is visible. Um, speaking of the sources of particle matter, it mainly comes from combustion processes. Coal burning produces a lot of PM10, as do wildfires. In Poland, the main source is transport and transit. Um, a massive amount of particulate matter are produced by cars and trucks. Uh, also factories, manufacturing is another source. Um, pretty much anywhere we have human activity, we are generating PM10 and PM2.5. Others are natural sources like erosion of rock and soil, um, volcanic activity, seismic activity, lightning bolts and boggy areas, and wildland fires I've just mentioned. Speaking of chemical compositions of particulate matter, they show differences across Europe. On average, there is more uh, carbonaceous matter in PM10 in Central Europe, uh, just where Poland is. Pretty much main chemical components are sulfate ions, uh, nitrates, ammonium, hydrons, uh, also water as marine aerosols, organic matter, minerals, and metals. Substance, substance I just mentioned are volatile and pathogenic pollutants which permeate with other particulates to the, to the atmosphere. Uh, one would say that with wind is the main cause of particulate matter movement. Um, I want to mention pollutants such as benzoprene, heavy metals and nitrates. Uh, many of them are considered as cancerogenic by the World Health Organiza Organization. Uh, because of the substances found in the chemical composition of uh, particulate matter, 
uh, harmful to humans' health. Also, particles contribute to climate change. They contribute to changes in radiation transfer and cloud properties, differentiating conditions even on Earth's surface. Um, fine particles, known also as PM2.5, are the main cause of reduced visibility in cities. What's more, particles can be carried over long distances by wind and then settle on ground or water. And uh, depending on their chemical composition, the effects of this settling might include making lakes and streams acidic, um, damaging sensitive forests and farm crops, and affecting the diversity of ecosystems. Particulate matter can stain and damage stone and other materials, including um, culturally important objects such as statues and monuments. It's related to acid rain effect on materials. Um, and here, this picture shows a building from Warsaw and the uh, writing translates to clean air, clean Warsaw. Uh, it shows how smoke affects the buildings and what is important, our lungs also. So um, about effects on human health, the smaller the particles, the deeper they can go into our body, into our lungs, actually when they cause the most harm. Particulate matter enters the body through the nose and mouth when we breathe, and PM2.5 can penetrate uh, the deepest into the lungs. Um, and latest research shows that typical concentrations of particulate matter could be more hazardous than CO and CO2. From World Health Organization data, uh, some of the research from 2019 uh, showed that due to fine particulate matter, uh, there were about 300,000 of premature deaths. Um, groups which develop increased sensitivity include the aged, those with cardiorespiratory diseases, and those who are exposed to other toxic materials. When compared with healthy people, those with respiratory disorders such as asthma or allergy they may react more strongly to a given exposure as a result of increased responsiveness to a specific dose. Um, some information about the atmosphere where the particles are moving. Atmosphere is an enormous chemical reactor in which countless amounts of substances are continually moved. All processes occur in spatial and temporal scale. scale. Such pollutants are transported transported regionally over scales from about 100 to a few thousands of kilometers, large enough to cross even continental boundaries. Air pollution has both temporal effects on the short, medium, and long term, and also spatial effects, as it is mobile and can affect large areas. So now about the Aramic Foundation, um, from which I've gained data to my analysis. Um, from year 2020, the main system of RMAC Foundation has been operating with nine refer referential stations in different parts of three city agglomeration. Key, uh, key air pollutants are measured there in the same time with meteorological parameters. Long-time readings provide information about changeability and tendencies of pollution. I decided to not use the IM7 station marked in red because it's traffic station different from the others which are urban uh, background stations. So to begin with, I would like to stress uh, that permissible daily amount of PM10 concentration in one cubic meter is 50 micrograms and permissible amount of exceedances is five, uh, 35 days per year. 
and permissible annual amount of PM10 concentrations is 40 micrograms per cubic meter of air. Now, as for the main subject of my presentation, I decided to show how particle matter concentrations were changing through the last two decades in Tricity. The data I used comes from annual ARMEC Foundation reports from the oldest, um, and the oldest one is from 22 years ago. PM10 concentrations, there were pretty serious, near, near uh, permissible amounts uh, of annual concentration. Especially, it is visible at IM3 at IM8 stations. It is important to notice that the lowest concentration in the year 2000 were still bigger than the higher concentration in the year 2020. It is two micrograms per cubic meter of difference between them, but still worth of our notice. Easy to see concentrations of PM10 are getting smaller each decade. Actual concentrations are near 50% per percent of permissible annual amount. Um, what is more, I decided to show how it has been changing in each city, Gdańsk, Gdynia, and Sopot through the last three years. Um, three years, I mean from 2020 to 2018. Sadly, an annual report for 2021 hasn't showed yet. Um, so five stations in Gdańsk show us an actual change year by year. Concentrations are decreasing at most of the stations uh, by two to four micrograms per cubic meter per year. Same situation in Gdynia, but in case of AM4 station, concentration is at the same level for, for the last three years. Um, yesterday, I've checked the current situation station and PM10 concentration maintained between 20 and 30 micrograms, but last week it was nearly 10 micrograms, so um, it depends on the weather conditions, which were pretty diverse last days um, when the heavy rains occurred, cleaning the air from pollution. Continuing, similar in Sobot, Concentrations decreasing slowly every year. Now, as for PM2.5, as I mentioned earlier, it is more harm harmful than PM10. It can go deeper in our lungs, causing more harm. Because of that fact, maximum permissible limit is lower, being uh, 25 micrograms per year. Um, the limits were set by World Health Organization. Um, by now, only one station in Gdańsk measure PM 2.5 concentration, and it is station AM8, and it shows unsatisfying results um, because um, it is more than 50% of permissible amount. Heating season characterized with increased concentrations of PM in air what mostly contribute to higher PM concentrations in Poland is heating our homes with fossil fuels like coal and using old furnaces. It is the main source mentioned. However, a change is visible comparing again uh, AM3 and AM stations year 2020 and 2000. Um, emission of PM10 into the atmosphere seems to be lower each year. Uh, maximum for the year 2000 were 44.8 micrograms per cubic meter. Now it is 25.8, and still it is not what we what it should be, being nearly 50% of permissible amount. Uh, same situation in summer season. Uh, each year the concentrations of particulate matters are decreasing. Um, here, there is no additional emission from heating homes. Other factors have impact on these amounts, like factories. Um, and well, to sum up, the concentrations are slightly lower than they are in the heating season. Um, in the end, the EU, EU's ambient air quality directive set maximum values for the concentration levels of pollutants. When these maximum values are exceeded, the competent um, authorities must implement programs and measures to bring levels below them. 
These programs and measures can also be implemented even if our quality is considered good, either to maintain it, maintain it or to improve it further. And this is the last slide actually, but I guess I'm out of time. Yes, you are really short of time, so if you can yeah. sum up really quickly. Yeah, so to sum up quickly, um, particulate matter have an uh, immense impact on uh, climate changes, especially in the radiative forcing, which measures how much energy is coming from the sun compared to how much is living. Uh, it's an act of balance in the climate change process. Uh, also, the chemical composition of the atmosphere is changing even now. Uh, in conclusion, the more particles we release into the atmosphere, the greater the changes are going to be. Uh, worse are con air conditions will only lead to more premature deaths, and this is not what we want to achieve, I believe. Um, so air quality directives and programs should be implemented to improve our living conditions and national standards of the concentrations of suspended particulate matters. Um, well, we still have to observe how the climate is changing and to control the emissions. And that's all I've wanted to say. So thank you. And these are my references. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I said we, we don't have time for questions this time. But I really invite you to use the chat for asking questions to Regina explaining. And we can move to the second presentation. In this case, Marcin Mieszka from the Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Science, with a presentation about the challenges in dating old cratons with an example from Greenland. So Marcin, please share the screen. Hello, everybody. Um, OK. I wanted to show the screen. Let's choose the presentation. Good. Um, now, can you see the moving slides? Yes. OK, very well. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Marcin Mieszczak, and I am a PhD student at the Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. And today I will present you challenges of dating old cratons. Uh, on, as an example, it's going to be my field, uh, my um, study area in Greenland. Uh, this work is done within the frame of Project Pulse Together, missing link between Arctic and Antarctic early Earth record. And uh, this uh, project is aiming an in investigation of the oldest crust uh, on, on Earth. Uh, the, old, the oldest means uh, Joarchian, well, the is between 4 and 3.6 uh, billion years old. And uh, the study area is uh, Greenland, Labrador in Canada and the Napier complex in Antarctica. As I mentioned today, we are focusing on Greenland. So uh, let me show you the, the exact uh, geological map of uh, the island. And here in the inset, you may see the southern part of uh, Greenland with uh, North Atlantic Kraton and it's a nice. And let's uh, zoom a little bit more. And here in the northeastern part of it's nice, we find uh, East Asia terrain, which is the area of my focus. And uh, to the right, you may see uh, two marked uh, spots where the samples I'm going to show you uh, were collected. Uh, these samples are, let's look at the last digits, it's 25A and 26. So now if you we know uh, about what we are talking about, I'll tell you uh, why do we do so. Uh, so I will present you um, dating old cratons. What is uh, dating is generally part of geochronology. And uh, how do we uh, date the, the rock. Actually, we don't uh, date uh, entire rock, entire specimen, but in our work, we are focusing on dating uh, minerals, accessory minerals, in this uh, case, uh, zircons. So uh, we are starting with the uh, hand uh, specimen, which is like hand size, and we are uh, performing crushing, sieving, separating uh, 
magnetic minerals, later panning, and uh, from what the residue, uh, we are uh, separating zircons. And these are, we are mounting on the, on the mount, as uh, the picture on the side. If you will look carefully, you may see here uh, some brownish uh, dots. These are crystals of zircon. Uh, they are uh, smaller than 400 microns. And uh, why zircons, actually? Uh, so zircon is, um, is a mineral called by geologists a time capsule. Uh, because uh, of its um, very unusual um, properties. It's very resistant to uh, both chemical and physical weathering. And also in its structure, it contains isotopes of uranium, uh, but doesn't primarily doesn't contain any isotopes of lead. So when the crystal is closed, the uranium uh, radioactive decay starts, and we can easily uh, measure uh, how much of mother and daughter isotopes we do have, and on basis of it, we can measure its time. And uh, because of it, uh, this uh, mineral abundant in, I mean, it's still accessorical, but frequent in uh, gneisses uh, can be easily uh, measured and we can uh, obtain the data and the age of the, of the rock that we want to um, investigate. Mm, so now uh, let's uh, jump into the uh, main topic, uh, dating uh, old cratons. Uh, here you may see my first sample, 25A, which is tonality nice. And uh, let's look at the map, where is it? In the um, mount, we did uh, prepare around 150 grains but for the dating we have chosen 40 of them and we did choose uh, 54 spots to measure and uh, to measure the age mm, and here i'm showing you some um, pictures of the grains if you are not geologists you probably don't know what to look at and look what to look for in such grains but let me just tell you that this elongated uh, shape of the crystal a pretty uh, neat and tidy structure inside, lack of cracks, lack of inclusions or not many inclusions, like this one is inclusion or alteration, is a um, sign for us that the crystals are gonna be, um, there's gonna be a lot of space to choose to um, measure the, the age. And we have can see also on this uh, picture some oscillatory zoning, which is a characteristic of, of this uh, mineral. And uh, so these uh, grains gave us the results showed at this uh, graph. We may see that all the results the results are gathered in one um, one uh, cluster. They are pretty um, uh, all similar. Uh, obviously, after the interpretation, uh, we did uh, interpret them as some discord and disturb igneous. But the most important of it is that we did calculate the age of the protholith, so what means the primary rock, um, using um, many of the data we obtained. It was uh, out of 40, uh, 54, we did use uh, 47 measurements to calculate the age of the protholith of the rock, uh, what is uh, pretty impressive and you can't find such a good data in the literature in this area. Um, and well, and the age of the, of the rock sample was uh, established on uh, 3.7 uh, billion years. And now let me show you, oh, maybe one just uh, interesting feature. Uh, these circles are showing more or less the size of the spot that we are measuring in order to date the, the age of the zircon. And uh, here we may see the picture from the field uh, of uh, the second sample. Uh, in this case, we did choose 46 uh, grains and 59 spots to date. And this is the result that we've got. As uh, you may see, a clear difference between these uh, two samples. Uh, here we have uh, some spread in the obtained data. And uh, well, now we, I may ask question, why? And we're getting to the very point of this presentation to talk about challenges of 
dating all old uh, cratons. So let's look at the grains that we obtain the data from. Uh, and these uh, grains are uh, showing uh, how mostly grains of the sample look like. As you may see, they are need, not neat and tidy as in the previous sample. Uh, we see here uh, many cracks, uh, both uh, in the outside uh, parts of the grains, like uh, inside, there is many inclusions, these um, black rounded uh, shapes. There is some alteration, which is marked with the darker gray color, and also some recrystallization, very well visible here with this uh, white dot and also on this grain here. So all of these are the um, characteristics of the grains from the sample, which are making this more challenging to choose the zone to, to date the, the zircon. Also here, uh, we may see uh, the picture which is presenting where exactly the, the measurement was done. And uh, here, for instance, you may see that um, the spot more or less was uh, done on this uh, dark gray color. What is the alteration zone? What well, actually cannot give us proper and reliable aid. Uh, it's due to a uh, high content of uranium. What uh, is represented actually by this picture? It's a cathode luminescence picture, which um, shows the darker it is, the more uh, uranium uh, it contains. Also. Uh, we have some limitation by the machine. Uh, well, if the crystal is too small, it may happen that our measured, measured spot is gonna be outside of the grain and touching the, the epoxy, what we obviously don't want uh, neither because it will uh, give us uh, not uh, exact and proper reliable results. Or we do not want to um, measure the cracks, which are also the way to for lead to leave the structure of the crystal, what uh, finally leads to uh, some ambiguous data that we may obtain. Um, but uh, fortunately, even with uh, such a spread of data uh, and with uh, knowing uh, the field relationship and the history of the, the area that we are working, we can still make a use and use this data uh, to um, fill up some uh, bits of the history or geological history of the of the area. So as you may see on this graph, we did uh, here um, uh, interpret some of these results as modern day law, uh, lead loss or uh, other related to the lead loss uh, related to the metamorphism is event. Um, as a conclusion of this uh, short presentation, I uh, let me tell you that dating old cratons may be challenging. Uh, it's mostly due to high grade metamorphism, which is erasing primary original textures and, and structures, which can have an influence on the uh, minerals inside this rock. But with deep understanding of uh, field context, uh, we may uh, still use our uh, geological geochronological data and understand uh, the origin of the data and the reason why they look the way uh, we did obtain them. It is necessary to look carefully at the internal structure of dated grains uh, so we can understand uh, why some of them they are not reliable enough or whether they can be reliable. And on top of it, despite the complexity of uh, dating old cratons, we can still obtain the results which can help in understanding the entire geology of old cratons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, well, <clears throat> we have time for a couple of questions. If someone from the audience has, just feel free to write in the chat or raise your hand. Well, uh, I have like more a curiosity. How did you select the, uh, the areas where you sampled things? Well, um, if it's about choosing the area, uh, I was not in the field yet, so I'm, I'm having the samples uh, uh, by courtesy of my supervisors. Uh, but uh, generally, uh, if it's about Izukasia terrain, it's a very unique area on entire world. As old cratons, when we are talking about these Eoarchean cratons, they underwent several stages of high-grade metamorphism. High-grade, that means 
the pressure and temperature were high and high enough to partially melt a lot of structures and textures. So these rocks are actually very hard to, um, to, to investigate in order to understand and know what it was before the metamorphism. But Isocasia and its Acnice is famous for its low grade metamorphism. It's still metamorphosed, so we are talking about gneisses, not granites. But these uh, changes done by metamorphism are not that intense. So we can still see a lot of uh, from the textures from the original uh, rocks from the prothoids. Uh, so this is the main uh, reason why we are working on um, Isocasia terrain. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we can move to the uh, third presentation, which will be done by Tanmay Kalinskar from the Institute of Physics for the Parish Academy of Sciences, and he will present about the importance of magmatism in the uh, Labrador region. Tanmay, please. Uh, thank you, Michael. Can you hear me properly? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tanmay Kalinskar from. of geophysics. My super search, my co-author is Daniel Dunkley. Uh, this research is carried out in a frame of uh, uh, poles, together, uh, poles Together project. And today I'm going to talk about the importance of 3.3 billion years old magmatism in the Saglic block of Labrador coast situated in Canada. Let's start with the time period in which I'm working on. Understanding the origin and the evolution of our planet has been an interest of researchers for many decades. My research mainly focused on the Archean rocks. Scars and scattered rock records are present for the Archean period between 3 billion years till 2.5 billion years. It comprises 35% of total geological time. These are the targeted areas to study Earth's earliest crust and investigating the geochemical correlation between these rocks and their age will allow us to understand the early Earth crustal composition. Let's look how it is distributed. This map shows the distribution of Archean rocks in the world. We can see that Archean rocks are scattered and less extensive. My focus is on a sag -like block of a Labrador coast. Let's look closely how the Labrador coast looks geologically. So if we see the northern Labrador coast is well known for early Archean rocks. Though this area is potential for crustal studies or uh, early Earth, the extreme climatic condition and geological complexity make it harder to work in this area. High grade metamorphism in this area has obscured the earlier, earlier relationships and making the investigation more difficult. But as we always say, adversities are opportunities. I decided to work on this samples. I'm working on this Nain province. So this whole, uh, this whole Labrador coast is divided into a Saglic block and Hopadil block, which is separated by the Nen Plutonic, which is Proterozoic in age. If we see a geological map of the area, the Saglic block is located in the center part of the Archean Nen province. It is well exposed along the coast northward of the Nen province. Saglic block contains strongly deformed quartz of felspathic gneisses. Now your question might be, what's the quartzofelspathic gneisses? Quartzofelspathic is term given for the chemical composition. These rocks are rich in quartz and felspar mineral, which means they are more silicic in nature. And gneiss is term uh, dedicated for the rock, which undergo high pressure and high temperature, which means high metamorphism. So these are the quartzofelspathic gneissic rocks of igneous origin, which are named as uviac gneisses. These are juxtaposed and interlaved with the supracrustal rock. Uviac gneisses. So if you see in this map, this um, this skin colored area is nothing but the uviac gneisses. Uh, you can even see in a legion in this. But uviac gneisses are divided into two parts, two uh, parts, uviac one and uviac two. This division is based on the texture and the geochemistry of these two rocks. Uviac one is widespread in this area, while Uviac two is confined to a belt which passes from Medmond Nice, uh, Midmont Island, Menzel Island, and White Point. Uviac one is extensively studied with a good estimation of age and geochemistry, while Uviac two is 
less studied and there are not many good estimated ages and a petrogenesis for this type of rock. And therefore, I decided to date this rock and this talk will be more focused on Uviac 2 Nisus. Uviac 2 Nisus on this area are shown with a large red circles mapped by Ryan and Martini in 2000, 2012. My study area is shown in a red square written as a Menzel Island. So we will look more about it. First, let's see the summary of the uranium lead dating in this area. Why, you, why we use uranium lead zircon dating uh, for older crust? Uranium lead date gives you more proper estimation of the age with a, as less error it's possible. And zircon is a grain which, which can sustain high pressure, high temperature and still can give you a good age of the original protolith or a original igneous rock. And therefore, we are more reliable to look for the zircon ages and mostly uranium lead. So in this area, if you see, there is a large dating for the Uviac Nisus. There are people who divided it in a different groups, but there's extensive work has been done in Uviac Nice. But for Uviac 2, there's only two of publications, and, and there are a few more, but this is not much extensive. Uviac 2 is poorly known, and Savasinska et al. in 2019 revised the name of Uviac 2 as a Medmon Nice and estimated the age of Uviac 2 or Medmon Nice by her as 3.3 billion years old. Previous study doesn't give any good estimation, but there are some records which state that Uviac 2 is 3.6. And why these ages matter? Because if the age is wrong, all the relationships falls apart. And therefore, our aim of the study is to get a estimate a reliable age of Uviac. Let's see actually where is the Menzel Island. So if you see, this is a small island on a Saglic block, which which is very small. It's just 500 by 500 meter island, but it gives a great story. So this is this island, and we have four samples from this island, three of which are from northwestern side, one is from southern side. If you see a geological map of this area, Menzel Island is having a metagabro intrusion, which is layered uh, gabroic intrusion, and a uviac too. So we get to organize rock types from this and to intrusive granitic uh, bodies from this area and we sample it. I can show you the field photograph. When I see organize, what do you mean by organize? Organ means eye. And if you see in this photo, there are some circular features, white color circular features and black colored strips. And this is a result of a high pressure and high temperature. And this is called as organized. So I have a organized from this area. I have a granitic intrusion and another granitic intrusion. And there are some mafic enclaves, but these are much younger maybe and therefore not of our interest. If we see a field relationship, we can see this organized is cut by a granitic intrusion. You can see in this both, there is a contact between organized and the granite. And this granite itself is intruded by a younger granite. And we have samples from all these three phases. To summarize this relationship, you can see this sketch where there is a red colored, uh, transparent red color is uh, organized. A green color is a granite and another granite which intrude inside the older granite. So I will maybe say older granite and younger granite after this. We crush the rock, we do a geochemistry, and we see that two of our organizers fall on a granodiuretic field and two in a granite field for a total alkali silica classification diagram. So deeper into more class, more uh, particular classification, which is a three feldspar uh, triangle for TTG, we get that one of organizers is granodiorite, another is a granite while both of our intrusive rocks are granites. After this, we go for geochronological data dating. To do so, we separate the zircons, mount them on an epoxy. And if you see on this right, there is a image, a ref uh, reflected light image of a uh, mound prepared, and you can see the arrangement of grains. 
Then we polish the grains to reveal its internal structure. And then we use the different types of imaging. There is reflected light image, backscattered electronic image, and cathode luminance image. BSC and CL gives you an internal structure of the crystal. And from there, we can get to know about the evolution of this crystal. So if you see in this image, there are dark and light bands of uh, you can observe. And this is a characteristic. In both this image, you can see this banding. And this banding is known as oscillatory zoning, characteristic of igneous origin. That is a rock which is formed, or a, in this case, the crystal which is formed from the magma itself. So we put a spot, a spot of my uh, secondary ion mass spectrometer on such zones to get the magmatic age of the rock. This is the image of the instrument which we use to get a uranium lead ratio, which is then used for estimation of age. This uh, instrument is situated in Stockholm in North Sim Laboratory. And then once we get the uranium lead data, we plot it on a diagram called as Concordia diagram. This particular is known as a Terra Wasserberg Concordia diagram. And if you see this blue colored are a good igneous age spots. And if I take an average of this uh, good spots, I get a mean lead lead age as 3.3 uh, billion years old, more particularly 3,327.4 plus minus 4 million years. This is for organized. Second organized gives a similar result with a cluster around 3,331.5 plus minus 6.8 million years old. So I have both the nicest to be 3.3 billion years old. Then I have a first intrusive older granite. Uh, I, you can see here there's a scattering of a points towards down. So if I plot a line from this origin till this, uh, going through this scattered, I will intercept this Concordia diagram on around 1 billion years old, which is a time when this proton got metamorphosed or uh, disturbed, deformed. So this is nothing but a lead loss. When a rock forms and it undergoes deformation, some of the lead is lead, some of the lead get out of it and that caused a disturbance. And this you can see in scattering. And therefore I have selected five of the oldest uh, subset of five points. And that gives me a mean lead lead age as 2723, 2723 plus minus 11 million years old. The second one, which is 95 number granite, which intrude inside the older granite, gives me a really interesting stuff. You can see there are three clusters, one at 3.7, another at 2.7, and another at 2.5. Now, a question can be why I take 2.5 and not 2.7 as a magmatic uh, age for this rock. If you observe this zircon grains, you can see the core is giving me the age as a two, around 2.7 billion, and the, uh, the outside, which is a rim, it, it gives me the age around 2.5 billion. Why it is happening? A rock is formed at 2.7. This crystal has formed at 2.7, and the letter magmatism, which implies this granite, has made a has crystallized a rim around it, and therefore. I'm, I'm confident that this rock is not 2.7 year, million uh, billion years old, but this is 2.5 billion years old. And therefore, I said that the age of this granitic intrusion, the estimate is 2,566 plus minus 9.8 million years old. To summarize everything, I have a four sample. Two of them are organizes and two are granite. When I do a geochemical classification, one of this organizes granodiorite, while other, another is a granite. The other, other two intrusives are granite and gran, uh, both are granites by classification. And if we see the age, my both organizes are 3.3 billion years old, while my older granite is 2.7 and younger granite is 2.5. And this 2.7, 2.5 granites might be in place during the high temperature metamorphism, which is very much prone in this area. Then uh, interesting stuff is if you see in this diagram, in this map, there's already so many studies which have shown that there is a 3.3 magmatism and all the studies are from the area which is 
mapped as a OVR2. So we propose that OVR2, as said by Anya Savasinska, that OVR2 has age estimated, good at estimated age at 3.3 billion years. But there is a surprise. If all these granitoids form at 3.3 billion years old, they One should minute. give the same chemical. Yep. Uh, they should give a same uh, geochemistry, but if you observe in a geochemical plot, we see a difference, which means these are formed by two different sources or there is a metamosomatism which has made this. So this is all about uh, this talk. And this is a conclusion that there's a 3.3 magmatism on a, on a Menzel Island organized, uh, which is intruded by 2.7 granite and 2.5 granite. But the chemical comparison says that 3.3 granitoids are not from the same source. Thank you for your appreciation, and this is a reference. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. I'm going to uh, continue the, our session. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, time for the question, by, but I encourage all participants to ask questions uh, in the chat. And now we are moving to the next presentation, uh, which was prepared by Motura, Motuma Shifero Regarsa, sorry if my pronunciation is incorrect, from the Institute of Geophysics as well. And the presentation is about past and future land use, land cover changes in the Ethiopian Fincha Basin. And now I would like to ask for, um, turn the video on. Hello. My name is Motumara Gasa. I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Science, Poland, under supervision of Professor Mikhail Nons. Today, I'm going to present one of our paper work titled Past and Future Land Use Land Cover Changes in Ethiopia, in Java, sub In this presentation, we will look background motivation, location of the study area, and the methodology, results, and at last, conclusion. Land use is defined as how the land is utilized by human beings and their habitats, usually with an accent on practical role of land for economic activities. Whereas, land cover is a physical characteristic of the earth's surface, or attributes of a part of the earth's land surface and immediate subsurface, including biota, soil, topography, surface and the groundwater, and the human structure. As it is strictly connected with representing the hydrological cycle, land use and land cover change has been one of the most widely used methods to comprehend past land uses types of change estimated the driving force behind such changes and the perceptible transformation of the Earth's surface. Bare land expansion, increased surface run of production, and the soil erosion are a major environmental damage attributed to land use land cover in the Finchua River Basin, Ethiopia. These degradation process have adverse impacts on local agricultural productivity, water resource availability, and the food security. In addition, heavy rains cause a severe erosion and the sediment transport, which ultimately leads to soil degradation and contribute to negative impacts on downstream flooding pollution and the siltation of water bodies in the reservoirs of Finchua. This motivates us to conduct research on this. The project is located in western parts of Ethiopia in the biggest region, Oromia Regional Estate, at 330 kilometers far from the capital city of Ethiopia, Finfi. The methodology when we did this work performed using freely available Landsat satellite image. For a 
specified reference years and a digital elevation model. A resolution of 30 by 30 meter and referring it to 2019 was acquired from GIS and the Remote Sensing Department, Ministry of Weather, Irrigation and Energy of Ethiopia. Landsat 5 representing the former two reference years and Landsat 8 representing for the last one data were downloaded from the United States Geological Survey website to allow for post-processing image characterized by reduced cloud coverage only data occurred in months of January were downloaded corresponding to the dry season. The images were atmospherically corrected using QGIS. To cover the whole watershed area composite of Landsat's image from different paths and the row as indicated was created, assuring that the image refers to the same season. The land use land cover classification was performed, accounting for six classes water body built up agriculture, forest, shrub or sparse forest, and grass or swamp. The maximum likely Hood supervised classification method was applied via ArcGIS by creating training sites signature. Field survey have been conducted to assist the land use land cover classification of the satellite image. In addition, key informant interview with the elder peoples, those live for at least 30, 30 years, and focal group discussion with experts from Zonal and the District Office of Agriculture natural resource management, environment and climate change, land use administration and the local people representative were performed to obtain socio-economic support data. Ground truth data were used to evaluate the current land use land cover. To quantitatively assess the accuracy, a statistical method like overall accuracy and the CAPA value were applied based on these random sampling data were comp were prepared to check the overall accuracy. To predict land use, land cover change scenarios for the future, land change modeler in Tercet, formerly known as IDRIS software, utilize historical land use, land cover maps for the specified uh, reference years as input and accounting a series of driving forces such as distance from disturbance, distance from stream, distance from urban, distance from road, evidence likelihood, elevation, and the slope. To evaluate the capability of this software in predicting future land use land cover, a predicted map of 2019 was created based on 1989 and 2004 land use land cover and then compared with the actual 2019 map. The quality of the predicted map was compared against this reference map. Kappa indices such as Kappa for non formation, Kappa for location, and the Kappa standards are used to identify potential errors. Mean that Kappa values vary from 0 to 1, with values greater than 0 0.8, meaning an almost correct In 1989, after the classification, most of the study area was covered by agriculture, grass swamps, and shrubs, with only very minor parts occupied by built up. Similar land use land cover was also observed in 2004, with agriculture, grass or swamp, and the shrub being the most dominant land use land cover classes, and just a small increase in the area covered by built up. The, but that is very insignificant. In 2019, the class distribution remained more or less similar with an increase in the built up area. In summary, in the past, agriculture was always the most dominant land use land cover class in the Finchua watershed, followed by grass or swamp and shrub. The overall appraisals and the Kappa values K were 82, 85, 89, and 80, 
82 and 87, respectively for the three reference years. This result indicates that the accuracy of the classification improved from 1989 to 2019, also thanks to the higher quality of the satellite data used. Comparing the three reference years, it is possible to observe the considerable reduction in the area covered by forest shrub during the observation period. In detail, yearly around 639 of forest and 280 hectares of shrub were cleared in favor of the land use land cover classes. As anticipated, human pressure contributed to changing the environment as recognizable by the increase in areas covered by agricultural fields, built up grass or swamps and water bodies, which yearly gained around 616, 125, 7, and 171 hectares, respectively. Water bodies increased significantly during the last 30 years, mainly because of human intervention. In fact, in 1989, the Amarty Reservoir, one of the reservoirs located in the Fincha watershed, was not fully filled, while it, it was filled in 2004. In 2019, another dam was constructed over the Neshe River, and this is the main for the increment of the water body from time to time for the last 30 years. When we see, in general, from changes from 1989 to 2004, uh, the same changes from 2004 to 2019, the agriculture built up and water bodies shows increment from time to time. Also, uh, grass or a swamp significantly, insignificantly increase. This is, this is the same with change from 2004 to 2000. In general, we observe that uh, the increment of agriculture built up water bodies and insignificantly for grass or swamp, where the forests and the shrubs are declined, were declined from time to time. Uh, the land use land cover map of 2019 predicted from the two reference years data has been validated with the classified map of the same years as shown below. Uh, here we have two results for 2019, the projected one and the classified one. If we take water body for this one, it covers for the projected one around 6.64% and for that one 6.95. The change is very minor and the same principle is the same the results is observed in other land use land cover classes. So that model is capable to predict uh, for a future a decade. The capability of land LCM in predicting the, the 2009 land use land cover was assessed via K indices. Other situation, this one, as indicated here, all K indices are greater than 80% indicate good agreement between the projected and the actual land use land cover map for 2019. Uh, the land use land cover map for 2030, 2040, and 50 were created via LGM using historical maps as indicated here. As observed in the past, also the feature an increase in areas covered by agriculture built up grass or swamp and the water bodies is forecasted while the drastic decrease in forest and shrub should be expected with a slow rate of deforestation in the decade from 2014 to 2015. Uh, in general, when we uh, combine uh, all years of land use, land cover classes, uh, here uh, agriculture increased from time to time, from 19 to uh, 1989 to 2000, 2050 and other build up also shows increments other as we said forest and uh, shrub decreased from time to 
time as indicated from this map. Uh, in terms of transition probability, areas covered by forest and shrubs are more prone to be converted into agricultural land while built up areas should be expected on the actual grass or swamp zone. This indicates that for the future agriculture and the built up zones will be expanded at high rates since the land use land cover class will be converted. Reversely, forest and shrub will decline at risk. Conclusion, the present state investigated historical land use land cover. In the top and future watershed via completion of satellite image and the field support data. Based on such analyzed land, change modeler was applied to forecast land, uh, land use land cover in the next three decades. The land use, the 2019 land use land cover was also used for validating LCM approach comparing the forecasted situation with the actual one, indicating that multi-layer perceptron and neutron of network or Markov chain has significant ability to predict this one. Over the last 30 years, the forest covering finch outer shed was mostly converted into agriculture. An increase in areas converted by water bodies and the built up was also observable, mainly connected with increasing human pressure and construction of new projects. For the future, similar trend is, is more uh, than probable. This change uh, could help local sustainable their livelihood in short term, but the medium long term. And the reduction of areas covered by forest will be contributed to decreasing biodiversity and economic uh, ecosystem service. Uh, this is uh, uh, some information about the project, uh, the funding agency. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, presentation lasted exactly 15 minutes, so, and the schedule is quite tight. So we need to shift to the next presentation. Uh, but I, as I said before, I encourage to exchange questions and answer on the chat. And the next presentation um, was prepared by Major Sack Bedeleta from the University of Rostock. And the presentation is going to be about the potential impacts of historical and future um land use land cover changes on hydrological responses of Nash watershed and please uh, turn on the video thank you hello everybody i'm Mr. Sakapede a PhD student at the University of Rostock, Germany. Here, I would like to present one of our research entitled as Potential Impacts of Historical and the Future Land Use Land Cover Changes on Ideological Responses of National Watershed in Ethiopia. The presentation outlines includes introduction, materials and methods, results and discussions finally the conclusion part introduction the land use land cover change influences hydrological responses of the watershed leading in spatial and temporal changes the changes in land use land cover is a crucial driving force that affects the hydrological processes of a watershed. Therefore, it will lead to water problems such as water pollution, water redundancy, and water shortage. The historical, present, and the potential future impacts of land use land cover change needs to be evaluated to manage effectively water resources in a catchment. In sub-Saharan African countries, particularly, Ethiopia is known as one of the abundant water resources available for agriculture, domestic, and hydropower generation. Similarly, the country faces different significant natural and anthropogenic problems related to water resources such as flooding and droughts. Furthermore, in the steady area or national watershed, the expansion of agricultural land and urban area at the expense of vegetation cover is the main problem. 
and it is predicted to continue in the future. Therefore, assessing the effect of land use land cover change on hydrological responses using different parts of land use land cover will contribute in identifying management strategies in the watershed. Materials and the methods the study area is located in northwestern parts of the country, having an area of around 946 km square. The Nashi watershed is a tributary of Blue Nile River Basin, having an average annual temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. In the steady area, agriculture is the most significant and the major source of the livelihood of the population input data the selected model or SWOT model requires different input data such as digital elevation model soil land use land cover weather data and finally hydrological data the digital elevation model is the first input data in the model it is used to create stream network sub-basin and used to delineate the watershed. Therefore, the team with special resolution of 30 meters was collected from Ministry of Water, Irrigation and Energy and used in this study for further uh, process. The second input data in the model is soil. The SWAT model requires basic physical and chemical property of the soil type. In this study, the major soil types were collected from the Ministry of Water, Irrigation and Energy. However, the soil classification used in this study is based on FAO classification system and customized in the way the SWOT model requires. Generally, around nine different soil types were identified for the study watershed. The other input data is land use land cover which is indispensable input data influencing the hydrological responses of the watershed in this study three time periods of historical land use land cover and two time periods of future land use land cover were used for analysis the historical land use land cover images were obtained from different landsat images and classified using supervised classification method in ERDAS imagine model. Whereas the future land use land cover was predicted based on the historically classified image or known as business as a usual scenario using land change modular integrated tercet model. Generally, the land use land cover types of the study area are agricultural land, forest land, grassland, arpark area, water body, and range land. Weather data is also another input data in the model. Historically, long-term daily weather data is required for the hydrological SWAT model. The SWAT model requires around five types of weather data such as rainfall, temperature, wind speed, relative humidity, and solar radiation. Therefore, daily weather data within and the nearby station of the watershed were collected from National Meteorological Agency of Ethiopia. Hydrological data is also another necessary data. However, it is used for SWOT model calibration and validation. The measured hydrological data at the gauging station was collected from Hydrology Department of Ethiopian Ministry of Water Education and Energy. Hydrological model. The selected model was soil and water assessment tool. It was developed to compute the land use land cover change effect on hydrological responses with changing soils, land use, land cover, and slope. It is physically based, semi-distributed, and daily time step. The major model components include digital elevation model, weather, hydrology, soil properties, and land management. 
In the SWOT model, the water balance is the base and the driving force for all hydrological processes. Hydrological model performance evaluation. The model performance evaluation was conducted to determine the consistency of simulated data compared to the measured data during the calibration and the validation periods. Due to the high number of flow characteristics in SWAT, it is required to identify the most sensitive parameters in order to improve the hydrological model's calibration. Therefore, the most sensitive parameters that have a strong influence on the flow process were identified through the sensitivity analysis. In this study, the sequential uncertainty fitting integrated in the SWAT calibration and uncertainty program was used to achieve the sensitivity analysis, calibration, and validation. The observed stream flow of the watershed was from 1985 to 2008 and it was divided into warm up period, calibration and validation. <laughs> Results and discussions. The analyzed land use land cover of the watershed are shown in this graph. Generally, the dominant land use land cover of the steady area is agricultural land. From the graph, we can observe that the agricultural land and the urban area have been increased throughout the time period, whereas the forest land shows the decreasing trend. The other land use land cover types of the watershed shows the variation. The increasing and the decreasing rate varies from time to time. This can influence the watershed hydrological response. The expansion rate of agricultural land has been reduced between 2035 to 2050 as most of the land suitable for agriculture was already in use and the limit for expansion had almost been reached in the highlands. Here, the selected most significant sensitive parameters are depicted in this table based on their t stats and the p-value. Among these parameters, the top three most significant parameters are curve number, groundwater delay, and the saturated hydraulic conductivity. The parameters include those governing subsurface, surface hydrological processes, and stream routing. Calibration and validation. The calibration was implemented using the stream flow for the time period of 1987 to 1999, whereas the validation was from 2000 to 2008. However, before having the calibration and the validation, it is necessary to have warm up periods. Therefore, two years mean 1985 to 1986 was considered as warm-up uh, period. The evaluation of the simulated and observed stream flow computed both statistically and graphically shows in a acceptable range. Based on the performance assessment criteria, the computed values mean coefficient of determination, NSE, and the other criteria are in a very good range. In this study, the percentage bias shows positive. It indicates that overestimation. However, based on the result, no significant model overestimated or underestimated because the obtained values are in the recommended range. The findings revealed that above 80% and 40% of the surface runoff and the groundwater happens throughout the wet season, whereas less than 10% will happen in the dry and the short rainy season. The surface runoff in the wet season was increased from 2090 to 2035. However, 
it will decrease in the waste season from 2035 to 2050 due to a gradual increase of range land the extraction of forest land range land grassland and the expansion of agricultural land and urban area highly influence surface runoff peak flow and the base flow depending on the rainfall events the reduction in forest land decreases infiltration and evapotranspiration rates resulting in a decrease of base flow and an increase in imper impervious surface covers the monthly peak flows happened in july and august and the maximum monthly discharge occurred in 2050 while the minimum flow occurred in 1990 generally the increase of surface runoff in wet seasons may result in flooding and decline in the dry season may affect water schemes this graph shows that the percentage change of hydrological components in nature watershed throughout the steady period the simulated surface runoff for the potential future land use land cover scenarios was higher than those of the baseline and the current land use land cover because of further land use land cover changes the land use land cover change from 2005 to 2019 provides maximum percentage change of surface runoff whereas from 2035 to 2050 gives minimum percentage change compared to the other time periods however the land use land cover change from 2035 to 2050 provides maximum percentage change of groundwater but from 2005 to 2019 minimum average groundwater relative to the other land use land cover and hydrological components 90. as conclusion the SWAT hydrological model was used to simulate continuous fluctuations in the past and the future the relation of land use land cover categories and hydrological components revealed that the surface runoff was highly attributed to change in the agricultural land with higher correlation coefficient generally the analysis shows that agricultural land is directly proportional to surface runoff but inversely proportional to the groundwater flow the increment of surface runoff and the decline of groundwater observed during the rainy season may lead to increasing extreme weather events sedimentation runoff siltation and water shortage may happen during the dry season and uh, it will obstruct socio-economic development on ethiopia the suitable management policy should be prepared depending on the usually land use land cover change of the water uh, shade thank you very much for your attention uh, thank you and unfortunately we need to pursue an agenda it's pity that we don't have time to discuss such uh, important topics but i hope that we will have uh, another opportunity and now we are going to the last uh, presentation during our session also um, given by Piotr Clement, also from the institute of geophysics we have a very strong representation of this institute today and the presentation will be about predicting a pattern of DEM model at stick slip events in faults using machine learning. Piotr, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, does it work properly? Yes. Okay, thanks. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, let's start my presentation. Uh, thank you for introduction. Uh, so let's go to the um, short outline outline of my uh, presentation. So I am going firstly about uh, what is machine learning and why do is it, why do we need it. And then I will try to um, tell a few words about new approach to understanding fault stability. So it means also understanding uh, in some case uh, earthquakes uh, using machine learning. And then I will try to present uh, numerical simulations which were performed by me with applied numerical model and numerical results and at the end uh, a handful of comments uh, on that subject so let's start with uh, the first part 
uh, in general, why machine learning is so popular uh, currently? There are two main issues. Because when we have uh, problems where the data set is huge, and when we have uh, problems, when we have many variables which affect each other and which affect uh, the final result, so uh, that's the best reason to apply machine learning because machine learning can help us to uh, solve our, our problems. And that's the reason why in recent years, uh, machine learning become was one of the most popular buzzwords in recent years. So I tried to apply uh, Google Trends to uh, check what people were searching in uh, Google browser uh, from 2004 uh, up to now. And uh, here is a, a blue line is a machine learning, a red line is a big data, deep learning is a yellow, uh, yellow line, and green line is uh, artificial intelligence. So as we can see at the beginning of the century, uh, artificial intelligence was uh, the most popular. Then was the period of uh, big data. And now uh, we can say from um, around say five years, uh, machine learning is uh, definitely uh, the most popular uh, from uh, that terms. So this is not surprising uh, that also scientists try to apply that universal and flexible approach um, to uh, the different issues connected with uh, earthquakes. Uh, because basically, um, classical approach uh, to determine that earthquake uh, may be coming is based on the uh, intervent time. Uh, so it means it's based on the history of a fault. So there was a very um, famous case of a park field a prediction. A park field is in California. Uh, because uh, according to uh, data uh, between 1857 uh, 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 and 1866, uh, scientists calculated that uh, recurrence interval of earthquake is around 22 years. Uh, thus, they predicted that uh, the next major earthquake was expected between 1988 and 1993. But ultimately, uh, that earthquake took place in 2004, and that was a great failure of that kind of uh, approach. Of course, uh, there are uh, all the time uh, different um, new approaches to, to try to analyze uh, earthquakes, what is going on in faults uh, in general. But that was year 2017, when uh, Ruella Duke with uh, collabora uh, collaborators, they uh, published a paper, Machine Learning Predicts Laboratory Earthquakes, uh, that become very famous, not only among uh, scientists, but also um, among uh, normal people, I can say, and uh, journalists. Uh, because uh, in this paper, uh, they showed uh, somehow a new approach, uh, which gave a new hope for uh, some kind of a, um, new, result, a new results uh, connected with, uh, with earthquakes uh, prediction. So in this work, it was asked, uh, can the failure time of an upcoming uh, laboratory earthquake be predicted using characteristics of only continuously recorded acoustic signal? Uh, so because, before we go to that uh, subject, I would like to uh, explain basically what is the, um, scam, what is the scheme of the development of uh, earthquakes, which is uh, visible here. At, uh, this, uh, in this first figure, uh, we can see uh, stress in a function of uh, geological time, we see that uh, stress is uh, building up, is increasing up to achieving uh, critical uh, stress, and then is sudden failure, which is connected with earthquake, and that cycle repeats and repeats again. So of course, this is uh, idealization, this is simplification. In real cases, it looks rather like that. So it means that earthquakes are somehow uh, basically unpredictable. Uh, at least uh, for uh, this moment. But um, this work, uh, this paper I, I was talking uh, a few seconds ago, was uh, somehow uh, interesting um, because in laboratory, it, they were able to recreate uh, that scheme of earthquake like that using such kind of a machine. And they were recording uh, acoustic signal, they trained uh, machine learning algorithm, and they were able to predict uh, with a great accuracy that uh, laboratory earthquakes. Uh, it seems not very, um, not very um, 
incredible. But in fact, it was uh, very useful because these predictions do not use a system history. These predictions were based uh, simply on a um, current time uh, measurements. So uh, they divided uh, all the measurements into uh, a segments. They calculated uh, different statistical features and they used the data uh, to train uh, random forest. In this case, that was random forest. They used the data to train that machine learning algorithm. And uh, finally, uh, that's probably the most important result uh, because uh, here is presented a time to failure, time to next failure. Uh, so uh, red dots, uh, this is a uh, testing data. Uh, this is the measurement. And here, blue line is a prediction uh, of a machine learning algorithm. So uh, we, as we can see with, with bare eye, uh, this is a very good uh, accuracy. After that, uh, they try to apply that approach uh, to a, a natural phenomena. That was not a um, real earthquake in case, uh, in the sense that it was not a, a rapid earthquake, but they applied it uh, to um, so-called uh, slow, uh, sl slow earthquakes, uh, slow sleeps uh, in area of uh, Western Canada. And as it can be seen, uh, they, are, they uh, achieved also uh, very uh, good uh, results. Uh, going back, uh, because I didn't define what are these slow and sleeps, uh, so these areas uh, where the, the, the fault, there is no movement in, uh, in the fault is uh, called uh, somehow, um, it's a, a stick uh, phase and area when there is a movement in the fault, it's a, a sleep phase. So this is a kind of somehow described as a stick sleep uh, movements in uh, the fault. So I was somehow uh, inspired by this uh, research. And I, um, because my area of research is in general uh, numerical simulations. So I try, because numerical simulations in general, they offer some kind of a different insight into uh, different processes than uh, laboratory experiments. So I try to apply it numerical simulations uh, to recreate, uh, to get a new insight uh, applying a similar approach. I applied a discrete element model, a model uh, which is a numerical method for simulating uh, brittle and granular materials. So it means that uh, it's very well suitable for simulating uh, phenomena in, inside uh, the fault. And uh, in general, in this method, uh, the system is um, consists of uh, particles, individual particles. Each particle uh, particles can have uh, bonds with different part, uh, different uh, properties, and uh, um, scheme of a such kind of a simulation in general looks uh, like here. We define system geometry, uh, we identify contacts, we calculate forces acting on every particle, we calculate displacement and update geometry, and so on until the simulation ends. So it means that such kind of uh, simulations are quite uh, computationally uh, heavy. Uh, to create a model of a fault, uh, I had to be conscious of uh, several issues. Uh, here uh, are presented uh, basic types of faulting. And when, when such kind of uh, uh, moves uh, appear inside the fault, um, there is uh, something called granular uh, fault gauge, which is uh, inside uh, the fault. Uh, this is the zone of uh, rocks, uh, fragmented rocks at the core of a damage zone. And the dynamic of the fault is governed by the granular interactions inside a fault uh, gouge. So that's my model, which I applied. Uh, here is, of course, my model. And here is schematic representation of a, a fault zone. So in my model, uh, here is an um, undeformed host rock, which is represented here in my model. A zone of damage host rock represented here, and in the middle, uh, central granular gauge layer represented in my model here. Uh, such kind of a model is of course subjected to a shearing and normal load to recreate the conditions uh, in the a fault. Um, when you have such kind of a system, we have a lot of uh, parameters which can be treated as uh, independent variables. So uh, to name a few, this is size of grains in granular layer, thickness of a granular layer and so on. And uh, just to assess somehow the stability of such kind of a system, I applied a bulk a friction coefficient 
in this case, this is dependent variable because it depends on other uh, parameters. So presence of uh, so many independent variables raises a logical question about uh, the influence on dependent variable uh, fault stability. And I think uh, it's a very good uh, um, situation, very good possibility to apply uh, supervised machine learning to try to find out uh, what uh, that uh, relationships are. Uh, so let's go uh, to my numerical uh, results. Uh, because machine learning is huge, it's a huge branch of science. Uh, and I think uh, the workhorse of, of machine learning is supervised learning. So I apply I applied supervised learning. Uh, regression algorithm because I wanted to predict numbers uh, from uh, numbers. Um, I choose eight, uh, the most popular algorithms, a random forest, a support vector machine, k nearest neighbors, and so on, with four uh, different metrics to measure the performance of the um, algorithms. And uh, I had independent variables and my dependent variable bulk fiction coefficient measured as a shear force divided by applied a normal force. So here are the results. Um, I uh, performed almost uh, um, 1,700 simulations. And here are the results for different algorithms. Uh, here, is, uh, here are uh, results of uh, DM simulations. And uh, on this, uh, this axis, there are uh, predictions uh, for eight different uh, algorithms. So a dashed line represents the ideal situation. Uh, so when these dots are um, not very close to that lines, it means that algorithm doesn't work uh, very well. So we can see that a random forest uh, was uh, definitely the best. And uh, judging from the numbers, we can see that different metrics uh, are also the same for random, uh, the best for random forest, especially with error to score uh, ninety-two uh, percent, which is a very good uh, result. Two minutes. Uh, thank you. So uh, knowing that uh, random forest is uh, the best, al uh, the best um, algorithm, I tried to recreate the experiment from Real Educ, and here is presented a comparison between a laboratory and machine learning predictions by Real, uh, Real Educ, and here are. Uh, my comparisons between uh, DEM simulations and machine learning predictions in my experiments. And as we can see, the DEM simulations results show good agreement with previous uh, laboratory experiments on stick sleep cycles performed by Real Educ. So just to conclude, because that uh, that issue of general of uh, of earthquake predictions is uh, quite controversial, so I found out uh, what are the opinions of application machine learning uh, to the issue of earthquakes. There are opinions from very positive uh, to uh, somehow negative. For instance, Paul Jones, uh, Johnson from Los Alamos National Laboratory, he said, I'm not going, we are going to predict earthquakes in my lifetime, but we are going to make a hell of a lot of progress. And Martin de Hoop from Rice University, he said, an important step has been taken, an extremely important step, but it's like a tiny little step in the right direction. Uh, from Stanford University scientist, uh, he said that this is not a prediction, but somehow this is rela related with that. From scientists from Caltech, he said, best guess is that earthquakes are inherently unpredictable. So this is a completely negative opinion. And uh, finally, Robert Geller from University of Tokyo, uh, he said that yes, we can find a lot of precursors uh, with such kind of uh, approach, uh, but he, uh, but I see no reason to think that such patterns will work going forward in time, he said. So finishing with that different opinions on the subject, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for a very exciting presentation. Uh, actually, we don't have uh, time, so I propose to, to participants to grab uh, a coffee and back to us or use these two minutes to ask the question to our speakers. And we will see within two minutes. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. So welcome back after this short break. Uh, I am Paulina Paksius from the Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Science. 
I will be the head of the last and the fifth session uh, of this conference. And our first speaker is Veronika Patua, also from our institute. Veronika, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hello. Yes, hello. Super. So the floor is yours. Please share your presentation and start okay. it. I hope it will work it. <laughs> Okay, so can you see my presentation right now? Yes, still in the presentation mode. Okay. If you switch to the full screen. Yes, now it's in the full screen mode, super. Okay, okay. good luck. So hello everyone, my name is Veronika Patua and I am a second PhD uh, student of the Institute of Oceanology. And uh, in my research, I'm dealing with uh, zooplankton uh, taxonomic composition around the Arctic region. So today I will uh, tell a little bit about the halocline as an environmental barrier for animals and how um, the zooplankton community differs uh, above and uh, under the halocline in Kongsfjord. So first, uh, a little introduction. Uh, we should know what is zooplankton. So simply they are uh, organisms drifting in the uh, water and they cannot resist the movement of the water. So usually they are moved by the currents uh, or water masses. And it is uh, important to know that they are, uh, they play a role in the environment, for example, as a food for other organisms, for other zooplankton, fish, seabirds, or even mammals. Uh, and they are very, uh, important link between uh, the primary producers uh, connecting uh, it with higher trophic levels. So they in some way transfer the matter and energy through the pelagic system. Uh, and uh, some of them are really sensitive uh, to changes in the environment. For example, the changes uh, in temperature or salinity. So they can also act as a um, climate change indicators. Uh, so what is uh, right now halocline? Uh, it is simply the vertical zone in the water, uh, in the oceanic water, uh, in which uh, there are very rapid uh, changes in the salinity. Uh, so it can uh, have a biological implications uh, to the animals, to the marine animals. And in case of zooplankton, it can also influence their distribution um, in the water column. And the third thing I would like to mention here is the, uh, the, the, the environment of my research. So why exactly the Arctic? Um, nowadays, uh, the Arctic is a um, concerned to be the fastest uh, uh, warming region in the world. So it is very important to, to do the research uh, in, those, in this region. And the, the, the costs, um, one of the costs of uh, the, the changes, the global warming is the phenomena called Atlantification, which is simply the inflows of uh, warmer and saltier Atlantic waters uh, further north to the Arctic Ocean. And it can change the temperature, salinity and uh, other environmental conditions. So it is highly important uh, to um, do the research, to study it, uh, the, the mutual um, interactions between the animals, the, the other organism and the environment uh, during these changes um, which occur in the Arctic uh, region right now. So now we can move to my research question I asked in my studies. So first is do zooplankton taxonomic composition and abundance differ above and under the halocline? And the second one um, is the question about the salinity has a significant influence on differentiation in zooplankton taxonomic structure in the water column. So I try to answer those questions uh, presenting you uh, my research. Um, when it comes to my uh, research uh, study area, uh, I choose the Kongsfjord and here I present my uh, sampling stations from the uh, outer part of the fjord to the inner part. Uh, and the concert is uh, the fjord situated on the West Spitsbergen coast. Uh, and it is influenced uh, uh, by these Atlantic waters I mentioned. And as this fjord has a very um, specific uh, bottom structure, the water easily can enter to the fjord and then can um, cause uh, some trans transformations and uh, hydrographic uh, uh, processes inside. So it is influenced also the, the, the whole ecosystem. 
uh, inside the fjord. And uh, during the research uh, on those stations, uh, the environmental variables were measured. Uh, so we measured the temperature and salinity using uh, the CTD probe, uh, which is uh, uh, attached to the uh, bathometer's rosette. And also, uh, thanks to these uh, bathometers, we collected the water for further chlorophyll A concentration uh, measurement. Uh, we collected the zooplankton samples using the plankton net uh, from the above and uh, below um, halocline layer. And it was uh, last year during the research cruise uh, in the summer. Um, and the, uh, the samples were preserved in uh, ethyl alcohol. Uh, then the samples uh, were um, analyzed morphologically under the sterile microscope uh, in the lab. And then uh, I performed uh, a statistical and ecological analysis, which I uh, wanted to present to you now. So first uh, we see the um, standard temperature and salinity profiles uh, across my uh, sampling sites. Uh, and what is important here um, it is that the halocline um, level starts uh, very shallow, uh, almost in each, uh, at each station it was between uh, 5 to 20 meters, and the depth of uh, the layer of halocline was between 10 and 55 meters. So um, I collected the samples above, so for example from 5 to 0 meters, and below, for example, from 55 meters to the uh, bottom. Uh, here I uh, performed the very simple cluster analysis to see if my samples, uh, according to their taxonomic composition and abundance, uh, grouped into um, some fine results. And as you see, I have a very clear uh, differentiation between the samples uh, above the halock line and uh, below the halocline. So um, I try to make a graph, uh, which you can see right now, uh, on which I can, um, I would like to present the, the most important taxa, uh, which I analyzed uh, in my samples and their abundances. And what is important on this graph that we see uh, that the abundances of zooplankton are two times lower than the, the abundances above the halocline. Uh, and when it comes to the taxonomic structure, for a first sight, it looks like very similar, but we need to focus that the above halocline, uh, we see much higher abundances of uh, Oitona similis, uh, of Bivalvia veligers, and of Copepoda naupli. Uh, so then I thought to make much more uh, uh, analysis, which will focus more ecologically and statistically, statistically to confirm what I see on a simple graph. So I performed a um, simple analysis, which is a percentage similarity dissimilarity analysis based on which uh, we can assess the uh, proportion of the dominant taxa affected the similar, similarity and dissimilarity uh, through our uh, samples uh, based on the taxonomic composition and the abundances. And what we see here is that uh, it confirmed what we see on the graphs earlier, that the most um, important and the most, uh, the most important taxa which influenced uh, the similarity above the halock line uh, in case of zooplankton taxonomy uh, is Oitona similis, Copepoda naupli, and Bivalvia veligers. In case of uh, under halocline is Bivalvia veligers, Oitona similis, and Microcalanus. And here, uh, the lower part of the table uh, presents the dissimilarity between the above and under taxonomic structure of zooplankton. Um, and the most important taxa which influenced that was Copepoda naupli, Oitona similis, and Bivalvia veligers. And what is important here that even if we see like the same taxa, which are important, we should remember that the abundances of uh, those organisms uh, differed uh, between the above halocline 
and under Halloc line. So that's why um, they are included here. Uh, and the values in the red tells us about uh, how strong uh, it is that similarity or dissimilarity between our uh, samples. Uh, so if it is closer to the uh, 100, it means that the similarity or dissimilarity is uh, uh, strong. Uh, and the last results I want to present is um, the connection between the environmental factors uh, and zooplankton taxonomic composition and abundances. And do they influence significantly um, on, the, on, on what we see uh, earlier? So I uh, include the temperature, salinity, and chlorophyll A concentration in my uh, analysis. Uh, and what is important that the, both salinity and uh, also temperature had a significant influence um, on the uh, differentiation in zooplankton taxonomic composition and abundances uh, above the halocline and uh, below the halocline. So uh, to shortly conclude uh, my research, uh, both salinity and temperature had a significant influence uh, on the zooplankton taxonomic structure. Uh, the most important taxa which influenced uh, those differentiation was Oitona similis, uh, were Oitona similis, Bivalvia Liger, and Copepoda naupli. And uh, of course, uh, as we are the scientists and our thinking is like uh, further research in this matter are required, which is uh, right now planned. And uh, I wanted to repeat uh, the, the sampling uh, collection this year. So probably uh, next year, my, my uh, current results will be uh, uh, confirmed, maybe stronger. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I hope you like my presentation and I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you, Veronika, for a very interesting presentation and also for keeping the time. So are there any questions? Yes, Marta? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, did you think about, you know, the possibility that also food availability competitions or different um, uh toler uh, range of uh, tolerance tolerance range uh, of specific environmental conditions uh, is the reason of the uh, of the um, differences between the assemblages above and under uh, halocline not only temperature and uh, salinity yes yes of course this is a, a lot of um, important factors influencing like the, this distribution uh, across the uh, water column uh, here i just focused on the hollow line so that's the, the kind of first attempt to do um, this research uh, so I, I didn't know at the beginning what what we, will be uh, the results uh, of uh, those samples uh, maybe probably i should uh, if i repeated it uh, should take much more factors uh, to this um, to this uh, analysis and then maybe include some some food competition or, or just uh, other environmental um, factor i don't know i am not specialist but <laughs> i don't know did you choose uh, you know the the group of organisms on which you are focusing on that you know that they are not in the competitions uh, about habitats or foods. I don't like know. the zooplankton is a very big, um, very big formation in the pelagic system. So if I wanted to focus on a, I don't know, one um, one part of zooplankton, it it could be in a kind of impossible because it's a lot of species inside, and of course they they have some competition and uh, predatory pressure. But if I wanted to check, if I should implement some other uh, methods and methodology. And here I wanted to check just the environmental, like real environmental factors, uh, which is like mostly temperature and salinity, um, which I wanted to connect also with those uh, atlantification. So that, that's why I'm focused here only uh, on the environmental factors. 
yeah, not okay. the food competition and uh, yeah i know that including yeah, yeah. uh, including everything it's uh, it's tricky, more, more and functional and, and, yeah. and i am not a and, specialist in functional like traits so <laughs> and needs more money <laughs> okay uh, yeah of thank course <laughs> thank you Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marta, for, for your question. Thank you, Veronica, also. I think we are out of time for another question. So I see uh, two raised hands, uh, Martin and Marta. Could you please put in the chat? Uh, I'm sure that Veronica will be really um, up to answer them. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's switch to the next presentation. Next thank presentation you. is by Joanna Buch from University of Gdańsk. Joanna, are you with us? Yes, uh, are you hearing me? Yes, yes, pretty mm -hmm. good. Okay, yes. so if you are ready, please share your uh, presentation to us. Uh, one moment. Uh, I. Uh... I'm not sure how to. Yeah, on the on the bottom of your screen, you should have the line with the green button oh, written yeah, "Dostępny ekran." Okay, it should be. Yeah, so you can share the full screen or just your presentation. Uh, yeah. You, okay. uh, still, uh, yeah, is this in a uh, presentation mode right now? One moment. Yeah, sure. Yes, now it's in the full screen modes. <laughs> So the floor is yours. Good luck. Okay. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jan Nabu, and I am a PhD student uh, at the University of uh, Gdańsk. And uh, today I want to uh, show you a little review about the state of knowledge about the environmental pollution in uh, South Shetland Island and Antarctic uh, Peninsula and in Antarctic uh, general. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, on the beginning, uh, Antarctica uh, was a uh, subject of uh, environmental uh, of interest uh, in uh, <clears throat> Antarctica was the uh, object of uh, interest in uh, many years. Uh, and uh, the uh, date of the official discovery of the Antarctic continent, uh, it's uh, uh, 1820. <clears throat> and uh, after that, in the 19th century, there started uh, uh, begin, uh, there uh, have <clears throat> begun and have, have begun the first uh, uh, ex, uh, explore uh, the first uh, uh, exploration expedition to the continent uh, and the first uh, wintering on the Antarctic uh, took place in the uh, 1898 by the Belgica Whistle uh, and it was because uh, this uh, ship was cut from the ocean by the surrounding uh, ice. And uh, also the first station, uh, polar stations in the Antarctica, uh, even during uh, Austral summer, uh, there was uh, the uh, ships of the uh, early uh, explorers. And uh, nowadays, uh, there are uh, over uh, 75 uh, polar uh, stations on, uh, on the whole the continent. And the most of them uh, is located uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula and South Shetland uh, Island, uh, which are in the, in the same region, uh, region as uh, uh, Pen uh, Antarctic uh, Peninsula. Uh, These all stations are served by uh, 29 countries and uh, by uh, scientists from around, uh, around the world. And uh, there are many subjects of uh, research. The, here uh, uh, there is uh, there are two figures. On uh, the first uh, one, uh, you can see uh, how many uh, articles about the Antarctica topic uh, 
was uh, uh, created or wrote uh, by the time uh, from the 19, uh, 1998 to uh, 2015. And uh, the second uh, figure, on the second figure, you can uh, see uh, that the uh, nearly two per three, um, uh, <clears throat> more, most, more than uh, half of the uh, oral research uh, are connected to the natural science. Uh, so uh, there is a, a very big uh, base of the knowledge uh, nowadays about the uh, environment. And uh, <clears throat> the main problem about the Antarctic environment uh, in the second half of uh, 20th century uh, was considered the depletion, uh, depletion of uh, ozone layer. Uh, and because of this, did the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, governances uh, of uh, uh, governance uh, said that there is a necessity uh, of uh, le uh, legal regulation uh, regarding the exploitation of this uh, area, and uh, there uh, they started to protect uh, Antarctica, for example, with uh, Antarctic fretting. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> about uh, nowadays, uh, last two decades there is uh, no more, uh, more attention uh, uh, linked to uh, some issues like global warming, uh, rising carbon dioxide uh, content in the atmosphere, ocean acidification, and also uh, environmental pollution in situ. And uh, there are uh, uh, in uh, <coughs> essentials uh, uh, um, pops, pachs, and uh, sewage, uh, which are uh, con uh, <coughs> which are connected with the uh, stations on the continent. And um, other important uh, issues uh, uh, which uh, are uh, taking uh, into account by the researchers. There are uh, overfishing and the changes in uh, ecosystems, uh, growing impact of tourism and uh, the operation in situ at the stations and also problem of uh, microplastic uh, plastics. <laughs> and um, now uh, there is a lot of information about how the uh, <clears throat> Uh, human activity uh, impact the uh, environment, even in the Antarctic. Uh, growing uh, impact of uh, tourism and the growing number of stations uh, means that there are more, uh, more and more people and more and more uh, transport and uh, uh, what is um, <clears throat> connected with it. Uh, also, uh, there is growing uh, uh, process of uh, burning fuels and uh, the uh, in, and this impact uh, uh, affect the environment uh, also in the marine uh, in the marine and in the uh, land and uh, uh, plastic uh, <coughs> was uh, also uh, founded in the organisms uh, in the both of uh, uh, in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. Uh, in recent uh, years, uh, there were uh, showing uh, results uh, about uh, research, uh, research uh, showing that uh, changes, uh, there are also changes in the atmospheric circulation on the southern hemisphere. And uh, there, uh, there is also a growing role of the volcanism uh, in Antarctica in the scientist interest, uh, because uh, in the last years uh, uh, there were uh, uh, there was published uh, uh, research uh, shows that uh, uh, Antarctica is the biggest. Uh, 
region of the world with, uh, uh, with volcanoes, but most of them uh, is under the ice. So uh, we don't know uh, really uh, what, uh, what is the activity of volcanism on the, this continent, but uh, there is a theory that uh, the activity of volcanism uh, can uh, affect the uh, process of uh, warming uh, uh, west part of the Antar Antarctic uh, continent. <coughs> and uh, about uh, changes in atmospheric circulation, uh, it means that the uh, masses of air can uh, reach the uh, Antarctica from the uh, really remote uh, regions. But uh, there are still few studies showing how anthropo pressure, especially transport and uh, burning fuels uh, in remote of, uh, regions, uh, can affect to the, the degree of uh, pollution in the Antarctic environment. Uh, especially uh, in the context of the share of uh, elementary carbon, uh, which is uh, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, which, which is crucial for the uh, show the impact of uh, anthropo pressure and uh, uh, human activity. You have not two minutes left. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and there is also uh, uh, little of knowledge about uh, chemical composition uh, in aerosols, uh, rainfall, and uh, seawater. Uh, um, in uh, <clears throat> in uh, <clears throat> also in uh, this uh, uh, this way that uh, how the uh, com uh, this composition uh, is affected by uh, natural processes and how by anthropo pressure and uh, which uh, sources are dominant and uh, how uh, what is the amount of uh, these pollutions from a remote re region uh, due to the uh, local sources of uh, pollutions and uh, this is the topic uh, which i want to uh, <clears throat> to involve in my uh, phd uh, uh, thesis and uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this presentation. So are there any questions? Okay, I, I can see uh, that anybody want to ask you about something maybe uh, if the if you can use also chat to put your questions to anybody, so please use it widely. If there are no still no questions, let's move to the next presentation, which will be given by Marta Majerska from Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me, and now I'm starting to share my screen. Yes, I so hear I hope you. you can see it now. Yes, I see it. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so good luck. Thanks. 15 minutes. Uh, I will try to keep the time. Uh, okay, so today I would like to say a few words on uh, variability uh, of hydrological regimes of non-glaciated polar catchment uh, in changing climate. And uh, the study is based on uh, Fuglebecken catchment in Horsund area in southern Spitsbergen. Um, and uh, starting with a short introduction, uh, recently, as you all probably know, because that's the reason we met here, uh, recently we can observe the climate change, which is very intense. Uh, and uh, we can also say that it affects the hydrological processes. Uh, and especially this is river runoff uh, that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, 
And uh, as we know, polar regions are the most sensitive regions uh, around the world. And uh, this is why we need to study them because uh, this is very crucial uh, for uh, investigating this climate change. And uh, now it's uh, very convenient to use rainfall uh, runoff modeling approach uh, for hydrological investigations. Uh, because uh, it doesn't really take much time uh, to compute the uh, simulations and uh, at the same time uh, the simulations are pretty accurate. So what are the aims of the study? Well, this is a study of Angachita catchment and I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, which is the representative uh, one for Southern Spitsbergen. And uh, I would like to demonstrate the run of simulation outcomes uh, of these uh, hydrological models. And I would like to compare the results, uh, taking into account these differences between uh, each model and between uh, consecutive seasons and uh, also between the uh, optimization methods. Uh, and uh, to assimilate the available in situ observations, uh, which are crucial, which are the basis of this uh, in investigation, uh, and uh, especially the time lapse imagery will be included. And uh, finding the best set of the uh, of models and uh, the best time step uh, for hint casting of the past and uh, projections uh, of the future hydrological conditions. So um, just a few words about the study area. As I said, it's uh, Lebecken catchment, uh, which is located in southern Spitsbergen. Uh, it was already uh, examined in terms of uh, many uh, research areas like permafrost, active layer, or also runoff investigation in the past, uh, and others. Uh, so there is a very uh, accurate hydrological monitoring uh, conducted in the station uh, and especially in the Fuglebecken uh, catchment. So there is a, a large meteorological data set uh, and also there are some uh, fluorometers um, deployed which measures the runoff uh, in Fuglebecken stream uh, and others. Uh, there is also information on water temperature and water levels uh, and also others like soil moistures and subsurface water levels. Uh, so for the climate data uh, that I use for the uh, past uh, conditions in the Fuglebecken catchment, I use the data uh, smoothing uh, tool, which is MASH tool. Uh, so I was averaging the data uh, on consecutive days, uh, which is uh, depicted by this uh, letter W and by consecutive years. Uh, and uh, I could uh, derive the patterns of uh, also not only climate data, but then also I will show the smooth data of uh, past uh, runoff uh, records. And uh, as you may know, the, the temperature is rising. And uh, but what is more uh, interesting for me is the changes in precipitation, which is more intense, and uh, it is transferred from uh, from the solid one to liquid one in autumn uh, season. Uh, so it changes a lot uh, when it comes to the hydrological regime. Uh, and the, for the calibration of the models, I use air temperature, precipitation, uh, potential evapotranspiration, and also uh, for the calibration stage, uh, I use the runoff data from 2014 to 2019. Uh, and uh, for the evaluation of the simulation, I also use time-lapse cameras, uh, which are deployed on the Fuglebecken uh, and Ari Kamen. Uh, so uh, they gave me a very uh, interesting information of what was happening in the catchment uh, after the, the equipment was uh, deinstalled. Uh, so like in, let's say, uh, late autumn. Uh, and briefly about uh, rainfall runoff modeling, uh, I used uh, in, uh, in general 50 conceptual models uh, for hydrological uh, simulations. And I used the Marmot toolbox, uh, which uh, was which included um, almost all of them, but uh, I added some. And uh, there were two uh, calibration algorithms, uh, FMIN search BND and SPSL. 
And uh, also we tried uh, to investigate the, the simulations with different uh, objective functions and eventually the clean Gupta efficiency turned out to be the best one. And moving on to the results, uh, this is the uh, general overview of the whole 50 models. So as you can see, the red color indicates that this performance was not really uh, good. It uh, didn't satisfy us. So uh, we use the ones that were a little bit better based on this objective function. And these are marked in, the, in green color. Uh, so basically, uh, in the end, we choose uh, seven models uh, that uh, turned out to have the best performance. And this is, uh, these are the uh, six of them depicted here. Uh, and uh, this is the, uh, the, these are the results of calibration stage for selected models. Uh, so the model uh, had an information of the runoff, uh, but then we validate the, the runoff on uh, other seasons. And uh, actually we had uh, uh, historical data from uh, 1979 to 1980 and also in 2001. And eventually we also uh, validated the data, the, the simulations uh, the, uh, on 2020. Uh, which I'm not showing here, but the, the validation uh, results were also satisfying. So then we use the uh, time-lapse uh, imagery to see uh, when the flow was active and when the flow was inactive. And uh, we compared it with the uh, results of the simulation and calibration. And as we could see, uh, it was matching. Uh, so the, the, the simulations show that, that there's an active flow and also time-lapse imagery uh, showed, this time-lapse imagery uh, photos show that uh, the flow really uh, was active in the Fugle backend catchment, which was sometimes uh, really uh, say surprising because uh, we noticed that, for example, in 2016, uh, after we... Uh, um, deploy, uh, deinstalled the equipment in the Fugle backend catchment, I mean like flow, meter, uh, flow meters, uh, we could see in the simulations that in very late uh, autumn, it was in the middle of November, as I remember, um, there was a huge peak of the runoff, which is uh, very surprising and uh, probably uh, didn't happen before. Uh, because usually the flow is inactive in September or the beginning of the October. Uh, but we compared the simulation with uh, the photos and we could see that really there was uh, pouring rain and uh, a few days uh, uh, earlier there was a lot of snow and then a few days later uh, it's free of the area is free of snow and uh, we could see that the river is active again. And uh, also there's a visual representation of the results uh, that are smoothed uh, by this MASH tool. So we could see the patterns uh, from, uh, for simulations from 1979 to uh, 2019. And we could observe that uh, we have a huge shift, uh, especially in the end of the seasons, uh, summer season, let's say. Actually, it's more of an autumn season. Uh, so in October, November, we could see that in the recent years, uh, we have, uh, uh, again, uh, the increase of the runoff and the river is active again. Uh, but it's uh, just only a matter of the um, around uh, seven recent seasons. Uh, and uh, this kind of situation didn't think, uh, take place in the last decades. Uh, so th it was surprising, but it was the result of all of the models. Uh, and also in the beginning of the season, uh, we could see that the river is active earlier than uh, in the let's say previous decades. Then in this decade, especially in the last years, uh, the flow is active uh, at the beginning of June. Uh, so uh, there were also the statistical tests um, for detection of the flow time series uh, in Fugle backend catchment. Uh, 
so uh, this is basically what I'm talking about, that this, this is a huge increase in autumn uh, and also at the beginning of the season in June, July, uh, the runoff is more, more intense, while uh, in this uh, middle of the season, in the uh, second half of July and the first half of August, we could see the decrease of the uh, runoff, which is caused by... Marta, two minutes left. Thanks. <laughs> uh, which is the result of the decrease of uh, precipitation. And also we can see that the, uh, the active hydrological season starts earlier, uh, which is connected to the, uh, uh, to the uh, longest period with positive air temperature and uh, also uh, the start date and the end date, uh, we could see the uh, trends. So uh, averagely, uh, the, uh, the runoff starts five days earlier in uh, per decade, and uh, it's uh, prolonged uh, by 10 days per decade, uh, almost in all simulations. And so quickly conclude, uh, as I told you, with uh, 50 rainfall runoff models uh, that were applied in order to simulate the runoff in the Webacan catchment. Uh, and uh, I showed you the six uh, that were the best. Uh, and uh, we can see the acceleration of the flow uh, commencement in the beginning of the season and uh, the delay in, at the cessation in late autumn, uh, which is a consequence of the uh, prolongation of the seasonal flow. Uh, time lapse imagery uh, provided information on stream activity after the equipment was deinstalled. Uh, and comparing the results to, for example, climate in Svalbard uh, 2100, there are similar flow uh, trends detected uh, that were demonstrated in this study and the recent increase of ra uh, rain on frozen ground events occurring in a peri period uh, from October to June is expected to be even more significant in the next decades. And these models rely only on uh, air temperature and precipitation data. Uh, so this variation of uh, these variables shape this magnitude of runoff, its intensity, and uh, further climatic change will influence for sure this uh, hydrological regime, and not only in Fuglebecken catchment, but in uh, all catchments in Svalbard and uh, other polar regions. And uh, if anyone is uh, interested, the data is available. For example, some of the uh, data sets are uh, available in Pangea repositories and in the papers uh, recently published. So uh, that's basically it. I hope that I kept the time and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marta. Yes, you, you finally keep it in time. So are there any questions? Not yet. So I think we have a question, uh, have time for for question, maybe for one question. So if are if there are no questions from the audience, I have one because you show us uh, the um, one slide with the results and also with the pictures. Uh, you were telling us about that the river was uh, inactive and then was active again, and it was late November uh, when it's supposed to be inactive. So were there any specific meteorological conditions that the river was active again? Did you check it? Uh, yes, actually, it was the reason of very intense uh, precipitation, but usually in this uh, period, it should be solid precipitation, while in the last years, we can see that in the uh, very late autumn, it's a liquid precipitation, and that's why it influenced so much uh, the runoff in this catchment. So also, also the model didn't show uh, this, uh, this active river, yes? So... Do you have any idea why? I mean, uh, all the simulations show the, the, this peak of the runoff, uh, 
uh, which uh, seems to us that it's very surprising and uh, not really common. Uh, but it's a it's a good idea to to check this with uh, other uh, other uh, let's say sources. So that's why we use uh, time lapse cameras because we are not always sure about the simulations. But now it turned out that really the simulations were uh, right and uh, it was uh, it was just pouring and uh, the derivative was active. Okay, okay, super, super. Thank you. Any Thank questions? You. Any other questions? Okay, I can see any. Uh, so let's move to the last presentation of today and today's conference uh, by Danushka Devendra. I hope I pronounce it well. No. Uh, from our institute, from Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Science. Danushka, the floor is yours. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay, I can hear you. Okay. Oh. Stop sharing. I don't know, it's not sharing. I don't know why. Uh, what, what's the problem? My screen is not sharing. I don't know why. Oh, uh, um, do you have Mac? Yeah, Mac. <laughs> you need to share the whole screen. Okay. Uh, give me one second. I can change the computer. Uh, so, I... so with this presentation, we cannot help just because there are still some people who didn't send us the presentation that was the backup for those situation, but don't you worry. I see Danushka probably is going back. Yeah, sorry for the mistake. Uh, okay, let me open the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yes, finally, we get it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's start then. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Danushka Devendra from Sri Lanka. I'm a second year PhD student at the Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, here I'm gonna give a speech about my uh, recent findings uh, related to my doctoral thesis. Uh, this talk is related to the topic of uh, uh, okay. topic of the, the linkage between Atlantic water intrusion and environmental changes in the Northwestern Greenland Sea during the late glacial and the Holocene. Uh, before I enter to the topic, um, I would like to um, indicate the significance of this research, uh, this work. This study is uh, quite important uh, because there are very low uh, or even absent records of the Northwest uh, Greenland Sea Paleoceanography during the late Pestilian glaciation. Uh, as I mentioned here, of course, there are some uh, work, but uh, those work, uh, works are restricted to the uh, the glacial, glacial and Holocene time scale. Uh, one other significant is uh, we, re, we re, uh, reconstruct the return Atlantic current evolution for the last 35 kilo years. Um, this is the first comprehensive study uh, for the return Atlantic current reconstruction for the late glacier. Um, in this map, uh, you can see uh, water currents in the Nordic seas in the modern conditions. Uh, there are two major currents control the oceanography of the uh, uh, Nordic seas, uh, North Atlantic current, uh, which is the key component of the Atlantic meridional water in circulation, which transport uh, warm and uh, uh, saline water to the more northward, and East Greenland current, which transport uh, cold and fresh water to the further south through the uh, Greenland Sea. Uh, here you can see the return Atlantic current, uh, which derives from the North Atlantic current and transport more warm and saline water to the uh, Greenland Sea. Uh, in this figure, you can see the uh, modern day condition of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, the Greenland ice sheet is the second biggest ice sheet in the world, uh, second to the uh, Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, uh, the Greenland ice sheet consists uh, uh, compressed snow from the uh, from uh, more than 100,000 years, uh, and uh, of course the pressure for the climate scientist uh, because uh, Greenland ice sheet 
faithfully recorded the uh, val uh, valuable records of past climate. Uh, this picture shows the possible uh, ice extent during the last glacial maximum, uh, red color line uh, and dotted uh, black color dot dotted line uh, implies the uh, possible Greenland ice sheet margin during the uh, last glacial maximum. Um, this research work based on the uh, sediment, gravity sediment core, which collected from the uh, northeastern Greenland shelf during the Arex expedition 2017 by research vessel Oceania. Um, uh, the core was taken from the more than 1,000 uh, meter water depth and core length is about 1.35 uh, meter. The, the area is quite important because the, the area is affected by two different major water masses from the East Greenland current and the return Atlantic current. Uh, we analyzed uh, 95 samples for the foraminifera, stabilized stock, grain size, and ice rafted debris. Uh, for the uh, organic carbon, we analyzed 70 samples. Uh, here you can see some of the foraminifera which, uh, which we identified during the uh, analysis. Uh, those are the electron microscope images. Um, Considering about the modern condition of the uh, uh, Northeast Greenland uh, Sea, uh, it consists of three different water masses. Uh, on the top, uh, polar surface water, uh, um, probably consists more, more fresh water from the melting, melting sea ice uh, and melting glaciers uh, from the Greenland ice sheet. And uh, the, below the polar surface water uh, lens, uh, we can find the polar water layer. Uh, which transported by the East Greenland current from the Arctic and uh, the, uh, uh, inter as an intermediate layer, we can find the uh, Atlantic water, warm Atlantic water, which transported by the uh, return Atlantic current. Uh, we dated, uh, in order to uh, uh, determine the age of this core, we dated 11 uh, samples from the sediment core. Two dates were uh, excluded from the uh, age model because of the age reversal. Uh, here you can see the age model. Uh, according to the, our constructed age model, the oldest sediment of this core is about 35 kilo years, and the highest sedimentation rate was observed in the top part of the core, and uh, which uh, the core inside with the uh, high IRD flux, uh, cause fraction, and benthic foraminiferal fluxes. Um, here you can see uh, benthic foraminiferal uh, uh, relative abundances and their environmental uh, ecological preferences. Uh, I, here I only presented um, dominant species only. Um, you can see uh, here is the bolin alarod uh, worm uh, interstadial. Before the bolin alarod worm interstadial, uh, benthic foraminiferal assemblages dominated by few species. Uh, Cassidiolina reniform, uh, Islandiella anacrosis, uh, LPDM clavatum, and uh, combination of the, these two species. Um, but uh, soon after the Bolin alarot, uh, benthic foraminiferal um, composition dominated by uh, one species, uh, Cassidiolina neoteratis, which indicate the um, which a good indicator for the uh, warm Atlantic water. Um, Concerning about the planktonic foraminifera, uh, for this study, we used uh, planktonic foraminifera for, uh, as an indicator for the uh, surface water conditions. Uh, planktonic uh, pachyderma, foraminifera pachyderma, uh, green color shaded area, uh, dominated throughout the uh, records, which indicates the uh, relatively cold surface water conditions. Um, but uh, after the bolin alarot interstadial, uh, you can see here the, 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 the percentage of the pachyderma uh, getting reduced uh, and uh, uh, worm uh, surface water indicator queen kiloba shows a relatively high value. Um, here you can see about the um, Atlantic water uh, inflow to the our core location. Uh, we, we observed uh, two distinct uh, spikes, um, peaks in the bottom, 
bottom of uh, worm atlantic would indicate is uh, spikes at the bottoms which coincide with the relatively low uh, chilled atlantic would indicate a species uh, suggesting as the uh, inflow of foam Atlantic water to the our core location. Uh, interestingly, um, uh, two peaks of planktonic delta 18 also observed at the same period. Here you can see, uh, possibly due to the uh, meltwater pulses from the uh, melting uh, Greenland uh, ice sheet, uh, which may probably uh, due to the uh, warm Atlantic water intrusion to the our core location. However, um, after the uh, 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 progressive and permanent influx of the warm Atlantic water uh, from the uh, return Atlantic current was observed during the uh, after soon after the uh, Bolin Alarot uh, interstadial. Uh, inter so we suggest that uh, return Atlantic current activated soon after the Bolin Alarot and uh, permanently exist till uh, modern conditions. Uh, when considering about the surface water productivity, uh, our uh, productivity proxies indicate that late glacial uh, uh, Greenland uh, su surface water of the Greenland um, sea observe higher surface water productivity, probably due to the uh, more nutrient, nutrient input from the melting sea ice and glaciers. But when it comes to the last glacial maximum, productivity uh, indicator shows relatively low productivity uh, because of the uh, uh, advanced ice sheet and ex uh, extensive sea ice condition, which progressively reduced the uh, uh, sunlight penetration to the uh, portic zone and productivity getting low. Uh, during the Bolin Alarod, and as well as uh, uh, after the Bolin Alarod, it means during the Holocene, Productivity indicator shows uh, higher surface water productivity uh, due to the uh, freshly export uh, post glacial terrigenous material to the uh, our co location. Uh, on the other hand, uh, during this period, sea ice content uh, and uh, the, the uh, glacier almost disappear from the our co location, and sea ice also uh, disappear from the our co location. So, uh, the uh, sunlight penetrated uh, to the portic zone and productivity uh, increase uh, it caused uh, to boost phytoplankton development. Um, this figure, you can, this can be a diagram, you can see possible environmental changes in the um, uh, through the through the Pram Strait. This is the cross section of the Pram Strait. Uh, here is the other collocation and this is the eastern Pram Strait and southeast uh, Salbad margin here. Um, during the late glacial, uh, uh, our co-location experienced uh, relatively low Atlantic water, uh, and, but uh, Eastern from Strait experienced relatively high Atlantic water intrusion. It uh, indicate that uh, return Atlantic current uh, during that period uh, was um, the, uh, deactivated. And when it comes to uh, last, one minute left. Okay. Uh, during the la uh, last glacial maximum, uh, both sides shows the uh, relatively low Atlantic water intrusion. And uh, during the Bolin Alarot and as well as during the Holocene, uh, our uh, both look both um, uh, shelves uh, um, experience more Atlantic water. Uh, and this is the summary. Uh, I'm not going to um, explain again this one. Okay. Um, if someone interested, you, uh, who can download the preprint of this work and as well as data also available in the uh, Pangia uh, data repository. So that's all. Thank you. So thank you, Danushka, for this very interesting presentation. So are there any questions from the audience? Okay, anyway, I, I thank you, thank you again, and thank you to all uh, presenters in, in the session. In this way, we, uh, we are closing the sessions. Now we have 20 minutes break. 
and we will go back at uh, half past four for the uh, science panel and after the panel we will announce the winners of this conference so see you in 20 minutes I hope it didn't last longer than 60 seconds. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so happy that, that we have this session second time in the history of our conference. Uh, the conference, uh, for those who didn't join us in the morning, it's the 14th edition of the conference, but the second edition of the special panel, uh, Women and Girls in Science. Uh, I'm very happy that we, we are together. I hope there'll be more people joining us uh, during the panel. Uh, for the, uh, at first, I will share my screen and show you the rationale for our meeting. And then I will introduce our panelists. Uh, uh, I hope you can see my presentation, hopefully in a presentation mode. Yes, yes. I can see nodding, super. Uh, there are a number of reasons why we should be talking about women and girls in science. I think intuitively many of us know why. Uh, some of us know very well why, because are uh, engaged in all sorts of issues concerning uh, uh, the role of women and girls in science on the daily basis. That actually goes down to the entire educational system. And I hope we'll be able to discuss some of these issues today. Uh, I gathered some information from uh, different data sets. And for example, uh, uh, for, for regional averages of the share of female researchers, as you can see here, are the numbers, it's based on the available data for 2016. Uh, uh, the numbers were uh, published in June, 2019. And it is pretty obvious that in majority of world regions, uh, the representation of women is far less than, uh, than uh, men. And what is actually striking to me is that uh, the Western uh, countries, that means North America and Western Europe, as well as Central and Eastern Europe, uh, are far less uh, representative for women than, for example, Latin America and the Caribbean or the Central or Central Asia, 29.3% uh, for the entire world. That's that's pretty shocking, I would say. So 30 per, less than 30%. Then when you look at the statistics um, for the selected fields, the bachelor's degrees, uh, this is something that you probably know from your own experience, your countries, uh, wh whichever you represent, that uh, I would say the hard sciences are dominated by men. But what is sort of uh, 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 disturbing to me, at least, uh, if you look at it, uh, like in mass and, and statistics, with years over the period of, of 20 years, the numbers of women are decreasing as a matter of fact. Uh, so one thing is that there, there are fewer women, but then the numbers are decreasing. In engineering, slightly, but very slightly increasing, but the representation is strikingly low. Physics is basically the same on the level of 20 something percent. Computer science, also in 1998, there were more women and that's statistically significant difference between 2008 and 2018. So the, the picture is not fantastic, unfortunately. Uh, so we need to discuss these issues. We need to uh, think about these, uh, these issues because uh, uh, it doesn't seem like it's a fair share at first sight. Uh, so today we gathered a group of really interesting women, plus myself, who will be moderating. I'm Tim Mojelinski from IOPAN, and I'm happy to chair the Support Science uh, Association, uh, which actually was uh, established 15 years ago in July this, this year. So, so we have a really nice round, um, uh, uh, not the celebration, but uh, I miss the word. Uh, okay, 15 years from, from, uh, from the start. Uh, we have three 
interesting women from three different countries. Uh, I will start with Maria del Carmen Garcia Martinez, who is a directora of the Centro Oceanográfico de Malaga, Instituto Español de Oceanografía. Couldn't have longer <laughs> name and, and, and the name of the company. But what do we know all about uh, Maria um, Carmen? She's the first director in 110 years of the Institute history in Malaga. So congratulations, uh, you became the director, uh, director in uh, 2021. So this is really a great thing. But uh, uh, Maria, uh, Maria is also a researcher, of course, uh, who has written and participated in many research papers, congresses, contributions, books, uh, 25 uh, uh, research cruises. Um, uh, and as of March 2021, she is the chair of the European Marine Board Communication Panel, because Maria is very much involved in education and communication. That's how we met uh, through the, actually through the communication panel. So welcome, Maria. And we have then we have Sylvia Wiskafka from Poland, who is a specialist in climate positive program, UN Global Compact Network. And what uh, I have, that's why I needed to print this, this piece of paper. Uh, uh, she graduated from, from King's College London, where she obtained first class MS, uh, master's degree in water science and governance. But Sylvia is also very much involved in all sorts of movements in Poland and uh, internationally. Um, the movements that are related to the climate change, the, the mitigation adaptation actions. And uh, this is exactly how I met Sylvia through the UN Global Compact Network, where we are involved in different um, events, projects and, and uh, panels, uh, where the, uh, the important issue is um, uh, communicating climate change issues uh, to to the public. Hello, the everyone. Yes. And sorry for interrupting, but just a small correction. I don't sure. work at the Global Compact anymore. I'm actually doing a little bit more scientific work right now, and I work on the offshore wind farms and I assess right. environmental impacts. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry an sorry. update from me. <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for cutting Hello, off. everyone. Super. Uh, all uh, the, the updated bios you can find on the on the panel website. So I'm just I'm just giving you a short hints. And then we have Lizette Perez, who is um, a Guatemalan biologist currently working as a scientific associate at the TU Braunschweig in Germany. And uh, her research interests are focused on the use of aquatic bioindicators in lake sediment sequences and to investigate the effects of past climate and environmental changes on aquatic ecosystem biodiversity and health in the northern, oh gosh, neotropics, okie doc. Um, and she's also very, very active as a researcher, 46 scientific papers, currently teaching and mentoring students at the bachelor's and master's levels in environmental science. So these are very brief, short, bits of uh, very rich bios of our panelists today. Uh, if you would like to add something at the moment, so please do it. If not, we can we can go to the main purpose of our panel and the discussions. It's and fine the, for me. You're OK, good. OK. Oh, sorry. I, I went out of there. OK. So. We, we have, uh, we decided on the scenario that we'll discuss three, three issues that um, uh, will come one after another. So question number one for the discussion, could you identify main gaps in gender related STEM and STI, STI policies? What changes, if any, are needed in the scientific system to be more attractive to women in science? Who would like to start? And maybe Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because I'm the, the most older... experienced. Now you're oh, the most experienced. Older. I'm also the older one. So. <laughs> Ooh, oh. Let's that... break the ice. <laughs> good, good that I, I, I waited with the suggestion. <laughs> so it's among you now. Okay. Well, let's start. So 
Well, first of all, I would like to thank Timon. I met him some years ago in the European Animal Communications Panel, and we've been involved in many different things together. I think he's a very hard worker, and he always has some interesting ideas. And in particular, to be talking about women and sciences, that I think is a really important point. We have to focus to put our eyes on women and in the differences that we are suffering, still suffering. We are the 21st century, year 22, and we are still talking about this. <laughs> I would like to also focus first on, the, on what Timon said, on the numbers he has shown us. They are really terrifying. And if we are, he has deepened something in, in about in the differences between the different studies and the women decide to study different things. So I think one of the first problems we have is an educational one. Women are still thinking, or girls when they are young, where they are still thinking that they are, they are not as good as men in sciences as boys. This is one of the first problems. If we number, look at the numbers, we can see that women start studying the things that has to face with care. We are prepared, we're educated to be caregivers. We are, the numbers are different if we look, for example, on liars, doctors, nurses, teachers. These are different professions and most of them are full of women, they are their majority. But in the other side, the opposite one is engineers. For me, engineer is a tricky point. But if we even look into the numbers, there are different types of engineers. The only one who has a similarity between men and women is the one that is called health engineer is, is the name in Spain. I don't know if it's something similar in the rest of Europe. But the numbers there are exactly the same, more or less 50% women and men. And what, why? Again, because we relation, relation the women with the work of caring people. So the first thing I think we need is to change our mind. And the mm. only one to do that is to prepare our children. Our children and our girls must be grown up feeling that they are exactly the same as boys. They are exactly the same and they can do the same things. They can study the same things. There are another problems that has also related that are related with this is, for example, the, the problems the women we have particularly have to face when we start our scientific career. But maybe we can discuss about this later. But it is this, I think this is the beginning of the problem when we are small and we were not prepared to decide that we are good at science. Why do the, we do the not study that? Thank you very much. Is that maybe now you? Yes, I totally agree with uh, Carmen. Back to you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. I totally agree with Carmen because um, I see it with my daughter. I have a ten-year-old daughter, and she loves, you know, playing with Legos, and she dreams on um, building and um, programming robots and stuff like that. And so um, one day she came back from school, and then she told me um, that she was the only girl in this, um, you know, afternoon class to do that. And then, um, so if you're surrounded by people and, and you don't have like role models or women also doing the same and everything comes from men. And I guess someone made the comment that, um, I don't know, that wh whatever she did, so it was not motivating what this person told her. So this is how it starts. And uh, we have this discussion with my husband that uh, it starts at really an early stage that um, girls, they also like the things that boys do. And it's, it's at school actually where they make this flip and start believing that they're not good enough or that this is a boy topic or something like that. So I really agree with Carmen that we need to change the way society is thinking and not only in the family, but also at school, teachers, female teachers, and we are all, we all have like this bias. So we really need to fight this. And um, yes, um, I'm more in, in environmental sciences and biology, so I'm a biologist. And um, I guess at the beginning, some decades ago, um, most of the students in the universities were men. And now we're really happy because we see lots of girls sitting in our classes and, and young women. So you can see that in 20 or 30 years, we are making, we already achieved that. So it's really great. So that for me, what it's really a scandal is um, that when you see the permanent positions and the professors, they're only also biologists, they are more men, you know, like, and not even one third, 
but um, 10 professors from an institute and one um, pro female professor. So for me, uh, it is, you know, like, um, yeah, really, um, I don't know, you know, like really bad numbers. And now this is what we need to change. We already achieved that uh, most um, or the half of uh, female students are there, but now we need to change the way and, and to in the next decades to, um, yes, to have the goal or to achieve the goal that we have 50-50 uh, parity in um, in permanent positions, professorships or technicians, or you know, like um, also the academic um, personnel doing teaching, and um, so I guess this is what we need to to do in the for the future. But but would you say that it's the the nature will have to do the trick, and simply the certain generation of men will disappear from the planet, and this is it, uh, or? Do we need some some actions? Maybe Sylvia, you would give your point. I think I think we need actions. I totally agree with Carmen and Lizeth. It's all about the mindset. But I think it's not only the problem in um, STEM subjects. It's basically the issue of gender differences, the way we are raised uh, when we are kids. So basically, the boys very often they are way more confident. Whenever they try something, they are very confident that they're going to succeed in that, while women are a little bit more shy. They always overthink things. And, you know, they are way less confident and we need to talk about that we need to talk about what Carmen already mentioned that we have to tell those girls that they can do that and it's not the men's job that women can also be very successful in that but you kind of I don't know if that's the problem of a generation that we need some certain people to die to, to have a change I think that we basically need all hands on board we don't only need schools we don't only need teachers but we also need corporation governments um, diplomats, all of the people who can be involved in this process. We need a lot of programs, we need a lot of internships um, and a lot of discussions when, where we can encourage girls to actually pursue the, those kind of careers. And I remember that a few years ago when I still lived in the UK, we had this meeting at the Polish embassy in the UK, very similar topic. So it was basically a conference on a woman in STEM in the UK and in Poland. And, you know, Poland is quite a developed country, right? And we actually had this discussion that we, as women, we don't really have any barriers in Poland to pursue a career in engineering or in sciences, but, but still you have way more male professors than female ones. And we think the main reason for that is because at some point in your life, you want to have a family, you want to have kids. And we still have this kind of mindset that you can't do both because you are the one, if you are a female, you are the one who's supposed to take care of your kids. You are the one who's supposed to cook and so on. So I think this is the main thing that we need to change the mindset, but we need everyone involved uh, at all stages of life. So basically we need schools to teach kids that all those jobs are available to both women and men, but also that when we grow up, we don't really have to stop our careers because we want to grow up our families. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're, sp you're speaking about the uh, quite developed country, Poland, and, and uh, we live in, in, in Poland in a special place called Sopot, which is a, uh, apparently the most educated uh, per percent uh, per capita uh, town in Poland. Uh, we have, we have, it's a rich society and we still have uh, problems in school that uh, during the PE classes, uh, boys play against girls and the girls hate it. And when there was a parents meeting, I raised this issue and it was like, but, but what are you talking about? It's always been like that, boys against girls. So <laughs> the mindset is definitely the, the key issue, right? Okay, Doc, thank you very much. Let's see. Uh, so the changes would be the, the, the mindset and all hands on board, right? Okay, Doc, next question. In European, gender equality in career progression, so access to job opportunities, recruitment criteria and processes for scientists and engineers, is it a reality? Or maybe Sylvia, you start now. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, I think it is reality. Before, before they start showing, you just go at each other. I think it is reality. But the thing is that, so we are talking about gender equality and we want equal access for women and men. But the thing is that still, women are a little bit 
built differently. So for example, we um, sometimes in a month, we don't feel well because we, we have periods and so on. So I think we also have to account for those differences when we create gender equality to access job opportunities. Um, even when we think about like, you know, women have being pregnant and not feeling well to go to work and to actually progress in their career, we really have to take that into account. But at the same time, still um, create workplaces where female representatives, but also male representatives, they can feel equal. So you don't really, um, you know, basically they it's have the boys against to, girls. Yes, exactly. This, the, your example of PE, you don't really feel like you are competing against uh, boys, but you are all equal. You have the same uh, opportunities, like the wages are the same, and but they they do account for the you, you know the time in the month when you may need to have some time off because of the fact that you are a woman and it doesn't have to impede your career. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Lisa, maybe you. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I would like to talk about um, job opportunities. Um, so it is well known, I guess, worldwide that um, that we have like a world dominated by men in some um, topics in, in academia. And so we have um, little female professors, um, for example. And I've seen in Switzerland and Austria that um, whenever there are some um, yes, advertisement of positions for uh, professorships, they already address that this professorship, it's only for, for women. So I guess this is what we need to start doing if uh, we don't want to wait another 30 or, 20 or 30 years that we see a change that we have more leaders of, of groups or more um, professors, female professors. So I guess it's happening, we see it, that um, whenever they have like a competitive or equal um, um, CV of a man and a woman, um, commissions try to really support this woman and, and to put it um, you know, as, as the head of the division or department. Um, but this is uh, happening too slow. So I guess um, personally, I believe that we really need this type of um, really strict um, quotes, hard quotes, that uh, we just say, okay, um, if someone retires, um, probably a man, then we will give this position to a woman, you know, the best of the women. And um, maybe it's not possible legally, but I've seen it really in Switzerland and Austria. So I guess this is the direction we need to do. And, um, and so we see that things are improving, but I guess we need uh, to give the young women and, and girls also um, the hope that when they're finishing the PhD, that they will be able to get like a permanent position because of family planning that Silvia was mentioning. So it's really important. So um, you, you don't start planning your family when you're 30. So I know girls, students that they come to me and we talk about this issue. They already with 20, um, they are thinking about later, you know, like, should I uh, continue with this path? And I know that the, the women that I know that, um, that are working, they don't have a life balance and they're working, you know, 27 hours a day. And so um, I guess that those are probably not maybe the best role models, but those are the few women that we are, that they're now leading. So I guess um, it would be great um, if we could give them uh, confidence that um, it is not going to be that difficult to, to, to get this permanent position and you know, to be able to combine research and, and family. And I, I have also some nice examples that, that it is possible. So I guess um, Carmen has uh, kids and uh, myself also. So it is possible, but you really need a lot of support from, from your um, family, friends, and also partner and um, in order to, to do it and, and not to go to your limits. And so um, not everything is negative, right? So I see changes, but for me, they are happening too slow. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm a little bit afraid of this uh, waiting uh, for for women waiting until the old professor dies, knowing old professors they will never die. Then yeah. they will simply <laughs> last forever. So, so you think that the the, the affirmative, like uh, in the USA, they used to have the affirmative action, uh, something like that would would make sense and. Uh, that there should be strict rules about uh, 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 women being put into certain positions uh, by definition, right? Okay, Mar uh, Marie Carmen. Well, I totally agree. Of course, if we are talking about the opportunities for women and men, I think they are really different, and it also depends on where uh, where you are working. If we are talking about a uh, university or a public institution, it's easier than in a private in industry. Of course, there are things are even more difficult than in the 
public institutions, at least in Spain. But of course, we have our own biology. And then the biology, you receive the, he knocks at your door and you have to decide to decide whether you want to be, and you, you, know, you have to try to do your best in your personal and professional life. And this is really difficult. So we need politics to, to help us, not only the family. We don't only need our families and the support of our husbands, friends, and mother and fathers and so on. We also need to, to we have this parenthesis in our lives and it can't be in a black point in your career you have to this period of time should be considered somewhere and it's not the same for a man than for a woman and that's the difference we have if we are talking now about the science career we start at the same level we study at the university we do our phd we go to our postdocs in another country and then then it coincides with the moment of the biology and you have to decide what you want to do. It's the same as Lisette was saying when she talks with her, with her colleagues, with her women. And that's the tricky point. There is where we, we need this support for these women to continue. But there is another point I think we have that is also, and this is important because we don't reach very high level the uh, different institutions. It's very difficult for us. Is the glass ceiling, the famous glass ceiling. But also, I think there's another one problem that is the um, imposter syndrome. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly the traduction, it's Porto, imposter syndrome. It's that women, when we reach at this point, we don't feel as confident as, as men. So in many cases, when you've been offered to do something, you say, no, because I think it's too much for me. But why is so much for you? It's the same problem as that at the beginning of our life, when we are children, when we are girls. It's the same problem that is delayed in time. And when you are 45, 50, 50, some more, um, and you get something different and you are you're being offered to do something interesting you feel you are not good enough for that and normally men do not think that so we're always good we're always you are good. always good yes that's yeah. fine that's that that's the good thing so what i'm defending is that we need to be educated exactly the same and exactly with the same confidence to be whatever we want to be and if you've been offered to do something and it's a good opportunity for you and you have the time and you want to do it, why don't you do it? Uh, so there are different aspects here. Not all, it's not only biology. It's not only family. That is important, of course. I have three children, so it's been complicated for me also. Uh, but it's also this psychologist point. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how it is in, in your countries, but uh, Sylvia, I, I wonder if you agree with me, but uh, in Polish education, from the very beginning, you go to preschool and basically the roles are predefined. Boys can, can run, kick, uh, yell, hit each other, and that's okay because they're boys and girls should not be doing it because that's not something that girls do. And then probably what you just uh, said, Marie Carmen, that you know, at certain age, this is not something women should do because that's that's not for them. I don't know, Sylvia, would you like to comment on that? Yes, that's true. And if you start acting like a boy, you're not female enough, and that's also the problem. So then you're not gonna find a boyfriend, a husband, and so on, and you're not gonna be accepted by society. This is one of the things. But I would also like to add to um, and comment on what we've just said. The only thing is that when we create, when we think about the access to equal job, equal access to job opportunities. We can't forget about boys as well, like, of course, support women and think about biology and so on. But sometimes I feel like we are going a little bit too crazy about the topic. And sometimes we invite women to the table and try to exclude boys just because they are women and because it is, um, it is required from us. And it all of that should still be based on the merit. But the only thing is that sometimes we don't have the woman with the proper merit because she wasn't able to obtain that. That's because this whole conversation, this whole task of creating gender equality is a very delicate topic. And it's very, very difficult to actually implement because we don't want to 
uh, actually reach to the uh, opposite point where we support women, but uh, men feel a little bit excluded. We need actual, actual gender equality, but at the same time supporting women just to make sure that they can reach the same uh, the same level of merit uh, as, as, as boys, basically, which is very difficult to mm -hmm. achieve. I would, like to, I would like to add something yes, because yes, yes, um, I, I made some notes yesterday, I guess, when I was thinking about um, this discussion and uh, that I wanted to, to share with you is that um, I guess we're focusing something like in the direction of what Silvia said, we're focusing too much on, on, on women, which is which is was really important for the last decades. Um, but I guess now we also need to um, to educate young men, you know, our boys, our, you know, your, your brothers and all of that, so that in some years, this mentality is already there and we have empathic men and we have to be less maybe defensive, less aggressive. So I guess feminist um, um, women, it was very important, you know, and, and it is still important that you fight for your rights and we wanted to drive a car and to have a license and to vote and all of that. But I guess now it's time to communicate and to, to be really, um, yeah, to collaborate more also with, uh, with the other gender. And so this is about being inclusive and, and you know, disparity. So I really agree that, 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 um, that we should not forget, you know, that uh, it's 50-50 and not only like women, women, you know. So um, I guess uh, this is the world where we want to live. And I see our male students, they use inclusive language um, great. And um, they're the older generations. Um, sometimes they don't even want to hear about the topic. And so I guess in some years, this generation, um, mindset is going to change. We need just to be to to continue educating ourselves uh, to have a better world and to be equal, and it will happen at, at some point. Because I already see it that the young people they they have it and they're um, born with that. Um, yes, now and uh, which is was no one was thinking about this like some fifty or hundred years ago, right? What okay. you are saying is feminism. We are talking about equality, so that's the definition of, of feminism. Mm -hmm. just being exactly the same men and women and of course we have to work on that and we have to to create this mentality not only in girls of course in all the society that's what what we are um, asking for mm -hmm. uh, but you lisa you mentioned the the inclusive language of young people which which is great but there are two aspects of that i would say inclusive language is of course uh, the language that does not exclude certain topics or certain uh, situations that that would uh, that would be related on gender but the other issue is the language itself and like in polish i i wonder Sylvia, if you agree with me but it's difficult uh, it's difficult to be uh, fully feminist in a sense that the polish language does not have certain words or <laughs> if you make them feminine uh, they commonly are perceived as as a silly ones, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. they smell a little bit strange. But I think so I wonder like, how it is in in Spanish. But but Silvia, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just be sense. I think it's really. Uh, I think it's also about our minds. It's just because we are not used to those words. Mm -hmm. That's why they sound really silly. But once we start using them regularly, I think people will just get used to that. But we really need to work on that. And we still have a lot of people not understanding why we should actually use the feminine parts of the world and so on. So I think that's also about education and about having conversation with those people and actually explaining them why we need more equality and, and so on. Uh, and yeah, I think that's that's the main thing because we are, we are a developed country, but we are still quite traditional country. So we still have this traditional model of family where uh, women should stay at home and cook and raise children and um, boys can go to work and do a career and they should also earn more and they should be pro the provider for the family. For example, in Spanish, we have male and female words for almost everything, not for everything, but for almost for everything. So sometimes when you are reading a text that is written in an inclusive in an inclusive way, it's a bit boring because it's always using the final A for women, final O for men or something like that from female. But it's, I'm absolutely convinced that this is, it is necessary. And I'm going to put an example. I wrote a document, just a memory, to ask for a technician for my institution, and I, I wrote it without an inclusive uh, 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 writing. And when I read it, 
I noticed that I was imagining a man. Only I was thinking in a man. And I said, no, there is something that is not, is not working here. And it was the, the text. I had to introduce the inclusive way of writing. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's boring, it's strange sometimes, sometimes it's, it's too excessive, but it's necessary, absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yes, Lisa? And, and yeah, for example, I guess uh, most or many universities, they already have like this, um, what's the name, guideline, right? A guideline mm -hmm. for inclusive language. So I guess yeah. it's not easy for, for all of us. I, I remember at the beginning, I was always talking dear ma'am and, and sirs and stuff like that. And, and now it's better to use, uh, for example, participants, dear participants, so everyone yes. is included. So um, I guess we just need to step by step tr start using these words and then they are ready in your language. And then the next word and then the next word, because at the beginning it's like too much, right? Um, but yes, I guess you can, and it's only some, some pages of these guide guidelines. So uh, maybe you could see um, in your universities if you can find something like that and just, you know, as an exercise, start using some of the words every time that you're approaching to, um, to, to the public or, or, or your students. So it, it takes a little bit of time. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And we go to the third issue that we would like to discuss today. If you had the possibility to give advice to younger version of yourself, what would that be? Mari Carmen, maybe oh, yeah. uh, the beginning is, so I, I said I'm a lucky person. So I'm a lucky woman. I have three children. I have my career, my scientific career. I have a very high position now. So maybe I'm not a very good example. I'm a, a type of person that is uh, with so maybe Mary Carmen, so how did it happen? In the world well, I was confident by my Yes, well, of course my family helped, my, my husband was, of course, he understood or he understands my my work. He's also a scientific a researcher, so we do the same job and he understands everything. But I started a bit late because I decided to start my, 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 to have children when I was young. I finished at university, I had my children, and then I did my PhD. So it's a bit a strange career, but finally it has ended well. So what I would say to me is continue being confident. You can do it. You like sciences, so you can go and you can study for science. So you have to come to become, of course, not always, you know, it is very common. The most common is not having a, a good end in the, with the, our careers. It's not my case, as I've said before, but I think you, you must continue fighting for your dreams. I, I think it sounds a bit silly, but it's what I did. I mixed the, my life professional and personal life and I could I could do it. My husband started before than me. I had to delay my career. I have to take a decision in that sense. And I, I was fortunate to, to, to be able to continue, but it's not the most common thing. So what I would say is the same of, yes, be confident, you can do it. Go, study, work. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. I guess um, I, I am also a lucky woman. <laughs> um, I guess that's why we're here because we want to motivate all the girls and, and women, right? <laughs> so exactly. I guess we were selected, uh, that's why, and that was the reason. But I guess um, I was always, uh, ever since I remember when I was a child, I was always dreaming, you know, like looking books and, and seeing all the animals from Africa. And I was dreaming of going one day to Africa, but I knew that Guatemala is a third world country. And uh, my parents, they were teachers. So you don't have that much money, you know, like to go to Europe or to Africa or something like that. So I would say like, um, go ahead and dream and make your dreams come true. So execute, you know, uh, step by step. Don't think that uh, because of the money or because of something, it's uh, something is not possible. You will find in your, in, in your way, in your path, really nice people. If your family is not supporting you, then you will find some teacher or some uh, mentor in the university that will see this motivation that you have and, and uh, um, yes, and, and that you want to, to, um, 
to make your dream come true and then they will help you also you know like giving you or supporting you for a scholarship or or even sometimes paying for you like a um, you know like a registration for a congress so you you find in your way a lot of very nice people so um the second advice would be to talk to people if you believe or feel that at home no one understands you and that that uh, you're the only one that has this you know curiosity for research or for science or environment then um, just continue doing that, that like that and search the persons, talk about it and you will find uh, your path. And then I guess the third thing would be to, to travel, to go abroad. So um, we need to be careful of um, what's the word, um, brain, um, what, what's the word when, um, when, uh, when academics go to other countries and you have like a brain drain, yes. So it's okay to go abroad, but, um, it doesn't have to be forever. Like, like I left Guatemala when I was 20 and uh, the last 20 years I've been abroad in Mexico and, and also in Europe. Um, but it's okay also to do short, um, uh, short internships because it's another way that other uh, cultures are thinking and, and uh, curiosity. So it's really stimulating. So I guess traveling and going abroad in, um, in different phases when you're at school or university or at work, um, I guess this is something that everyone should do for some weeks or forever. <laughs> I think that could be one of the common denominators for all three of you that you are really very open to the world and I would say international women. So Sylvia, your, your younger version of yourself. Yeah. Even younger. <laughs> even younger. Even younger. <laughs> she, she, she doesn't no. have a younger version. <laughs> Yeah, but I think I would I would tell myself the same. I would say just be courageous and believe in your hard work. Believe that this is going to pay off one day, and that's that's the thing. Because uh, so my story is probably a little bit different. So I come from like a very no, not very but for, from a small town in the center of Poland, and um, and I moved to London when I was eighteen, and I didn't know anyone over there, and. At that time, when I was 18, that just sounded like an adventure, but that actually opened a lot of different doors for me. I went to the university in the UK and so on, and I got my degree. And sometimes I feel like because uh, I guess that I don't have this kind of background where someone was telling me, you can do that. Uh, I don't always have this confidence or, or the I'm not courageous enough to actually take a bit more opportunities, including the scientific ones. So I think that's that's very important thing that to be courageous and understand that even if you if you're coming from a different background, you can still achieve everything you want in life, but you just have to work really hard. And at some point, this is going to pay off and you're going to get even further than people who come from like a very wealthy or really good backgrounds. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so maybe we, we will stop sharing the screen now and let's open the floor to the discussion from, from our audience. Would somebody like to comment or ask questions? Oh, come on. I see there are me some men here. Normally, Which is great. Type of this, yeah, it's really great. This Just type of discussions, to... normally we are women talking about women. We, so we had the discussion who should moderate the session and uh, <laughs> we decided that to break the rule, it would be a man. Yeah, uh, running the session. Grazina, you, you would like to yeah. ask? I just wanted to say thank you very much for this coaching session. The last <laughs> part of this session was very coaching, the one for me. So thank you very much. All of you, all of the girls, and Stefan also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grisha. Thank you. Right. Any other comments? Uh, two participants raised hands, but they cannot see who. Joaquin and Martin. Martin. And Martin. Oh, yes, jo Joachim. Joachim. Oh, you, you sorry, I, I, I said Martin, the, the interview. Yeah, yes, Joachim. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you very well. All right. You just mentioned that there are men listening to you, um, <laughs> which in my case is not entirely true. Let me maybe show you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very nice. <laughs> yes, but you are there. And, <laughs> but it, and your but name it's is... still you talking. <laughs> so <I> can... <laughs> yeah, but, but normally there are no... attentive audience. And thank you very much for the talk or the presentations. 
thank you okay, for attending. Thank you very much. Martin, then. For a chance to uh, say something. I actually wanted to comment what uh, Sylvia said about her uh, career and uh, the story that she moved out from Poland and then she started uh, abroad. And uh, she uh, ended her uh, talk with words, work hard and it will pay off. And I mean, I think that this is, um, well, I can imagine that it may be diffic more difficult for women, yeah, uh, I mean, to, to build a career, but also as a young woman, I guess I wouldn't like to hear that A, it's gonna be more difficult than in men case, because that would, I mean, I would feel just overwhelmed and, and helpless in this situation. Uh, obviously, um, I don't even know what, how to, I mean, I just obviously would love that every, each of us is having the same chances, but I think just telling that at the very beginning, listen, it's gonna be harder than in case of your uh, male colleague, uh, it's not gonna really uh, support us enough to, uh, to go for it and try. Um, so maybe I would just uh, be more inclusive in, in saying that it's difficult for everybody, mm -hmm. even though we know that for women it's, it can be more difficult, but I mean, hopefully in the future it's gonna be easier and easier. I mean, it's not gonna be more difficult than for male. Um, so in this case, we don't, I mean, we, I'm talking we as women don't feel that their position is lower or they are starting from the worst position, yeah? That, but that's just simply they see that in all cases, there are some challenges without obviously saying that I don't believe that it's uh, easier for male because I do. I think I did mix uh, mix a lot of, uh, in my speech. I didn't really build a structure of it, but I hope I you see what I wanted to say. Do you? Or should I try to <laughs> say it from the beginning? Uh, it would <laughs> certainly be much easier to talk uh, in person because then the, the discussion could develop much easier but but i think we we, we have the point that we, we should not uh, but this is exactly what uh, sylvia and lisa said and, and of course marie carmen agreed that we we should be more inclusive for men as well and not exclude them but still the the the, the numbers and the reality is i would say on the women's uh, side in a sense of not being so easy for them to to pursue as a career uh if if that's the comment if i understood the comment properly yeah thank you for taking this all together in one i hope one i hope it, i hope this is exactly yeah, what you meant that was, that was good summary thank you okay, super. thank you very much Would may i say something else? yes of course yeah uh i understand i think i understand what martin, martin said of course we are talking about a very difficult career we are talking about scientific career this very long one it's very difficult for all of us it's full of, of challenges but women have special ones so that's the only difference of course this is not an easy career it's a difficult one you have to be really convinced that you want to do this and you want to dedicate your life to study that's the thing we like. I suppose all the researchers that are here, they love studying. It's what I love the most. But we have some issues that are special and it, the, our career is a bit more difficult. But the, that difference is very big at the end. So that's the, the tricky point. Of course, it's very difficult for all of us, women and men, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Some other comments? Yes, Joachim? You are him okay. Yes, I'm, go ahead. I'm in the process of getting my camera activated. Here we are. Um, you mentioned earlier on that you're being optimistic that uh, with the generation change, things are going to change. Um, and once old guys like Timon and myself are going to oh, disappear. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you wouldn't like that. <laughs> but um, at least here in Germany, I. I think we do see the change already. So there's been a lot of legislation which make it possible for um, young fathers, for example, to look after their children and share the burden with their wives. 
And a lot of the younger colleagues, especially PhD students, are actually doing that. So very often, at least here in university uh, or at our institute, I hear from younger colleagues that, oh, I can't join the meeting in the afternoon. I have to get my child from childcare or uh, they take half a year off and share with their wives. So I'm pretty optimistic that there is a change in attitude here. And I was wondering um, how the legislation is in Spain uh, or in Poland with that respect. Um, is it also supportive? Marie Carmen? Uh, oh, Sylvia was first. Uh, oh, oh, Sylvia was first. I'm sorry. Sorry. I didn't see. Yeah, oh. go ahead, Sylvia. <laughs> Thanks. So, when it comes to legislation, I think that's the European thing, like the European Union. I know that the same legislation is implemented in the UK, and I actually see working professionally that some guys are actually taking the paternity leave. So, it's, it's really nice that we have this kind of legislation. But I'm a little bit afraid that it's still a lot about the mindset because you can choose between one and the other. and if we are talking about educated people that we all probably work with, it's a little bit easier to see the difference, but we still have this less educated part of the world that may not really understand why this is important. Okay, thank you. Yes, Marie Carmen? Well, in Spain, I think, well, I'm not sure if things are going better or not. For the people from my generation, of course, because we were really convinced. And the people for that now are 35, 40 years old, is working well. I'm not sure that things are so good in younger people. I think we have lost a lot in, the, in recent years. We are not advancing as much as, as we should have advanced. I don't know if you know much about the story of in Spain, but we suffered uh, for 30 years with a dictator here and things were very difficult. I was born during that dictator period. And I think that what made us different, the women from my generation to two or three, maybe two more generations after that. But I think we are moving backwards in, in certain sense in the society. If we are talking about science and politics, about gender equality, we are improving a lot. We are we have some new rules and the, the work of women is is considering the periods of time that she has to that we have to stop. But in the general sense I'm not sure we are in a really good way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Lisa do you, you mentioned in your one of your uh, uh, talks that uh, we should uh, educate young men. Uh, first of all, as a representative of the gender, I would say we don't need no education. <laughs> like the song. <laughs> we don't, don't, don't make me sing. Uh, but, I was... <laughs> but, uh, so it's my generation. What do you mean? How, how would you how would you do that? What do you mean? And, and... Um, I was uh, I meant um, if, for example, you're a mom or a dad and you have a boy, you're a little boy. You know, I I always tell um, my 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 students that I brainwash my boy, telling him almost every day how nice it is to play with with girls. He should be respectful and he can have a best girlfriend and not only you know, like play among boys. So um, every day, continuously, you know, like um, tell them that that they can, uh, they should get along with 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 women. And um, every time that the um, oldest uh, sister is doing something great, like do you see, you know, like using also the sister as a role model. And um, I guess these things um, pay off if you do it like every day. You know, then then you have it, uh, and then you you are very empathic towards the other gender. And the same with 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 women to to men and and stuff like that. So um, and I I guess that um, this is the the way how you can then later have male professors and and uh, in the academia just like you and Joachim, you know, like that's why you are here in this in this discussion because you are different, right? You are more empathic. So you give um, women the hand and you make this uh, type of um, activities possible and. Um, and you also uh, consider the topic um, important. And uh, so we need more of these men. You know, if you were sitting in these commissions and then you see a woman that's really good, then I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you will support this, this woman to get the position and not, you know, like, uh, yes. So sometimes it's lucky and um, some other times um, in the commissions, I don't know, 
Um, yes. So, but I see also like what Joachim said that in Germany everything um, it's getting better. I also see more um, role models. Um, but we also need like role models like you. You know, like the the young um, students, male students, see that that you are open to inclusive language and open to to women issues and supportive. So um, we 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 do, we do not need only um, female role models, but also people like you. <laughs> And, and we also need the there's a politician here in Spain, I like it a lot, it's a woman, and she always claims for the talent of men to take care, to be caregivers. Why we have to be the only women? I want mm -hmm. a teacher for my children. I don't want only a man, a, I'm sorry, a woman to be a teacher. I want I want them to have all also men as teachers. So there's a, the talent is not, it's not well divided. And we need them. We also need to the, the men are very good caregivers. Why don't they do that? Because we're manly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would somebody like to have the floor to to say something, comment, discuss? Well, we, we could probably continue this discussion forever well if not thank you very much sisters it's fantastic to 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 have this the discussion today and let's be in touch and let's change the world together i i hope that your suggestions were really very very good and important for everybody and they, they will reach further beyond our meeting today so thank you very much let's do our job less we are doing and uh, we are leaving the, the, this particular meeting now and going to our studio to announce the winners of the of the conference. Thank you very much, Sylvia, Mari Carmen. And My Lisa. pleasure. Fantastic job. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you in a moment from a different place. See you. Bye. 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 We're ready. Apparently we're ready. Uh, so welcome back with Paulina Pakshis from our team who was, who was helping us uh, all the time uh, with the conference. So we have the results and the results go as such. Uh, the Professor Stanisław Szymborski Award granted by the Director of the Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Sciences for the best presentation in the field of natural sciences during our conference. Before I say who it goes to, I have to say that we are very happy with all the presentations. You are all doing a fantastic job, but uh, we have only one prize. So uh, the, the panel of juries uh, made a decision uh, First, we were giving points for the presentations and we had a number of, of people gra uh, grant, uh, granting the points. And then we also had a discussion and the final uh, result of these points and discussions is such. Uh, the prize goes to Virginia Heppert from the University of Gdańsk for the presentation. If we are in person, oh, okay, maybe we can do it. Congratulations, Virginia. Uh, we're very happy with, with uh, your presentation and, and to, be, to be able to give you the prize. Uh, we also have um, uh, decided to provide uh, two special recognitions that go to uh, Veronika Patua from uh, uh, Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Sciences, and Marcin Mischak from the Institute of Geophysics, uh, Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. Congratulations. Thank you. We're very happy that, that uh, we Thank you very much. These, uh, these awards. Uh, uh, we, the, the jury the, decided not to uh, award uh, the presentations in the panel for social sciences and humanities. However, uh, we decided to give two special recognitions and those go to Victoria Kujawa from the University of Gdansk and Marta Gurska from the University of Wrocław. Once again, congratulations. 
And the last category uh, was um, uh, uh, the poster poster session. And the awards go, we, we had very difficult task to, to decide on the posters. Uh, can you believe it that uh, the average uh, points, um, uh, the, they, were, they were differentiated on uh, by 0 0.2, the average from a number of of, of um, uh, num from the number of um, of uh, the people who were who were giving the points, so we decided to give two equal awards, and those go to uh, Veronika Jaroszewicz from the University of Gdańsk and Eva Korevo from the Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Sciences. Congratulations! It was really tough task to to decide and uh, to to make it even more difficult for us. The third poster was really very close in numbers and points. So we decided to give uh, Liliana Sharma from the Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, a special recognition for her poster. So that would conclude our conference, the 14th conference of the, uh, of the uh, Support Science Association, World the World is Heading. Uh, Thank you very much for the participation. Thank you very much for your submissions. We hope to see you next year for the round anniversary of the 15th uh, conference. Thank you very much. This is the end of the conference. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you so much for being with us. See, see you next, next year. year. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.